For the past four months, my mornings have been a cycle of terror. In that space between sleep and wakefulness, before conscious thought kicks in and control is back in your hands, I am gripped by all-encompassing fear and panic. The cries that escape me aren't the exclamations of one startled or jolted, but of one in a broken state of illogical and primal dread like an injured and cornered street dog, wailing and yelping in the dim hope that the sound might somehow dissuade its attacker. It's difficult to bring to mind the memories of what rushes through my mind during these spells. Like I said, it always occurs the instant I'm awake. Actually, that might not be entirely accurate. By the time I've found myself aware enough to understand what's happening, I'm already screaming. That same autopilot that causes you to breathe, uh, to unconsciously toss and turn in your sleep, forces me into that last-ditch state. Screaming. The screams scare me. The times a person gives their all in terms of making a noise, of yelling, vocalizing, are far and few between. Few sane people would ever just cry out to the top of their lungs for fear of noise complaints or the police being called for suspicion of some kind of murder taking place. Hearing that full-fledged no bars shrieking from my own mouth and my instincts continuing them to the point of a whimpering stutter, it leaves my chest tight and my heart racing. And like I said, I've gotten the noise complaints. I've had the police at my door. The only reason I've not been evicted is because I know my landlord personally. He knows what I've been through. I'm medicated. At first I was honest with the doctors and therapists I saw, but I was on track for getting locked up. So I started lying. I told them I couldn't sleep, that I was waking up in the middle of the night, but that's not true. I sleep as much as any regular person. It's just when I'm waking that's the issue. How I'm waking, I suppose. I've tried all kinds of sleeping pills to see if I can dole myself into shutting down that reaction, but after nearly dying from an overdose, I gave up on that idea. Whatever this is, whatever the cause is, it must be on the same level as my breathing and how base, how core to my being it is. That scares me. I'm not crazy. I function as well as any other average person when it comes to day-to-day -day life. I hold down a job, I pay my bills, I have friends. It's just the mornings, where I wake up screaming bloody murder as if an air raid siren has just gone off. The timing of it seems to fall in line with my circadian rhythm. When my panic is over and I check my phone, it's usually only twenty minutes or so until my alarm goes off. I've always looked for patterns in it. I've researched REM sleep and sleep paralysis and tried natural cures like meditating and scented candles, incense, but in spite of my best and most committed efforts, nothing changes. I don't want to consider anything drastic or illogical. Like I said, I'm not crazy. I don't get used to it. Let me try to describe the process, a little slower and more meticulously. I get into bed. I fall asleep. I don't dream, or at least I don't remember the dream. My unconscious subconsciousness takes the wheel, and as is normal for a person, I have no memory from my time asleep. Then, all of a sudden, I'm thrust back into the driver's seat, but I'm already screaming. Screaming at the top of my lungs, the effort of it leaving my breath shallow like I'm suffocating, but I'm already scrambling too. I'm already panicked and frightened, my heart racing, and it takes me a good few seconds before I really have control and finally stop. I'm left panting, still overwhelmed with a full-bodied dread, a fear of something. People watch scary movies and play horror games because it's a controlled adrenaline, a fun rush that makes you jump. What I experience every morning is terror. It's not fun. It's horrid. More than anything, I wanted to stop. I woke up early last night, but I wasn't awake, not fully. Looking back on it now, I can't even tell if it was a dream or not. What I experienced was as follows. My eyes opened, I was laid on my left side, facing the room, one hand rested in front of me on the mattress right at the edge of the bed, 
the other under the blanket. I tried to shift to get more comfortable, but I was stuck. I've never experienced sleep paralysis before, but I know well enough about it. Knowing didn't stop me from panicking. As a rush of terrifying stories came to mind I'd heard from friends and people online, I tried to suppress them as I sent commands to my hands, arms, and legs. My body ignoring the will, I pushed towards moving as my eyes locked forward. Open. And while I was in the midst of this personal turmoil, I saw it. In the pitch darkness of my room, against the wall, was a shape. An outline, murky and black. I stared at it, my chest feeling cold as I tried to reason it away. This is exactly what they told me about. I just need to control my thoughts. Those were the words I told myself, trying to calm down. But then it started moving. The slow, methodical first step it took towards me was what gave it more definition. Its body was jagged in shape, like something malnourished and thin. It had been about five feet in height when it was stood against the wall, but as soon as it began to move, it stooped into a gradual slouch like a predator moving low in the grass. It was painfully slow, creeping towards me while giving my frozen body every second I needed to absorb it. From the lack of light, discerning anything about it was difficult, but the closer it came with those methodical yet bestial movements, the more I could see. Thin arms bent at the elbows into long wrists that ended in hands with spindly fingers that would ever so slowly flex curling inwards, but not quite into a fist, then stretching outwards again as if it were fantasizing about getting something between them. Its back had a distinct curve from the way it was stood, leading up to a distended neck, then a head that was just a little too long. Silence creeping step after silence creeping step, the thing drew closer to my bedside. All I could do was watch praying in my imprisoned mind to whatever god would hear to let me wake up, to escape this paralysis and be rid of this torturous vision. Finally, it stopped, standing inches from where I lay. It was so close I could hear a strained, labored breathing from within the core of its chest. Only now, with it this close, did I realize its sheer size. If it were to stand up straight, I am certain its bulbous head would reach the ceiling, the thing remained there, slowly rising from its crouched stance to loom over me, the sound of its rattling breath creaking like a ship at high sail, those oversized hands still slowly and obsessively grasping at the air, rose and reached towards me. Whilst I was entirely unable to move, I still felt like I was shivering in fear, my vision blurring from tears of fear welling in my eyes. I could feel the long, cold, wet fingers close over my shoulders as it took hold of me, its face coming nearer to mine. The thing smelt of blood and pus, foul and rotten. It took a long, slow inhale, and as it did, its mouth opened, splitting across the lower center of its head with dripping lines of black, tar-like saliva that drooled down onto my bedsheets. And then, it screamed. It screamed and began shaking me violently, throttling me as it shrieked and roared and wailed like the incarceration of every lunatic ever locked away. The sound so loud it should have burst my eardrums, the shaking so violent it should have broken my neck. I woke up screaming. I screamed my throat hoarse. Then I coughed and cried, standing up from my bed. I kept wheezing, barely able to breathe, then felt my stomach rise. Too weak to move, I vomited there on my bed, a splatter of sheer red. Another few coughs and I collapsed back, blood and bile trickling down my pale cheek as I lie there in a daze, panting raggedly. My eyes lazily turned to the spot the apparition had appeared in before, the screaming, rasping shade. Nothing. Of course, nothing. No sign it had ever been there. When my strength returned, I called off work and saw a doctor. I told her about what had happened that morning, which prompted her to run a number of tests. She put me through a lung function test, then a chest x-ray, then a blood test. The same day, 
They performed a biopsy. A few hours ago, I was diagnosed with early on-stage lung cancer. Thanks to the near-instant diagnosis, it's treatable. I still have a life ahead of me. That's why I'm now grateful, in spite of the fear, the panic, and the trauma, that every morning I wake up screaming. They are watching. I can't tell you how I know this right now. I can't see them. But I know they are watching. They always are. You need to understand that I've seen them before. I really have. But they don't like that. They don't like to be looked at. It angers them. I'm realizing I should probably explain to you what I'm talking about. After all, I don't know if this ever happens to anyone else. Uh, what if I'm the first? Although, I don't think that's important right now. What is important is how this started. I think it was a weekend. Wait, no, that's not. There was this one time before the weekend. I didn't think much of it then, but now that I think back, it must have been relevant. It was a Wednesday, and it's... Uh, wait, maybe it was a Thursday instead. Anyway, I don't think it matters now. The key point is that the day started like any other workday. I got up at 7 a.m. when my alarm went off. I slipped my slippers on. I went to the bathroom, made myself coffee, got dressed, and sat on the couch to watch some TV as I enjoyed my caffeinated beverage. I do this every morning without fail. It feels almost ritualistic at times, but I enjoy when things are in order. Predictable, when things just make sense. When the clock hits 8 a.m., I get in my car to go to work as I always do. And that morning was no different. Thursday. It was Thursday. I, I remember now. Although I once again realized that this isn't... Uh, anyway, I left for work. It's usually about a half an hour drive. I started working at nine, but I like to be in early. It gives me a while to get things sorted before the day starts. I like it that way. So I got in as usual, parked in spot number ten, pulled the handbrake, turned the car off, grabbed my bag, patted my pockets to make sure I haven't forgotten anything, and locked the car. As I walked into the office, our receptionist welcomed me, as she usually... I just realized that today is also Thursday. That feels ironic, or poetic in some way. Or it could be neither. It's just funny how we live our lives in that seven-day system. Uh, why seven? Why not a more convenient number? Like five, or a ten? I'm off track again. As I was saying, she welcomes me the same way she always does. Did you have a safe drive? To which I responded. I always do. She knows I like consistency. I'm not a big fan of change. I made my way to my office. I should probably explain what I do. I, I'm a manager at a small IT company. We do a lot of things, but mostly we sell printers. Anyway... I got to my office and placed my bag near the window in the same place I always do, and I sat in my chair. It was a nice chair, uh, comfortable. I mean, uh, maybe not as comfortable as the one I had at home. Uh, that one is really nice. I bought it two years ago on a sale, and it has been one of the best things I ever... Uh, this isn't relevant, I'm just... Never mind. As I switched my computer on, uh, that's when the first strange thing happened. That's when the first strange thing happened. Not with the computer. The computer was fine. It was like a short gust of cold wind, which was strange in an office with a closed door and windows, but I thought nothing of it at the time. After all, I don't know much about wind or thermodynamics or anything like that. But it happened a few times during that day. And every time it did, I looked at my shadow cast by the sunlight coming in through the window and made dim by the light in the office. And now that I think about it, I can't explain why I did that. I mean, if I knew then what I know now, things might have been different, but at the time I brushed it off. It was an anomaly. I don't like anomalies. They don't fit into everyday life. I prefer when things are in order, like when I put my dishes away and 
The cutlery always goes back the same way into the drawer. Uh, knives, forks, and then spoons. It's how my parents did it. It's how I do it. And it's how I'll continue to do it. Although this, uh, once again, it doesn't relate to the story. I'm... I'm sorry. That wasn't the only thing that happened that day. I mean, uh, this cold wind thing happened multiple times, but that's not what I mean. This other thing happened during the night. It was a few minutes past 2 a.m. This happened to me sometime. I wake up, I go to the kitchen, I drink a glass of water, I lay back in bed, and drift back into sleep as I think about miscellaneous things. That night, however, was different. As I awoke and opened my eyes, I glimpsed something darting out of my bedroom. Not quite a person. It wasn't like a solid mass. It, it was kind of like a shadow, but not really. I can't explain it, but I also didn't think much of it at the time. Just my head playing tricks on me in the dark, I thought. I'm a rational person in most... Uh, it was twelve minutes past two a.m. I remember now, because I like the number twelve. It's not the same as a ten, but there's something structured about the number twelve that makes a dozen. Half a dozen is how many eggs I buy, which is also confusing, because eggs are sold in packs of six, ten, and fifteen, usually at least. And these are strange numbers to go by, but... But I'm off topic again. As I was saying, I didn't think much of it. I did, however, check my entire house just to be sure, and everything seemed fine. Until the weekend. A Sunday, to be more precise. I remember because I don't really like Sundays. This is also when I noticed that something was wrong. It may have been my day off, but I dislike change, so my morning was much the same. I got up at 7 a.m. when my alarm went off. I slid my slippers on, went to the bathroom, I made myself a coffee... I got dressed, and then I sat on the couch and watched some TV as I enjoyed my caffeinated beverage. I didn't have anything planned for that day, so I was going to work on my project. I'm writing a book, you see. It's nowhere near finished, but it's coming along slowly. It's a love story, and I'm leaning towards a sad ending. Or I was, but I don't think I'll be getting a chance to write anymore. Before I can decide what I was going to do with my day... I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A movement. I looked down at what it was. And this will sound strange, uh, I know, but it was my shadow. It was uh, twitching, I think. It's hard to describe exactly what it looked like. It was kind of like a vibration, but slower, uh, more deliberate. Kind of like when a tree branch sways in the wind, except you know it's not the wind, but something pulling on the branch. You can tell that sort of thing if you look close enough. Or at least, uh, I can. I've always known I was different from other people. I tend to notice things others don't. Things that seem obvious to me, others just walk by. Like that one time when... Uh, stop. No, uh, I mean me. Uh, I'm sorry, I just... I, never mind. As my shadow made these subtle movements, I began to look around my room... Maybe it was just the source of light that was causing this, but no. The light was coming from my window, from the sun. Not to mention that all other shadows around the room were fine. Stationary, like a predator, waiting for the right moment. That thought, at the time, made me feel vulnerable. But before I had time to panic, it stopped. I was left there just thinking at a spot on my carpet. A dark spot that wasn't there before. It just looked like someone dropped a tomato sauce-covered meatball on the floor, then tried to wipe it with a dry towel. I tried to clean it. I had this fabric cleaner I use regularly for carpets and my couch. It's very good at getting stains out. I cleaned both wine and blood stains with it, and it has uh, no problem. I wonder, what do you think about? The stain did not come off the carpet. It was just there, mocking my attempt to remove it. I just left it and moved on with my day, occasionally glancing over at it. I was too distracted to do anything productive, so I just procrastinated for the rest of the day, cleaned some other parts of the house. When the day came to an end, and I decided to double-check if all my doors and windows were locked. I didn't really know why, but I did not feel safe that day. When I went to bed, I started to undress, and I noticed that there was a hole in my sock. 
I didn't feel the hole earlier. But now that I know it's there, it's painfully obvious that it's there. How did I miss it? I once again woke up that night. This time it was at 3.01 a.m. I definitely remember that. This time there was no figure, nothing dashing out of the room. I just woke up. I got up to grab a glass of water, and as I did, I glanced at my shadow on the wall, which was caused by the moonlight streaming in through the window. As I looked at it, I expected it to move again, but it didn't. I did, however, feel something brush against me, I think. I tried looking around at what it could have been, but it came up blank. As I looked back at my shadow, I noticed some spots on it. Uh, no, uh, not on it. They were on the wall. The same kind of spots as the one on the carpet. At this point, I'm at a loss. I mean, uh, does your shadow bleed? Once my alarm woke me up, I did the same thing I always do. But when I went to leave, I realized my car keys were gone. Uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase that for you. My keys were in their usual spot, but my car key that I usually attached to them was not there. I spent a solid ten minutes looking in every spot my key could have ended up, and I could not find them. To you, or uh, to most people, this may not seem too strange, uh, misplacing an item, but I don't lose things, ever. I gave up looking for my keys and decided to take the bus. I didn't have to wait long, thankfully. The bus went past many places I don't usually go by, uh, like the coffee place that I had my first date in, or the convenience store that I've only been to three times since I moved. This reminds me, I need to buy some AAA batteries after work, uh, the ones in my TV remote are getting low, which is causing the remotes to... Wait. I did lose something once. I was eight, and I found a coin in the park. A strange coin I had never seen before, but... When I got home, it wasn't in my pockets where I left it. I got to work on time. It was a little later than usual, but I wasn't late. I didn't see or feel any strange things for the most part. There was another one of those stains that formed on the floor in my office, but I didn't give it much attention, because this time I heard things. It's hard to describe noise, kind of like the hum of a microwave, but uh, sharper. Does that make sense? Maybe it was closer to white noise, and it wasn't coming from anywhere in particular. I just heard it at the same volume whenever I went. You might imagine that would drive me mad, but it was very quiet. So quiet, in fact, that I didn't realize it until about halfway through my day. It was only then that I realized that I've been hearing it all day. It is kind of how you can cut yourself slightly and not notice it, and it only starts to hurt once you acknowledge it's there. This tends to happen with minor paper cuts. Sorry, I don't usually go off topic so much. I kept hearing this noise after I left work, and even after I got home. It wasn't getting any louder and quieter, it was just uh, there. I spent some more time looking for my car keys with no luck. I decided I'll grab the key tomorrow and get a new one cut, and I went to bed. The next day is supposed to be Tuesday. And to be honest, I don't really like Tuesdays. This night was better. I did not wake up during the night, but there was another problem that I had no way of predicting. I awoke at 6.55 a.m. I know, because I was looking at my watch. I had five more minutes before my alarm, so I decided just to stay in bed and enjoy my five minutes. But then, after several minutes, more than just five, my alarm didn't go off which makes more sense when you take into consideration that my phone was gone. This part, however, didn't make much sense. I left it on the nightstand like I always do. There has never been a day that this wasn't the case. No, wait. There was this one time where my phone broke, and I had to wait a day until I... I don't think I'm alone in this room anymore. I was confused, to say the least. Had my things... Important things just disappearing for no reason. There was nothing I could do, really, but move on with my day and try to figure something out later. This morning was a little less structured than I'd like it to be. Like, I didn't have my coffee, and there were all these spots that kept appearing over my shadow everywhere I went. They didn't seem harmful, but they still confused me to no end. I couldn't think straight. 
I eventually got to work and tried to take my mind off things by getting some work done. Do you ever think to yourself that it can't get any worse? Well, it seems like every time I think that, life just needs to prove me wrong. Which sounds illogical, I know. I pride myself on my rational thinking, unlike most of the people I encounter, whose collective brain power couldn't turn a light bulb on. I wonder where the phrase train of thought originated from. Back to life tearing me a new one. Or tearing it off in this case, I suppose. When I looked at my shadow, after the sun came out from under clouds, it was gone. My shadow just uh, wasn't there. This sounds insane. All solid objects block light and therefore cast a shadow. And last I checked, I am a solid mass. But there I was, looking at an empty spot on the ground where my shadow used to be. And it was at this moment that the humming I heard the day before came back. Or maybe it just got louder. It still wasn't loud, but it was more noticeable now. I was confused and scared, and I didn't know what to do at this point. I decided to say I didn't feel well and go home. After I spoke to my boss, I headed towards the exit. It was then that I noticed the first one of them. He was standing on the other side of the hallway, facing me. He looked like a shadow, but like a three-dimensional shadow. Like a dark, translucent person, just standing there and not moving just watching me from afar. There are many of them. In fact, they are outside my room right now. I can't see them, but I know they can see me. And they can see you as well. When I got outside my office, I looked up to find the sun. Then I looked on the ground to where my shadow should have been. And it wasn't there. Just like in my office. I ran back to my car. I couldn't think of anything better to do than just go home. I didn't know if it was still safe in there, but I had no other choice. As I drove home, I started to see more of them. The shadowy figures. They weren't as obvious as the one in the office. These I could only see out of the corner of my eyes, but I knew that they were there. Just like I know now that there is someone outside my house. I can hear them whisper. I got home, and I really needed to check something. This lack of a shadow thing, I mean, it scared me. But it didn't hurt or feel strange or anything like that. I felt uh, normal. I switched the light on in the living room and picked up a book. And there it was. A rectangular shadow of the book with nothing around it. Nothing holding it, according to the shadow. I could cover the book with my body and it made no difference. Uh, somehow this felt uh, comforting. Yet it was strange, but at least it was uh, consistent. How would you act if your shadow vanished? I looked out the window to see if I could see any more of them. The shadows, I mean. There were only a few people walking about, and nothing out of the ordinary. Until I saw one. He wasn't standing and watching like the others were. He was just uh, walking. I mean, like a regular person, minding his own business. He walked from one end of the streets and passed where I could no longer see him. Or it. He didn't notice me. Maybe because he couldn't see that I had no shadow. I tried to sleep that night. I really did. I felt safe enough in my own home that I thought I could, but I spent all night trying and... What if our shadows are the reason we can't see them? What if our shadows protect us from them? We were never meant to see them, and I think our shadows are the reason we can't. What if they wanted to harm me? What if I escaped the illusion? How do you know that you're not dreaming right now? Wednesday was more terrifying than I could have imagined. They called me. The figures, I mean. Not on my mobile phone. That was still gone. But on my house phone. I thought it was my work calling, since I didn't show up to work that day. But when I answered the phone, all I heard was that noise I've been hearing. But this time it was much louder. There was no voice on the other side, just a static-like noise. I unplugged my phone and tossed it in the corner. I half expected the noise to continue after I unplugged the phone, but it didn't. All I heard was silence. Even the quiet noise I've been hearing all this time stopped. 
I was standing in my room in pure silence, and it felt... I forgot to buy the batteries, the ones for the remote. As I was saying, they tried to contact me, but what did they want from me? I also kept seeing them walking by on the streets outside, and most of them paid no attention to me, but a few turned their heads. I don't know if they saw me. I did my best to keep low, but I haven't been myself lately. I've been forgetting things and misplacing them. I found my car key as well. It was in the freezer for some reason. If you were to look, do you think they would look back? Once the sun started to set, I felt more uneasy than before. I decided I needed to try and wait them out. Maybe my shadow will uh, grow back. I'm not sure if that's possible, but I don't have much of a choice. I refuse to leave my house knowing they are out there, waiting for me. I took all my food and some other useful things and locked myself in my bedroom. I hope they won't find me here. I just realized I should have brought a can opener with me. But it's too late now. I can hear them outside my front door, trying to get in. Do not let them. This brings us to today. Thursday. I don't know what to do. I think they are trying to get in. They've been banging against my front door for almost an hour now. I don't know if they can get in. What if I'm safe in here? What do they want from me? More importantly, what will they do to me once they get to me? The banging is louder now. I think they're trying to break through the door. If I whisper, will you whisper back? They are outside my house now. It seems they are smarter than I thought. They are trying to convince me to open my bedroom door. I barricaded it, you see. I put all my furniture against my door so they can't get in. They are clever. They think if they tell me that they are the police that I will open the door. But I will not fall for their tricks. If they somehow do get in, I'll use the kitchen knife I brought here with me. I just haven't decided yet if I'll use it on them or... or on me. Does your shadow bleed? My mother has a cat named Thimble who stalked me when I was a child. I was ten or so at the time, and I had just witnessed my first death in the family. I say Thimble stalked me because it was obvious she was following me around, but she chose not to come too close. Always a little distance away, on the couch or in the middle of the carpet, watching me. She wouldn't come over to lie at my feet or jump onto my lap. She wouldn't respond to anyone calling her. She just sat there, placidly, looking at me. Every now and then, those gold-flecked green eyes would dart over my shoulder and then to me, back and forth, like someone was waving a laser pointer around my head that only she could see. But she would make no further movements. She would watch me in silence until she grew heavy-lidded with drowsiness and settled down on her paws to snooze, still in the middle of the carpet. It became a kind of family tradition, an expectation that if anyone were looking for her, they would find her next to me. I can still find old photographs, candid shots of myself as a young boy in Sunday clothes, seated at the table in the foreground, glancing to the side, where Thimble sat on the floor a little way into the distance, like she hadn't been invited and wanted us to know she was displeased about it. Her dispassionate little face would be turned my way, as if she were tasked to supervise me and found it an especially dull job, but one she took seriously. Years later, when she was old and dying, I visited her little den at the bottom of a bookcase where my mother had covered the opening with an embroidered, tasseled cloth. I would pull back the cloth and peer into the darkness as though spying into a shrine or a sacred little gravesite for the still living. I would find the gentle heaving mound of fur, lying prone and stiff, facing away from the entrance, and gaze at her white and ginger coats half glowing in the dim space. Just as I determined she was still breathing, a hand would yank me back roughly by the collar, usually my mother or Nan or my eldest brother scolding me about disturbing her, reminding me about how cats needed to be alone when they were nearing their end. The cloth would be respectfully replaced, and I would be kicked out into the sunshine, Dying alone, it always seemed such an unbearably sad way for someone to go. 
I thought. So I kept checking. I kept getting in trouble for it. She'll never die peacefully at this rate, my mother would say. She meant to emphasize the peacefulness or the lack of it, but I focused on the death. I thought if I visited Thimble enough, I could disturb her, uh, distract her out of dying. She had been in the den three days. She should have died much earlier, I heard, so it must have been working. On the afternoon of the fourth day, certain that there was nobody close by, I lifted the shroud and glanced in, pretending to check on her water dish. Thimble had moved for the first time, lying on her other side so that her face was towards me. Her paws stretched slightly out and seemingly already stiff with death. But as I watched her closed-up face, her eyes slowly opened, the secondary eyeball a moment delayed so that, for a second or so, her eyes were entirely and then partially white and shielded. She looked otherworldly, possessed, but now her eyes were open, her faded green pupils contracting to slits from the light of the hall. She stared sleepily at me without expression or pain, or even recognition. And then, just like all the times in the past I'd grown accustomed to, her gaze flickered over my shoulder as though someone were there trying to get her attention. But of course, there was nobody there. There never was anybody there. Every time I'd ever looked behind me in my childhood, just as surely as I'd grown used to this glance, I had grown secure in the knowledge that there was nothing, that there would never be anything, and that this was just something odd that all cats did. This time, however, there was a small difference in how she behaved. A slight difference, but one I remember clearly and with apprehension, knowing what I know now. She flicked her tail and narrowed her eyes as though she were annoyed. Her ear twitched, her tail flickered once, uh, twice, and then fell still. She did not glance back at me. Her eyes were now glazed and unseeing over my shoulder. The faint light of defiance in the graceful lines of her face dimmed out, and her breathing returned to its steady, slow pace until she ceased to move again. I scrambled up to run and find someone and announce Thimble's death. I don't remember feeling anything in particular other than a mild pang and, at the end, a vague curiosity. I never got to understand her. Cats die with their secrets. Hers was the second death I ever witnessed, and she would be among the first of many. The first was my strange Grandma Elizabeth from Dad's side of the family. You could say she started everything. I was nine, going on ten. Thimble had just been brought into the house as a kitten. Her stalking would begin a few months later. I would never be the same after Grandma came to live with us for the short time we had known her, but I didn't know it at the time. Thimble would be the first to notice what had changed. For reasons withheld from us, my parents had kept Grandma Elizabeth away from the family when we were growing up, and as far as I know, Grandma never made an attempt to connect with her estranged son and the grandchildren she had never met. There was some talk about her being uh, difficult even before she had been widowed, and my parents didn't want us growing up with that sort of damage. So we never got to know her. Uh, she never got to know us. Then, uh, towards the end of her life, she made a sudden, mysterious introduction into our home. She was dying, our father explains to us, and she was alone. Nobody should ever die alone. So she was given the guest room upstairs, and so far gone was she that I didn't think we'd really ever met in any real sense of the word. We might have been vague presences fitting about her room, sent up to check on her for all she was aware. All we knew of her in life before her illness were what little our parents spoke of her, and what survived in photo albums, just one face among other strangers, dead before we were born. Just like Thimble, I was the last to see her alive. Knowing what I know now, I turned the scene over in my mind every so often, wondering what I could have done to change how things would turn out. I still wonder whether any of it had been my fault, or if I had just been at the wrong place at the wrong time. I remember the chill of the air, 
the dim light behind the curtain in the guest room where Grandma Elizabeth had died. In the weeks leading up to her death, she had gone completely unresponsive. The family had taken to visiting her in turns. It had been a few weeks of no change, no improvement. She was in a coma, a vegetable. It had been my turn to be sent upstairs to check on whether she, uh, to put it bluntly, had uh, left yet. Not yet, I realized, watching the glass fog up on the tiny pocket mirror I held up by her nose, the way I was taught to do. We couldn't even tell she was breathing under those blankets. But just as I was about to head off and report the lack of change to my parents, Grandma made a sound, the kind of sound I imagined she might have made when she was so angry she lost her words, but not her voice. The sound was dry, scratchy, a bit warped and lower down in her throat than I expected it to be, but the anger I felt was there. I had frozen in place and turned back around. Her eyes were wide open, glassy, staring at the ceiling. I had recently learned the term death rattle, which I had read somewhere in a book, and wondered if this was it. Gingerly, I crept over with the mirror to see if I could catch her last breath. But just as I reached out, her hand shot out and found my wrist. The only sudden movement, in fact, the only real movement she had made for days. She held on, her frailty leaving her for a moment, so that her hand on mine was like the talons of a bird on prey. I dropped the mirror in shock and pain and it bounced once on the duvet and stayed there, blinking back the dim light at me. I couldn't make a sound. Her eyes were still wide and glassy, points of pale green light reflected in her irises like the mirror lying on the duvet. And now they were looking at me, or at least in my direction. I couldn't tell if she could ever register my presence, much less recognize me. Neither her hands nor her eyes let me go. The sound came again from her throat, whispery now, like she was trying to tell me something without being able to move her lips, like she was trapped in her own failing body, trying to reach out to me for help. The idea of it frightened me more than the fact that she was dying, or the fact that she was already dead, that she had died looking into my eyes, her hand on mine. Helplessly, struck mute, I stared back until the noise died away. The twin points of light glimmered out of her eyes were as flat to me as those of a fish. Her hands did not loosen from my wrist. Already they were tightening in rigor mortis. She had escaped her body with her last breath, but now I was the one trapped. I remember distinctly that I wished I had left the door open. Eventually, my family found me, standing there by the bed, stock still and unable to speak for several moments. I had moved my hand to rest on top of Grandma Elizabeth's, as thought to console her, but the lifelessness of her skin had stopped me cold, and I had made no effort to pry myself free. They figured I was in shock. I had apparently been there for all of ten minutes, but that number meant nothing to me. I don't remember feeling afraid, but... I felt that something had changed, and I wasn't sure I liked it. For most of my childhood, I had locked that scene out of my memory, able to recall it now with little signs of trauma as just an odd fact of my personal history. I had never drawn a connection between Grandma Elizabeth and Thimble. Even at that age, I had witnessed the crossing over, more times than anyone in my family, but I only realized this the moment I burst into the living room to find my family and tell them the cat had finally died. One of my elder brothers had made a snide comment, perhaps miffed he hadn't caught me bothering Thimble when it had been his job to watch me. He said, I see the angel of death has another report for us. It was such a toss-away comment, it was easy to dismiss it at the time and simply focus on the task at hand of finding a shoebox to bury Thimble in. But thinking back on it, I realize he was right. Grandma had only been able to die when I was in the room, and the same thing happened with Thimble. I didn't know why that was until I witnessed the next death. The following summer after Thimble died, 
My mother gave birth to our youngest brother, making us a family of five boys. He almost didn't make it, a cord around the neck, but finally came through with apparently no further problems. That close brush with death and the fact that he was born sickly, as most fifth children are, made him the darling of the family. I, for one, showed no special affection for the newest sibling, who was named Todd, yet he clung to me the most outside of our mother. He hadn't even taken much to Nan, whom we all loved in that distant, hesitant way of young boys. Naturally, my mother encouraged this bond between us brothers and often left young Todd in my care. At thirteen months, Todd hadn't yet learned to speak. One weekend morning, I almost wished he could. I had been tasked to help Nan feed him while he sat imprisoned in his high chair at the kitchen table. All he could do to protest was wave his arms about and gurgle whatever I was successful in getting a half spoon of gloop past his defense. Nan sighed and got up from the table to go find a clean washcloth. Once she had gone, I relaxed in my efforts, and then I noticed that Todd had gone silence too. I glanced at him, relieved, but his expression gave me pause. He was looking intently at me as though confused by what he was seeing. It was almost comical seeing a worry crease on a baby's forehead, like seeing an infant dressed up in a businessman's suit and tie. He was gazing into my face, for once not responding to my smile, and then, as if perfectly trained by the cat Thimble, who had died before he was born, he glanced over my shoulder. I turned and saw the creeping white roses of our wallpaper dimmed by my shadow. Nothing else. I looked back around. Todd continued to watch, flicking his eyes to something just a little behind my head. Something completely insensible to me. He would not, of course, answer any of my questions as to what he was seeing. Nan came into the kitchen then, happy at how I had gotten Todd to behave. I was rather unnerved and said nothing. As soon as I picked up the spoon, Todd went reassuringly berserk again. That would be the first time of many that I would catch him staring at me and over my shoulder, and I had to learn all over again not to look, to get used to the fact that I would not find anything. But I was no longer sure that there was nothing. I still maintained that Thimble had been more intelligent than a toddler, but somehow... I had to take the knowing glance of a human being a little more seriously than that of a cat, whose ways are always easily misconstrued by people. For years, I had never sensed anything off about Todd aside from that glance, and neither did anybody else. He never glanced like that over anyone else's shoulder, just as Thimble hadn't, only at me. And just as my family had marveled at Thimble following me around, they marveled at how Todd latched on to me. Photos of my early adolescent years now featured a toddler rather than a cat, standing or sitting some distance away, always at a distance, content to just watch me, sometimes for hours on end. Mother made a joking comment once about how I must have had a very engaging aura, but we both know she was just being a tease. I couldn't in good faith say I was anything above ordinary, and I know for a fact I did not have this curious magnetic effect on other cats or other children I knew at the time. Just Thimble, and just Todd. I had noticed in Thimble as well that her attraction to me was hardly about me. She was primarily our mother's cat, rescued as a near-death kitten in a ditch outside of mother's workplace. And as she grew up and settled in at home, she didn't give a rat's ass about me or my brothers, but... Whatever it was that held her attention, it was happening just over my shoulder. I sensed this same indifferent fascination with Todd. He would grow quieter than any of us boys, uh, uncommonly quiet, even more so when he talked to me. He didn't shriek with delight or call out to me in the cheerful way of children calling for attention. He merely looked and went quiet and stayed by my side a little distance away, on the floor or in his walker, or later, when he could stand on his own, stopped pictures still in the doorway or the middle of the carpet, tracking me with his eyes. 
All that was familiar to me, too, uh, thanks to Thimble, but with one notable difference I could look forward to. Todd would grow up at some point, and he would be able to talk. And unlike Thimble, he would be able to tell me what or who, angel or devil, had lingered over my shoulder for as long as he had known me. Todd never did learn to speak the usual way. He had developed an infection that almost killed him at two years old, but though he survived, he had lost the use of his vocal cords. He learned to sign instead, and he was seven when I was showing him photos of Thimble, many of them photos featuring me as a younger boy, a little older than he was now. We sat together at the low coffee table in the living room with family photo albums spread out before us. I was trying to keep him occupied until Nan returned from an errand to dismiss me from service, but I didn't mind. I had grown used to Todd's company and even come to accept it. He was an easy kid, intelligent, thoughtful. It's strange to see you alone here, he sighed, pointing to a photo of me when I was much younger. I couldn't place the age of the photo, but it was definitely from before Grandma Elizabeth came to live with us, even before Thimble. There were four boys instead of five, me being the youngest at the time, but I wasn't alone. It was a family photo, all the brothers side by side. Alone? What do you mean? I said. You're almost never alone, Todd sighed, then gestured at my more recent photos. It's always the both of you now. Both of us now? I wanted to repeat my question, but it wouldn't come out. He must have read it off my face, because he signed again. Both of you. This time, he pulled one of the older photo albums closer and opened it to a picture of Grandma Elizabeth when she was alive and absent from our lives. Grandma, Todd signed. He pointed at the picture, then pointed at me over my shoulder. This time I looked around. Still, I saw nothing, but felt something different in my newfound awareness, a tightening in my chest as realization crept under my skin. I remember in a flash the scene at Grandma's deathbed, the way she had snatched at my hand the moment her heart had stopped, the keen sense I had of her being trapped somehow, being helpless to release her though her hand had not released me from the impossible request. When little Todd pointed over my shoulder and signed, Grandma, what I remembered most was not her eyes or the wincing pain of her fingers clawed into my wrist, but the sound in her throat, the strange misplaced anger in it. Had she escaped after all, or was she still trapped here, holding on to me the way she held on to my wrist? Todd stared at me, waiting for my reply. Instead of denial or doubt, I only felt the chill of understanding. I felt sick. I tried not to let it show. I tried to focus on my little brother's gentle, living face to keep me anchored in the moment. Is she still there now? I asked, not helping how my voice dropped as if to keep her from hearing. Despite my best efforts, my voice came out a bit shaky. Is she always there? Often, signs Todd. Not always. She's not here now, but she was. I nodded as though this was expected, but my mind was whirling, trying to catch up. I was thinking of Thimble. How come you don't talk to her? Todd asked next, taking advantage of my disorientation to press the issue about Grandma. I noticed nobody talks to her, or about her. We don't know her too well. And we can't hear her, I said, honestly, but was unsure what else to tell him. What could I say? We can't see her? She isn't even supposed to be here? Why not? He asked, predictably. She can't talk, I said. It's like how you can't talk. Some people can't talk. She can't... I had to stop myself short. I couldn't bring myself to lie to him outright. Not when he knew things we did not. He was looking at me strangely now. Disbelieving. I think she can talk, he signed. I paused. You hear her? I asked. And he nodded without hesitation. Does she talk to you? 
This time, he had to think about it for a moment. He shook his head, then shrugged. His uncertainty unnerved me. She's trying to say something, he signed, finally. At least, I think she is. But it isn't in words. She just makes a sound. I stared at him. What do you mean? What sound? He hesitated. Then his hand hovered somewhere uncertainly over his neck, before lightly clasping his own throat. He was having trouble describing what he was hearing, but I understood all too well. That death rattle, that sounds deep down in her throat, unexpectedly angry. A strangled sound. Todd lowered his hand when he saw that I understood his meaning. Does... does she... I paused, found my nerve, and tried again. Does she sound angry? Instead of answering, he glanced over my shoulder, under his eyelashes, then averted his eyes. He nodded. Yes. Yes, she sounds angry. She hadn't escaped after all. And just like all those years ago, standing by her deathbed, she had latched on to me in her failure to escape. And just like all those years ago, I felt helpless to do anything about it. I'm sorry, I whispered back to him. And I was. I was sorry he had to see that. See what I had seen on that wasted face years before. The unseen look in Grandma's eyes. And to keep seeing it when the rest of us were mercifully blind, mercifully deaf. Todd wouldn't look up at me. I had to ask. Does she scare you? A frown crinkled his brow as he thought about it, wanting to give me an honest reply. He had seen her over my shoulder for as long as he had been alive. Could that familiarity have dulled the sharpness in her eyes? Would he have an instinctive wariness of her? Not really, he replied finally. Brave boy, I said in some relief. Braver than me, anyway. His lack of fear reassured me in a roundabout way, allowing me to latch on to it and stay calm. With my guard down, I added a bit of confession. I always thought her eyes were a bit scary. They seem like it, Todd replied. I would be scared too if she looked at me like that. I didn't like the implications in those words. How does she look at you? I asked. He paused a moment before answering, as if confused by my question. She doesn't, he replied. She never looks at me. She only makes that noise, and she always looks at you. As if cued by his words, I felt a pinprick awareness of eyes at the back of my head. I dared not look around. Maybe if you talked to her, she wouldn't be so angry, Todd sighed. I leaned both elbows on the table, feeling suddenly heavy and light-headed at the same time. Again, the helplessness. What on earth could I possibly say this time? To him, uh, to her. I'm sorry you couldn't get away, but leave me alone. I thought again of Thimble. Todd was signing something else, but I didn't look up at him to read his words until I was ready to take it any more. He got impatient and tugged to my sleeve, but I was the one who spoke first. Do you ever see a cat around here? Todd frowned at me as if I were making fun of him. Never mind, I said. I decided to not let the dead interfere too much with the living, no matter that some of us had eyes to see and most didn't. Just before Nan came home, I made Todd promise not to talk of Grandma Elizabeth again and thought he still had many questions about her. He didn't. The staring, however, was a habit I could not shake him out of. A few months later, I watched my little brother die. This would be the third time we would be waiting for death. It had been weeks of waiting before Grandma Elizabeth died, and days of waiting before Thimble did. But it had taken only hours for Todd, the one person of all I wanted to hold here longer. The infection he had narrowly survived had come back, and this time it wouldn't leave without him. 
His death is the blurriest in memory, though it was more recent, because this time I cared. Love is half-blind, and the memory grows cloudier in time the more I obsess over it. I remember his ashen face, the shadows under his eyes, the antiseptic smell of death outside of home, the insulting cheerfulness of the cartoon animals on band-aids hiding the IV needles disappearing into his skin. Our parents were out, getting coffee and making phone calls, waiting for my brothers to fly in, crying on their shoulders. Hell is a waiting room, I remember thinking. I hadn't cried yet. We were alone in the room. I remember holding Todd's hand, watching his eyes flickering open at the very end. He looked at me, blankly, and then his eyes shifted over my shoulder. My hands tightened instinctively over his. I won't let her hurt you. I found myself whispering for some reason. It was a promise I didn't know how to keep. His eyes kept flitting between my face and over my shoulder, like Thimble's had. I wanted to get up, and scream at the air, and tell her to leave us alone. But before I could, Todd raised his trembling hand. I thought to sign something to me, and waved, hello, but not at me. He had always been a polite child. I glanced around over my shoulder, and then back at him. A silent question on my face. He looked at me and signed. She's looking at me now. She had never done that before. I held his hands tighter, and knowing he might be afraid. He signed. It's okay. Then he lowered his hand and closed his eyes. Too weak to continue. He died a few minutes later. I was the last one to see him alive. This time, I did not run out with the news. Every day now, I see children dying. Slowly or quickly. Sometimes expectantly, but always tragically when at work at the children's hospital. At cancer wards and ICUs, I see Todd's face reflecting back at me a hundred times over staring back placidly under the watch of crying strangers. Often, it was only I and the dying child in the room who wouldn't be crying. My family couldn't understand how I could bear to do this sort of work, but I knew I had to. It wasn't because of how we had lost Todd, as they thought, but because I was starting to understand how to get rid of her. I knew her name in life, of course. But in my day-to-day -day life, I often thought of her as something else. The angel of death, perhaps. And by extension, and under her bidding, I was the angel of the deathbed. That's what some of the grateful parents called me. That was my job. I was called in to calm down frightened children and soothe their mental anguish. And nobody understood how I could. But I always did. The more sickly ones, the ones who had narrowly escaped death at infancy like Thimble and Todd had, often glanced over my shoulder but said nothing. They always seemed to lose the fire to fight, to cry, to be alarmed at their own pain. Their souls grew old in my presence, awaiting death calmly, like one who had lived five times as long and ten times as well. Their parents never understood and neither did the doctors, but they were glad I was around, and I breathed not a word of her to anyone. Sitting by the children's bedside towards the end of their short lives, I didn't even have to say a word. They only had to look at me, and then at the woman over my shoulder. When her eyes turned from me to them for the first and last time, the light would fade quietly out of their eyes, and... I hoped the woman would come closer to being free herself, riding on the deaths of others until her own bonds were frayed and she left me. To hurry things along, I would volunteer at the animal shelter after work every so often, helping to put down old dogs and ill cats, making sure their ends were peaceful. 
The dogs sometimes wagged their tails weakly when they looked over my shoulder, but more often they just stared, wary and resigned. The cats were more likely to act how Thimble did. The irritated flick of the tail, the twitch of the ears as they heard the noise in her throat. How many deaths she would need me to witness on her behalf is anyone's guess. Even outside of work, she drives me to somehow end up on the deathbeds of everyone I know. My parents, Nan, my eldest brother, when all those cigarettes had finally caught up with him. An aunt I was never close with. Somehow, I would always be the last to see them alive, and it was all her doing. I don't think they ever saw her before death. That was a privilege reserved for more innocent eyes, those who had always been closer to death than they were to life. And once they saw her, they couldn't leave without her permission. After Todd had died, I never spoke of Grandma Elizabeth again. There was no need to. She had done her part. She had taught my father that nobody should die alone. I learned that from him and decided that as far as I could help it, they wouldn't. I still couldn't hear her, of course. Can't sense her there. So for the most part, I can try and continue like she isn't. I'm not always successful. Sometimes I find myself throwing salt over my shoulder and holding my breath. I have no idea whether that does anything. I stare into reflective surfaces at the emptiness over my own shoulder. A compulsive habit at picturing what Todd had seen before he died. Every now and then, when I catch myself imagining I had done all I could, I still find children, always children, glancing over my shoulder outside the hospital. Every now and then, animals would too. That's my only sign that she's still there, fading, wavering, but still trapped. Perhaps mine would be the last death she would need. Perhaps that's why she looked at me more than she looked at anyone else, as Todd had me to believe, calling endlessly without words in her strangled, angry voice. These innocent, knowing, dying eyes are my only sign that I still have a long way to go endlessly searching, with her eyes at the back of my head, for those about to cross over. The scarecrow stands about twelve feet tall, a lone, misshapen sentinel in the midst of a dark field, beneath the blood of a clotted red sky. His shadow is long across the crops, Comprised not of two simple poles and a sack of straw, this monstrosity is a veritable wicker man of crisscrossed slants and beams of wood. He leans to one side and weaves ever so slightly in the breeze of the dying day. Luminescent bulbs or LEDs or flashlights or somethings have been placed deep in the back indents of his eyes and from each glows a pinprick of fiery orange. His wooden smile leers at me from afar, and I withdraw my hand from the rotten fence that borders his field with a shiver of discomfort. A crow to my right jumps forward along the fence and makes a peck for the shiny silver ring on my hand. I shoo him away. Leave it, I warn him as his brothers and sisters flap and fly all around. They cover the fence and circle in wide arches above the scarecrow's field, but none dare descend, and none hop down to its earthly ground. The twisted scarecrow, to his credit, is doing a good job of keeping the crows away, and I don't blame them. The scarecrow's field gives off a disturbingly nightmarish aura, one of a watery dream that is about to go quickly south. You don't know how exactly, but you can feel that something terrible is coming. Paradoxically, however, the feeling is an addicting one. It's fascinating and otherworldly, and it's what keeps me coming back here again and again, despite it being over an hour out of my regular routine. 
The crow makes another jump for my ring. Scar, I've nicknamed him, on account of the grayish scratch that crosses one of his beady black eyes. Get away, I murmur, shaking his hand at the bird. He only hops up onto a nearby post and cocks his head, looking me up and down. The scarecrow stands tall and alone, far out in the middle of the field behind him. It occurs to me that I've never taken a picture of this hideous thing. If it were suddenly taken down one day, then I'd have no proof it even ever existed. I reached into my pocket for my phone and draw it out, angling it up toward the field. I'd rather you didn't take that picture, pray, murmurs a voice to my left. I gasp in alarm and swivel to the voice's source. There stands an elderly man, face deeply lined and shadowed beneath a wide-brimmed hat. He leans casually enough against the fence, yet gives off to me the impression of a coiled spring, one set to release at any second. Folks will want to see it, you understand, if they know it's here. He adjusts his stance a little. They'll come in their cars and their crowds and crush the crop, and the crops are well needed. I just stare at him in awkward silence. Why have such a spectacle of a scarecrow at all, then, if you don't want people to see it? I think, but cannot form the words. Seemingly reading my thoughts, or perhaps just anticipating the next question, the old man gestures to the scarecrow. He's a beast, for sure. But like the crops, he's well needed. Nothing less will keep away the crows. The crows love the crops, and the crops must grow, lad. As if in response, a nearby crow calls out with a quick, low shriek. The sound makes me grimace, and I look to its source, to my right. Its scar, and he glances between me and the old man, hopping from foot to foot. Then he takes flight, soaring away toward the red sky. The old man watches him go, shaking his head. Little bastard. Where the hell did this guy even come from? There's a field ahead and a field behind. A long, lone dirt track passes between them. The trees and bushes are withered and scarce. There's a still on the fence behind. And maybe the guy could have just crept over it without my hearing, but even then... I swallow, nervously. Uh, right. I settled on, simply. Sorry. The old man puts up his forgiving hand but the sensation of the coiled spring does not dissipate. I appreciate it, he says, then tips his hat. Enjoy your walk. Don't touch the crops. And he takes his leave. The air cools as he passes me by, and I watch as he walks away down the rough rural track, step by step, his boots sending up little clouds of dust as he goes. Creepy-ass old man. I mutter once I'm sure he has left earshot. I turn to look at the scarecrow, if such a behemoth can even be referred to by so humble a name, and consider taking that picture anyway. I glance back along the path, but the old man has disappeared. My fingers itch by my pockets, but I leave the phone where it is. Ah, <sighs> frustrated by my surprising lack of courage, I chew my tongue and make to take my own leave. I reach for my bike and ease it away from the fence, and as I do so, my eyes are drawn once again to the stile. A little wooden step over the opposite fence. There's a narrow footpath on the other side that carries around the edge of a low-hilled field, the one facing the scarecrow's own, and I consider my options, though I don't consider for particularly long there's still time before it gets totally dark. Screw it. I have time to walk. I rest the bike back up against the fence and stride right over to the stile. The second I grab hold of the post and lift myself up to cross the fence, however, I am surrounded by the sound of crows and the wavering air of beating wings. Come on! I shout as they shriek and caw. They dart in and out of my vision and I do my best to wave them away. 
I stumble and slip from the stile and crash down into the field with a grunt, shielding my eyes as I curse the crows. Leave me alone. Jesus. Scar settles himself on the post and looks down at me silently, as the others all circle and swoop and swirl. I climb back up to my feet in defiance. What the hell is this? Creepy old men, crazy crows. I shake my head and do my best to dispel the madness. This is a public footpath. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm free to walk. Oh, why are you talking to crows, Jordan? I sigh and brush the dirt from the sides of my jeans and head out for the remainder of my evening stroll, starting with a quick pace and keen to leave the crows behind. Spooked out of taking a picture, I have been left frustrated, and maybe this walk will settle my urge to do something different. I can't help shooting glances over my shoulder along my journey. The enormous scarecrow disappears gradually from sight, yet keeps itself in my range of vision for far longer than I would have liked. The enormous scarecrow disappears gradually from sight, yet keeps itself in my range of vision for far longer than I would have liked. Those pinpricks of orange light in his eyes only growing stronger as the day darkens. I pass through great fields of curious crops. I take it for wheat at first, but the farther I walk, the darker it becomes. From pale gold in color to a pallid gray, then further to a sickened deep purple, and then eventually to black. They rustle softly in the breeze. I scratch at my neck and begin to wonder if this was such a good idea. The path runs around the edges of more fields and hills ahead, around gatherings of trees. It isn't obvious if it would be quicker to keep going or to head back. I hesitated, but decide upon continuing. It looked like it looped around a bit farther on, likely right back to the dirt track. I pass by coils of tomato plants and resist the urge to pull one of the little fruits right from the stem. They look so good, so red and juicy. But I'm no thief, and I leave them where they are. I wonder if all these fields belong to the farmer. I wonder if he was the one who built the scarecrow. I start to actually process the implications of the things he said to me for the first time. The scarecrow keeps away the crows. The crows like the crop, and the crop must grow. The sky deepens in color as the breeze blows. What the hell kind of crop would warrant such a terrifying scarecrow? Something special, surely. I slow the speed of my walk and look to my left. The path has once again been bordered by the towering strands of black wheat, wavering softly in the breeze. Curiosity overwhelms me, and I reach out a hand. I lightly brush my fingers against the stems. As I do so, the tall black wheat dissolves at once into ash. I recoil in quiet terror, watching as the ash falls to the ground in a low clump. Oh, Jesus. There's a fine black powder against my fingertips, and I hastily rub them against the side of my jeans as I look in confusion at the ash. Ash which, as I watched, started to shake. With a stem connected to the earth, an oily black vine pushes angrily out, dispersing the ash. I stare in surprise and dismay as the vine writhes and squirms from beneath the ground, like something insect-like and alive. And with a squirt, it hauls from the earth a rapidly twitching slithery mass, rolling around in the ash, frothing at the edges. What looks like a feather is stuck to the obscenity's back, coated in dark mucus and quivering in the breeze. The hell with this. I'm not going a step further. I turn back the way I came, walking as fast as I can, jogging, really, heart pounding as I try not to think about anything that has happened this evening. Screw it. I'm going home. The fields, it would seem, agree. It's subtle at first. I scarcely notice it. But once I do... The effect is undeniable. The fields and the ground are impossibly tilting up, impossibly tilting upwards.
Or uh, downwards, I suppose I should say. I have to put more and more pressure on my heels until it feels as if I am running down the side of a hill. And then a mountain. What the fuck is happening? I screamed out loud as the rush of the earth grows into the sound of a roaring river in my ears. The ground slips and melts beneath me, and I fall, crashing and spinning and landing on my side, but still I fall. Ever falling as the crops rush by, the trees now at impossible angles are mere blurs against the red sky. Terror courses through me as I am sent reeling and sliding down the path turned landslide, and in a minute I know that I will see him. Powerless to stop, I will see him. The Scarecrow. There's a cluster of trees ahead, rushing towards me. And when they pass, he will be there in the distance. Cold panic grips me tight. I want to look away, but find that I am unable. Any second now. Any second. The world rushes by. And there the monstrosity is, peering at me from over the fields. The scarecrow, eyes ablaze and wooden grin stretched wide, staring right at me from over the hills. No, I mutter, then louder. No. But I cannot stop. The fences peel back, and the earth carries right on through. Drawing closer and closer, the scarecrow towers up and up and darkens in shadow. I can hear the creaking in the wood of his arms carried to me by the rising wind. Down I fly. Down and down. Please, I cry out. But there is nothing I can do. I am going to be carried right into the Scarecrow's grisly field, right into his immediate domain. The dream is going south. Terror lurks ahead. I feel it. There is only panic. The dirt track becomes visible below, and still I fall, barreling towards the Scarecrow faster and faster. The fences peel and pull away, and the crows swoop down. In a cloud of black, I am once again surrounded, deafened by caws and cries that grab at my shirt and my shoulders, dozens upon dozens of them. My vision is lost as I feel myself slowed. I stumble. There are more of them. More of the calling crows. For a second or two, I feel myself lifted from the ground. I am sure of it. For the briefest of moments, I am carried into the air. The sensation of falling is lost. I feel their claws scratch at my skin and tear at my clothes. And with a final shriek, they disperse. I am unceremoniously dumped to the ground. The ground of the dirt track, which, I might add, has returned to a welcome flatness. The wind ceased at once. I take in a great breath of ragged air and shoot a look up at the scarecrow. He does not rush towards me. He stands tall and silent and still in his field, a field blocked by that rotten old fence. I turn around, knees bleeding into the dust. There is no great mountain, no sudden steep drops, just fields, fields and low, unobtrusive hills. Some of the crows are mid-flight, but many of them settle themselves on the fence, rows and rows of them. Silent and watching as I catch my breath. I stagger to my feet. The eyes of the scarecrow glisten bright. Scar the crow appears from a swirling circle overhead and lands on the nearest post. He hops a little and quivers his wings expectantly. We look at each other for a moment and he gives a brief caw. All right, I said, all right. With a grimace, I bring together my hands and slide off my shining silver ring. I drop it on the fence post and the crow picks it up at once in his beak. Enjoy, I mutter as I climb up onto my bike. And with one last look behind, I head on home and pedal the hell away. I closed my bedroom door as I slid down against it to the floor. A deep sigh escaped my mouth as I dragged my legs up to my chest. I lowered my head and closed my eyes. After a minute of self-groveling, I stood up and made my way to the bathroom where I looked into the full-body mirror, ashamed and disgusted at what looked back at me. 
I had just gotten back from the doctor's office. It was just a checkup, nothing too serious. That's not why I'm upset, though. It's because of the physical I had to do. It reminded me of everything I hated about my physical appearance. You see, I'm what you would call a stick, and a short one at that. I've always been small. I was born a month premature, five pounds and three ounces to be exact. The runt of the family, you could say. Ironically enough, my family is full of giants. My father is a whopping 6'11", my mother 6'5". My parents are pretty tall, so naturally, you'd expect their four offspring to be tall as well. You'd be mostly correct in this theory. Keyword, mostly. Let's dive in, shall we? My oldest brother, Ethan, is taller than my father, measuring at 7 foot 1. He could have had a career in basketball, but my 26-year-old brother chose to engineer instead. Next is Mary. She is 24 and my one and only sister. Uh, don't let her giant stature of 6 foot 8 fool you. She is the sweetest, kindest, and most caring person you'll ever meet. And finally, my older, dorky brother, Marcus. He's been sticking out since kindergarten, literally, and he's always been the tallest in his class. Even at 23, he's standing at six foot ten. So how tall am I, you ask? I must be up there with my parents and siblings, right? <laughs> Wrong. I am four foot six, and I have been so since I was twelve. It's insufferable having to live in a world full of giants. My parents saved up enough money to have a custom house built, expecting their kids to grow up nice and tall, just like them. Everyone except for poor little Amelia, who had to carry around her own little step stool just to be able to wash her hands. What's worse was the torment for my brothers and the occasional offensive remark from Mary growing up. While they shot up to great new heights, I stayed down in the mud. I'm shorter than the average American female, for Christ's sake. I've always envied my siblings for their bodies and loathed my own. Well, Miss Emerson, everything looks fine, Dr. Goodman informed me. However, there is one concerning thing that I can't seem to figure out. My heart dropped in my chest. I had an inkling of what was about to happen. Looking over your family history, we've noticed you're a little stunted compared to other members of your family. Your BMI was also a little low as well. He said, reading off my chart. I let out a sigh. Yeah, I get this a lot, actually. I can't really explain it, but I'm just really short compared to my family. I explained. Have you tried any dietary changes, or have you sought any hormone therapies? He asked. I drank my milk and even binge ate for a while, but nothing. And I'm way too poor to afford hormone therapy. You and I will just have to live with the way I am, I answered. After that, I promptly left, quite embarrassed, too. So there I was, looking in the mirror, self-loathing. My phone chimed, bringing me out of my dark and self-deprecating thoughts. It was my mother, telling me dinner would be ready soon and I should start my journey over to the family estate. I don't know why I kept going over there, but... There I was, every Sunday night, for family dinner. I quickly throw on an oversized hoodie that belonged to one of my brothers to hide my short, plain, and uninteresting figure. Where's little Emmy stepping stool? Ethan questioned, as I entered my childhood home. Har har, jerk. I say, rolling my eyes. And so begins the make fun of me to inflate your own small, fragile egos feast, I thought to myself. Dinner went as it always did. Mom asked us about our weeks, and we responded with the same mundane stories as every week. When I brought up what happened at the doctor's, my siblings broke out in laughter, and my parents gave me those disgusting, pitiful looks they always did when these things happened to me. I couldn't take it anymore. I hated being this family's butt of the joke. I hated being picked on because I was short. I was just done with everything. You all find it so funny I'm so short? Well, have you ever thought about what it's like to live like this? With you? You don't, and you never will. 
I'd kill to be as tall as you guys. I'm done. I'll be damned if I ever come back to this house. I exploded in a rage, and doing what I did at the doctor's, I stormed out of the house and drove home with tears welling up in my eyes. I cried myself to sleep that night, like I always did when I was reminded that I was nothing but a small, insignificant ant. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night to a notification on my phone, expecting it to be a message from one of my family members apologizing. I was instead met with a Facebook Messenger message. Typical, I thought. The message was from an old high school friend of mine who I hadn't seen in years. Her name was Madison Grove. Sorry it's late, in your time zone at least. Anyway, I was wondering if you wanted to go out for coffee or something on Saturday. I'll be in the area, and it'd be great to catch up with you, the message read. I typed back. Sure, just tell me when and where, and I'll be there. I didn't really want to go, but I felt bad that she reached out, something most of my high school friends hadn't done, and I decided I'd go for an hour with a sappy smile slapped on my face. The week passed slowly and mundanely. I went to work, slept, and barely ate, just like I did every week. I almost forgot about the friendly reunion when... Madison messaged again with a time and location. When the time came, I left and drove to the location she wanted to meet at. It was a local Starbucks about 15 minutes away from my house. I took a deep breath and walked into the shop, where a familiar, albeit older face, met my gaze. We had a short embrace, then sat down in a booth in the back corner of the establishment. So how have you been, Amelia? Madison questioned, initiating the conversation. I've been good, I responded. We spent the next half hour chatting while also reminiscing about our high school days. Everything was going fine until she had to ruin everything with one question. So, do you still hate your body? I contorted my face in disbelief and confusion. It's, uh, that's, uh... That's not any of your business, Madison, I said sternly. <laughs> Calm down, she said in response. I know it's a sensitive subject for you and everything, but you're the one who opened up to me about it in high school. I just want to make sure you're all right. I cleared my throat and stated, Thank you for your concern, Madison, really, but I think we're done here. I began to grab my things to run away like I normally did when Madison stopped me. Wait! She yelled, rather loudly. The people around us stared and my face went red. I sat back down, waiting for the judgmental stares to cease. I have something for you. I know it's not much, but I hope you'll keep it around, she said in a lower tone. She got up and exited the restaurant to her car to retrieve the item. As I sat there, waiting, I began to think about how much Madison had changed since then. She had really developed in the years since I last saw her. Her long, dirty blonde hair looked silky smooth and soft. Her body curved in the perfect places, and overall she looked beautiful. I wish my looks could amount to hers, but alas, my disgusting, greasy black hair would forever pale in comparison. My body as flat as a board, looking like some malnourished skeleton. My green eyes would never shine bright as her crystal blue ones. As I was wallowing in self-pity, Madison re-entered the Starbucks with her hands behind her back. Voila! She cheered, presenting me with a little teddy bear. It was brown and had a little red bow across its neck. Damn, and I really wanted to be mad at you too. I said gently grabbing the stuffed animal. She knew my kryptonite was stuffed animals, and I just melted when I saw it. Afterwards, we exchanged our new numbers, hugged again, and went our separate ways. I got back to my house with my little teddy bear, which I had promptly dubbed Beanie, snuggled between my arms. I fell asleep on the couch, watching a show on Netflix around 10 p.m. 
I woke up the next morning in one of those states of bliss. It quickly dissipated when I noticed that my feet were hanging off the side of the couch and my shirt was feeling tight around my throat. I chalked it up to me shifting down the couch as that happens sometimes. I opened my eyes and stood up. This isn't right, I thought. My center of gravity was off and a slight soreness set in deep in my bones. I looked down and my sight seemed distorted. The ground was farther away. I made a run to the bathroom. I made it there quicker than I anticipated. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was taller. My shirt was tighter because I was too big for it. It's a good thing I slept with just underwear on. I grabbed a tape measure and looked at my new height. My arms were longer too. That five nine is what it read. I had grown a whole foot and three inches in one night. I jumped up and down in joy. After adjusting the seat of my car, I raced over to my parents' house in excitement. Oh my god, my mother exclaimed. Amelia, is that you? My dad said after. What happened to you? They asked. I hadn't thought about it in my excitement. It, it's a hormone therapy I'm trying, I said, making an excuse on the spot. The rest of the day was full of my siblings gawking at my new figure and me finally feeling as a part of the family. Mary, my mother, and I went to the local Walmart after dinner to get myself some new clothes that would actually fit. After my shopping spree, I happily went home. My life was perfect now. I took ibuprofen as the growing pains had gotten a bit worse. I slipped into bed into my new comfortable PJs and looked at my bedside table as I started to drift. My eyes laid upon Beanie. I looked up at the stuffed bear suspiciously. I then scoffed. No way a stuffed bear could be responsible for this, I thought as I sleepily closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep. I awoke to a loud thud. A sting of pain shot through the left side of my body as I came to. In the little light of dawn shining through my windows, all I could make out was that I had fallen off my bed. I shifted up as more pain shot through my body. I found the chain to my lamp. Oddly quickly, I might add. Light flooded the room as the full extent of what happened was illuminated. I hadn't fallen off the bed. The bed frame had snapped, making my body fall to the floor. I looked over the bed and saw shreds of clothing. I looked down, and to my horror, I was mostly nude. Not only was I mostly naked, but I was big. Very big. I stood up and made my way to the bathroom, pain shooting throughout my whole body as I did. My view was very distorted as I stumbled towards the mirror. I bumped my head in the doorway. Grabbing my head, I lunged for the tape measure. Eight foot three. My ceiling was ten feet in my bedroom. I turned to look in the mirror. My body portions were huge. I screamed in horror as everything was growing bigger and faster, the pain getting worse and worse. Not only was it getting taller, but fatter and wider as well. My long, fat feet made my wooden floors creak as I ran down the stairs. I feared I would fall through. I was rapidly expanding now, the pain exploding as well. I began to sob. I made my way to the longest and tallest part of my house, the living room. My living room ceiling was 15 feet, luckily, and it stretched to 25. Soon I was so tall I had to sit, but that wasn't enough. My huge feet eventually reached the other side of the wall, and I had to duck my head to avoid hitting the ceiling. I was quite literally a giant now. Eventually I seemed to have stopped growing, but I was in so much pain and in a very uncomfortable position. I heard my phone begin to ring upstairs. And at that moment, I was glad I installed Alexa. I answered the call using the in-home assistant. It was Morgan. Amelia, listen to me. Do you still have the bear? I answered in an unintentionally loud voice. Yes, I'm kind of busy right now, though, so I'll have to call you back. Wait, I'm on my way over. The bear is cursed. And by the sound of it, you're bigger than you desired, aren't you? I was shocked. So, it was the bear? I said. Yes. To tell you the truth, I'm a witch. 
and I cursed the bear so that he would grow a little bit taller. However, it seems I made a major hiccup, she said. I am about to burst out of my house, I said angrily. I'm almost there. I'll fix everything soon, she said in a worried tone. Yeah, you better. After a few more minutes, Madison reached my house. She was barely able to get into the house because my legs were blocking the door. Where's the bear? She said in a hurried tone. Upstairs on the nightstand. I pulled out my hand and she stepped onto it. I lifted her to the stairs. After a minute or two and some weird incantations coming from my room, I began to shrink. It took no less than two minutes for me to shrink back to my normal size. Madison emerged from the stairs, holding some clothes for me in her hand. Look, I can explain, she said, handing me the clothes. Get changed and I'll brew you some coffee. I did as she said, and after a minute there was a fresh steaming cup of joe in front of me. Madison sat across from me. She began to open her mouth to speak, but before she could, I slapped her. Although taken aback, she said, I deserve that. I shook my head in agreed annoyance. Apparently, when we hung out at Starbucks, she plucked one of my hairs, and then proceeded to read an enchantment spell off of a spell book she bought off the dark web. She had gotten into witchcraft and wanted to try out a new spell from her new book. After successfully altering herself, she, for some reason, thought of me. She gave me the bear, and I was supposed to grow a foot or two, but... She messed up the incantation, and I became a giant. Thankfully, she reversed the spell, and I was normal again. Moral of the story, folks. Don't be friends with witches, and be glad that you have the body you do. When we lived in the city, and it came time to put Muncher to sleep, Dad said we had to leave his body at the vet's. I didn't want to abandon my dog, even if he was dead. Muncher looked so vulnerable lying there, with his tongue lolling and his limbs splayed out like a puppet. He could almost be asleep, except for that his eyes were wide open. I was nine years old when we brought Muncher to the vet. I guess my parents thought I could handle watching life go out of my dog's eyeballs like a dying candle flame watching his panting slow, then stop. If so, they were wrong. I had nightmares about Muncher for years. Those slowed and stopped too, but the dark dreams restarted when it was Diva's turn to go off to the great kennel in the sky. By then, with my older siblings, Brett and Sierra, away at school, and with me leaving the nest for New York in a couple of months... My parents had downsized and moved into a quaint bungalow outside of a small town called Kearney. When you live out in the country, you don't leave your dog in a white room at the veterinarian's office for their corpse to add to the summit of a mass grave. You bury them out back on your own property. Most of the bumpkin substitutes euthanasia for the business end of a shovel when it comes time for their dog to pass. But Diva went quietly in the middle of the night before we had enough thought about how she would go. I loved Diva. She was a rescue, a beautiful Belgian sheepdog. We got her straight after Muncher, and she saw me through the toughest times of my young life. She was there to confront me when Brett and his friend tossed water balloons into my bedroom when I was asleep, ruining every book I had. She was there for me after my first high school breakup, when I thought my heart might explode out of my chest like the creature in Alien and for the second breakup, when I was sure that it did. Diva was there when my dad got cancer, and I'm positive she was the reason he ended up beating it. Cancer free for four years and counting. It was like Diva absorbed the disease, lifted the manic cells out of my father and into her own body through sheer force of will. It was barely surprising when the tumors emerged under her skin, and less so when the disease killed her in less than one month. My whole family knew Diva would die for any one of us, and cancer had waited four deceptively calm years to take a life. It could not wait any longer. I buried her myself, 
Dad wanted to do it, uh, I think more than he wanted me not to have to do it, but I told him it was fine. Mom didn't say a word when I left the house that morning with a shovel and a pine wood box, but I didn't expect her to. She had always been uncomfortable with the idea of death, never mind being within arm's reach of the thing. I took Diva's body out into the forest out back. I didn't go too far in, and I think that was my first mistake. My parents bought a place right on the edge of town limits, and if I had gone maybe twenty or thirty steps farther in, maybe Diva would have stayed dead. The coffin I made for her was heavier than I expected it to be, and I felt that as soon as I was out of sight from my own bedroom window, I had gone far enough. Goodbye, girl, I said, staring down the fresh hole. My hands were blistering from digging. You were a good dog. Thanks for saving my dad. I stopped, feeling I should say more, but the moment passed. Before I knew it, I was shoveling dirt back into the hole. I think maybe that was my second mistake, and not giving her a proper goodbye. She deserved one, but for the life of me, I couldn't think of anything else to say. I packed a heavy rock to serve as a tombstone, and wrote out an inscription with a sharpie I pulled from the house. The ink was supposed to be waterproof, but if it didn't last, that was fine. The grave was for me. I know how weird that sounds, to be possessive over another creature's grave, but I was. Here lies Diva, I wrote. The best dog you could hope for. Take care of her, God. 2002 to 2011. It occurred to me that uh, God is dog spelled backwards. A strange thought to have at any time, even stranger knowing what happened afterwards. When I got to the edge of the forest, I spared one last glance over my shoulder to look at her stone. The message was still there, but the first drops of rain coming down made it look like either the stone or the message I had written out was crying. How'd it go? My father asked when I joined him at the kitchen table. He had Fridays off. A strange thing for a car salesman, but my dad had the sales numbers to do pretty much whatever he wanted. Fine, I said. Did you cry? I had not even considered crying until that moment. I'm not an emotionally guarded person by any stretch. Almost all the guys of my high school football team were a hell of a lot tougher than I was. I told my father the truth. That's all right, he said. My mom was at the kitchen sink, pretending to wash dishes, but I could tell from the harsh way she was glaring into the faucet and the tight slash of her mouth that she was listening. Don't feel bad, Ethan. She knows you loved her. Mom had spoken the words as if they were escaping from the end of a balloon. They rushed out all at once, flapping at a pitch three or four octaves too high. My father looked at the back of her head, trying to feel out if she was okay. Then he nodded to me. I don't feel bad about it, I admitted. I just didn't cry. She knows you loved her, my mom repeated. What are you going to do today? My father asked. I, I, I don't know. Why don't you take Lila into town, he said. I think it's fish feast this weekend. I'll give you some cash and you can get her a hand-carved wooden necklace or something. I heard they sell all sorts of knickknacks. If I could sum up my father in just one sentence, it would be this. He is the sort of person who unironically uses the term knickknacks. I don't want your money, I said, but I took the twenty when he handed it to me. After a brief text exchange, I drove over to Lila's. When her dad's farm disappeared behind us, Lila asked me about Diva and how I was feeling about the whole thing. I told her that I appreciated the concern, but I didn't want to talk about it. I parked in the spot behind Roaster's Pub so that Lila could use her employee parking pass, and we held hands as we walked towards town towards Victoria Park. She was telling me a story about the new girl at work, Caitlin or Katie, and how she was such a brown noser. I nodded in all the right spots, managed a sharp exhale through my nose to pass for laughter when she mentioned that the new girl was probably blowing the owner, but my thoughts were on Diva. 
One time, when she was just a puppy, she had been so happy to see my mom walking through the front door, her arms laden with grocery bags that Diva had urinated straight into the carpet with the force of a pressure washer. I was thinking about the tired, half-angry, half-amused expression on my mom's face when we strolled under the waving Fish Feast banner. For most of the summer, the park had served as a place for teenagers to get together to smoke when the sun was up and drink when it went down. Now, though, uh, colorful booths with local vendors and their customers lined the park. Farther along, the cooks and their grills were set up, dispensing deep-fried fish and french fries with genuine smiles. We passed straight by the jumbled merchandise and collectibles and straight towards lunch. The fish vendors were arranged along the perimeter of a semicircle stretch of glass. This area was crowded with tables and chairs, and there was a large plastic trophy painted gold displayed in the center. Whoever served the best dish, as voted upon by the attendees of Fish Feast, would have their name engraved into the trophy to join the elite club. It was the height of honor in Kearney to participate in Fish Feast as a prestigious affair akin to winning the Stanley Cup to be the year's victor. Lila went to one of the booths, and I went to a different one. Thank you for choosing Harry's House of Halibut, said a teenage girl who might have been Harry's daughter or niece. What can I get you? I don't care, I said. My dog died today. Her smile faltered and she shoved a plate into my arms and all but shooed me away after I paid her. I didn't care. I was thinking about how much Diva would have liked to chow down on deep-fried meat, and that she wouldn't have minded the newspaper appetizer that the fish was wrapped in. Lila offered me a bite of hers, and I took it into my mouth, that chewed and swallowed without much enthusiasm. I wasn't hungry. I offered her a bite of mine because it seemed like the thing to do, and when she asked which I liked better, I said hers. They both tasted the same to me. Grey mush. As miserable as I was, though, I could see that my girlfriend was making an effort to make me feel better, so I forced out a shallow smile that scored the edges of my mouth. Do you want to check out some of the booths? She asked. Sure. Did you see anything you wanted to look at? Uh, no, I said. Uh, did you? I saw one lady selling silver jewelry from Thailand. I think the proceeds go to an elephant sanctuary. Uh, will you buy me something? Sure. She wasn't being selfish. We'd only been dating seven months, but she knew me as well as my parents did. I liked buying her things. If she picked out something she liked and I paid for it, she would wear it every day. She led the way, pulling my hand through the crowd much the same way that Diva would pull against her leash whenever I walked her. I ended up buying two silver rings from the sweet Thai lady with the elephants. Lila loved them both and put one on her ring finger and one on her pinky finger, careful to point out to me that you use the ring finger of the right hand for engagement, or maybe it was the left. I can't remember. By the time the rings were paid for and Lila was admiring them with her hand stretched out in front of her, the same way a crossing guard would tell a kid not to step out into the street. It was a little after 12.30. We checked out a few more booths without buying anything. And my mood was improving, and by 1.30 I had parted through most of the dark grey morning clouds and could see the sun on the other side. Let's go to your place, I said. Lila had already met my parents, but I had other reasons for wanting to stay away. Are you ready to go? Sure. She said. We walked towards the exit, but someone called out to us just before we stepped into the parking lot. Hail to the young couple. Come see me where's before you go. The voice belonged to a man in his forties whose build reminded me of a thin-legged spider. He wore a ridiculous purple suit with a matching top hat. And he had a long, twirling black mustache growing over a mouth that was half filled with gold teeth. He was a salesman and the stall behind him was draped in a deep purple to match his outfit. Heil? Lila asked as we approached. Forgive me, miss. Heil is an informal greeting of friendship where I'm from. He spoke in an accent that made forgive sound like forgive. Where's that? 
I was looking with detached interest at more silver and wooden jewelry. I had seen a hundred pieces today already, each as forgettable as the last. A place far, far away from here, he said. I wasn't listening. I had asked to be polite and not waited to listen for an answer. That was my third mistake, not paying closer attention to the purple-clad salesman. Three strikes and you're out. What brings you to Kearney? Layla asked. Kearney's been on my radar for some time, salesman said. I'd often heard there are many people in this dear town with eclectic taste. It's like an eclectic taste to appreciate the value of my wares. Well, it's nice to meet you. My name's Lila Prince. She offered her hand to shake. Felix Emanuel Lamnick the Ninth, the salesman said. Charmed, my dear. I... have you sold much? I asked. I had at last found something unusual. A necklace with a black horsefly and a small bottle of preserving fluid for a pendant. I turned over the price tag on the fly necklace. Three hundred dollars. Sadly, no. Felix said. It appears that good taste aside, the pockets of Kearney are not quite as deep as I had hoped. Why is everything so expensive? I turned over a couple more price tags. The cheapest item was the horsefly necklace. Ethan, Lila said, sounding a little shocked. That's rude. I was just asking. That's quite all right, the man called Felix said. I turned to face them and Felix's eyes were twinkling like the North Star. Ethan, was it? My goods may look perhaps stranger, but of no greater quality than the garbage your neighbors are peddling. I assure you my merchandise is in a different league. Why's that? Lila removed the new silver ring and slid them quietly into her pocket. I'm afraid you'll have to buy one to find out, Felix said. He looked almost sad while he said it, as if regretting that we might spend money here. I don't think my pockets are deep enough, I said. Sorry. That's quite all right, Felix said, and he smiled, showing off at least eight or nine golden teeth. Thank you, Lila said as I led her back to the car. We went over to her place. Both of Lila's parents were at work, so we had the house to ourselves. Ordinarily, we would take the opportunity to screw, but my heart just wasn't in it. We held hands, and I stared at the TV instead. The movie I Am Legend was on, and when it was over, I gave her a goodbye kiss and left. I can't remember what excuse I made. Maybe I told her the truth, that I needed to be alone. The dog dies in that movie, and it made me feel about as crummy as you'd expect. I didn't get much sleep that night. Or the next. I expected to have some foul dreams about my dead dog, but to my surprise, she didn't visit my sleep once. It was Felix who kept showing up. In my dreams, Lila and I were back at Fishfest. We wandered into his stand, and I went straight to the back to look at the goods he was selling. Instead of a fly necklace, my attention would be drawn by a different adornment. A ring made by two finger bones loops together. A silver bracelet with scorpion pincers jangling from one side. A plain-looking pair of wooden earrings that caused blisters to boil on my fingers when I touched them. Each time, I would flip over the price tag, and instead of hundreds of dollars, the tag would read, free. None of these items appealed to me, and I would leave with Lila the same way we did in real life, with Felix grinning his golden grin beneath his black mustache. Then I would wake staring at my alarm clock to discover I had only slept an hour. When sleep found me again, the cycle would restart. I had three or four of the same dream every night for a week, all versions identical except for the adornments which caught my eye. When I phoned Lila, ready to confess that I was cracking like an egg, she would cry. She told me that she was having the same dreams that I was, but with one difference. Last night... During her third repetition of the dream, she gave in and took something from the booth. I asked her what she had bought, and she told me in her dream I had picked out a copper-colored necklace with a whistle on the end and draped it over her neck. And when I woke up, she said, her small cries morphing into heavy sobs, the necklace was under my pillow. 
The same one. It had a whistle and everything. It, don't touch it, I said. Don't put it on. Don't even think about blowing on the whistle. But when she spoke next, crying harder than ever, I knew it was too late. I blew it, she moaned. I didn't know what came over me, but just looking at it, it felt like I had to. It felt like if I didn't blow the whistle, then he would come into my room and kill me. I didn't need to ask her who he was. What happened when you blew it? I breathed. Lila's crying stopped, and the line went silent. Hello? I asked. But there was no answer. I pulled the cell phone from my face to make sure the call was still connected. Uh, hello? I tried again, a little louder. I was ready to end the call and drive straight over when she whispered a reply. Nothing. She whispered. It didn't even make a noise. I just blew and nothing happened. And then I realized what I was doing and how dangerous it might be. And I threw it in the garbage. But I think it's too late, Ethan. I shouldn't have blown the whistle, but I did. And now something awful is going to happen to me. I tried to comfort her. I told her I would drive over, that it was just a coincidence that we were having the same dream, but my heart wasn't in it. Lila thought something awful was going to happen to her, and I was sure she was right. I got dressed and showered, but as I was stepping out of the door, I heard my mother. Ethan? Her voice was wavering and hushed, like there was a burglar sticking his pistol into her ear and demanding she remain calm. Are you okay, Mom? Diva is in the backyard. I ran back into the house, through the kitchen to where my mother was standing. She was staring out the window. Her skin was as white as milk. I was ready to tell her to relax, that whatever dog was in the backyard, it could not be Diva, and if it didn't have rabies or something, we could see about getting in touch with its owner. I stopped cold when I looked out the window. My blood cemented in my veins. Diva was coming towards us, or at least what was left of her. Most of her hair and skin had decayed or been eaten by worms, and the remains tattered of her were coated in dirt and scuttling insects. One of her eyes was gone, and a yellow mushroom sprouted from the socket. I could see more of her guts. One loop of intestines was dragging across the ground like a fleshy tail. She was moving towards the back door, which was perhaps ten feet away. I noticed a splinter of her pinewood coffin sticking up from between her toes. I sprinted to the back door and got the lock down on the screen door just before Diva, just before Diva jumped to paw at the handle. Her remaining eye had been dyed a dull red, and when she saw me, she snarled. She tried the door handle again, and when it didn't give, she backed up a few steps. She barked at me and hurled herself against the screen door. Her face crumpled into the mesh, then burst through. Hysterical barking filled the house, wild and furious. She was trying to force herself through the gap, twisting and gnashing her rotted teeth. She rammed the door frame again, and some of the wood splintered. I ran. Mom, we gotta go, I said, dashing into the kitchen to grab her. Go? There was a crashing at the back door. Some of the door, maybe all of it, had broken apart. Go, I yelled. Get in my car. I grabbed her shoulder and had to drag her through the house to the front door. I have to get my wallet, she said, her mind having snapped at the sight of our snarling, decaying dog, and she tried to break out of my grip. There was another crash at the back door, banged out of its hinges and hit the floor, and a quick, irregular scuttling across the wood. It was her claws. Diva was inside, maybe thrown off balance as she erupted into the house, but maybe not. She was barking again, and I managed to shove my mom out of the front door as Diva came screaming into view. The mushroom in her face waggled stupidly at me, but her lone eye burned, now as bright as the devil. I slammed the thick oak door between us. She barked again, smashed into the solid oak, and went silent. I heard her run away from the door and knew she had not given up. She was going the long way to get at us, out the back door and around the house. Mom was standing on the porch, staring at me. Mom, the car! Ethan, she said. Diva is sick. I shoved her towards the car, 
too hard, and she almost toppled down the porch steps. Diva was still barking, and she had never stopped. She was outside already and rushing around the house, faster than she had ever been in life. Move! I raced ahead, not to leave her behind, but to get the car unlocked and her door opened ahead of time. Mom was coming a little faster now, but at a light trot and not the breakneck speed she needed. I wondered how long it had been since my mom ran to or from anything. I was in the driver's seat, the car was rumbling, and the passenger door was open. All Mom had to do was climb in and shut the door. She was five or six steps away. Diva hurtled around the side of the house like a banshee, bearing gray teeth as sharp and serrated as kitchen knives. Mom didn't see Diva coming or couldn't bear to look. She took one shaking step into the car, and Diva was still on the other side. She was going to make it. She had maybe less than a second to spare, but she was going to make it. That was when Diva leapt clean over the car. At first I didn't realize what had happened. Diva was there one second, a zombified monster, and in the next moment she had disappeared from my car window. Then Mom was shrieking. Diva had pulled her out of the car. Then the screaming stopped. Diva was tearing at something wearing my mother's clothes, tearing it apart. I pulled the door closed and backed out from the driveway. I would have erupted into inconsolable tears if I looked back or even took the time to think about the horror that I was leaving behind, but I didn't. I put the gas pedal to the floor and drove. The drive to Lila's farm normally took ten minutes, but I did it in five, sending a huge cloud of gravel and dust along my trail. On the way, I passed an older woman in a yellow sundress, screaming to high heaven. She was being pursued by the fleshless skeleton of a greyhound. It was moving without tendons or muscles to propel it, barking without lungs or throats to funnel air. Before I could even think of stopping or slowing down, the skeleton had knocked her onto the gravel and was pulling the lady apart. Blood splattered across the yellow dress and I turned to look away. A minute later, I drove by a pack of medium-sized dogs in various states of decay. They saw me coming and chased the car for thirty seconds or so before giving up. One of them got distracted when it noticed a nearby farmhouse, and the pack broke off from me to chase a man who was driving a tractor and facing away from them. I rocketed the car across Lila's lawn without bothering with her driveway. Far off in her daddy's field, I saw three dogs ripping and tearing at something in denim overalls. Blood was popping from the body like a string of engorged zits. One of the dogs looked at me when I got out of the car one with three legs and no lower jaw. It left its brothers and started a brisk lope towards the house. I sprinted across the front yard and through the front door. Lila, I shouted. Ethan? She was upstairs. I took the steps forward a time. Lila was sitting on her bed. Tracks of tears were glistening on her cheek. She had a good view of the field from her bedroom window, and I could guess why she was crying. Ethan, she said. Did I do this? No, I said, but the copper necklace tinkled in clasped hands, and I knew I was lying. One of them is coming, she said, as I got her to her feet. I know. They just came out of the ground, she said. They didn't even shake off the dirt. Uh, one of them is Julian. She died three years ago, but I don't recognize the other dogs. What's going on? I don't know. They probably belong to the people who lived here before you, I said, or the people before them. How far do you think? How, how many dogs? All of them, I said, and she paled. All of them, in Kearney at least. I got Lila into the car. She was scared, but she didn't freeze in terror like my mother, and by the time the rotted hound who had been named Julian was bashing her skull against my car... I was already pulling out of the driveway. Where are we going? Lila asked. Coastal dealership, I said, thinking it was unlikely any dogs were buried in the center of town. I had to get my dad. Okay, Lila said, and rubbed her arm against her face to get the tears out of her eyes. I just realized I'm an orphan, she said. I reached over and squeezed her hand, not sure what else I could do. Lila's mother had died when she was eleven in a drunk driving accident. 
and her father was still back in the field. Lunch for the undead. I brushed against the necklace she was still holding and jerked my hand away in surprise. The whistle was freezing. So cold it burns to touch. I rolled down my window, took the necklace from her, and threw it into the dust. What if we needed that? She cried. What if we needed it to stop the dogs? That whistle brings them towards us, I said. There's only one person who can put an end to this, and we're going to deal with him after we pick up my dad. Felix? She asked, and I nodded. Kearney was in a worse state than I thought it would be. There was a half-decomposed German shepherd with no tail, working away at a fat woman in the McDonald's parking lot, and a whole pack of wiener dog skeletons chasing a middle-aged couple down the main street sidewalk. Gray storm clouds were gathering over the town. I had an idea they were there to blot out the sun. Another gift from Felix. Oh, God, Lila breathed. I just hope there isn't one of those mass pet graves nearby, I said. She stared at me, expecting me to take back an ill-timed joke, but I didn't. I couldn't stop myself from picturing an army of undead canines marching into town, with Muncher's skeleton leading the vanguard. Oh, God, Lila repeated. I pulled into the coastal dealership parking lot so fast that the brakes squealed and the tires smoked when I stopped. The outside of the building had almost all windows so that people driving by could see the newest vehicles on display, but the glass was all smashed. There were three dogs inside, and each of them was chowing down on a different victim. Not a single human face was recognizable, but a cold tingle running along my spine told me that if I thought about it hard enough or stayed a bit longer... I would recognize a pair of shoes, jumping as the owner was massacred, or the pattern of a bloodstained shirt. I could stay and wait for that to happen, or I could go. I kept driving. Ethan, Lila said, as we turned back into Main Street. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. She didn't say anything for another minute or so. Roaster's Pub was burning in the middle of town, and more than one store had a howling zombie dog inside. Some of them were munching on a gourd hunk of person meat, and those that weren't eating were stalking or catching prey. I drove through a red light. There was a cop car in front of us, but most of the driver was already inside of the distended stomach of a golden retriever. The retriever had a bright blue collar on, and its body was riddled by bullet holes. It was also missing half of its skull. Where are we going? She asked. Where do we think he is? It's Saturday, I told her. We're going to the last day of Fish Fest. Victoria Park was lifeless. Various woodwork and metal craft was strewn across the grass like we had just missed a tornado running through. The Fish Fest banner was flapping pleasantly in the wind, but there were one or two extra splatters of red paint on it today. I pulled the car onto the grass, then turned the key. The engine died obediently, and Lila and I sat, listening with the windows cracked. I woke them up, she whispered. I blew the copper dog whistle. I woke them from the dead. It's not your fault, I said, putting a hand on her leg. If you didn't pick the whistle, then you would have gotten something else, or I would have. How were you supposed to know? It was just a dream. We both mulled over that last part, because we both knew it wasn't just a dream, as if the town burning around us wasn't evidence enough. Felix had done this to us. Carney was being mauled to death because of him. I didn't see anything. Uh, let's get out, she said. Not yet. What are we waiting for? I opened my mouth to tell her I didn't know. A signal of some kind. When the wind picked up. It howled, shrieking like a restless spirit with the force of a hurricane. Most of the vendor booths were little more than canvas propped up by thin beams, and they were whisked out of Victoria Park, into the air, and gone forever. The stalls that were too heavy to blow away bulldozed flats by the tempest. A single stall remained, an unnamed canvas of purple to match its vendor's suit. Felix was there, waving us over. Let's go, I said. Lila and I climbed out of the car, 
We moved together and clasped our hands without thinking about it. Most of the sun was scrambled over with clouds, and rising smoke from the flames spouting all over town. But a stream of white light made it through the obstructions, illuminating Felix as if he and his stall were Broadway stars under the spotlight. His gold teeth winked merrily at us. I was beginning to think I didn't have any customers today, he said. It seems Fish Fest is cancelled. I wish someone from the town council had notified me to save me the trouble of setting up my stand. Though from what I'd seen today, I'm hardly surprised. I suspect the mayor's busy with other matters. Make it stop! I had to shout to hear myself over the wind. Dreadful. Just dreadful. Felix continued, as if I had not spoken. Look around. Not a soul to be seen. Not even the fish peddlers could make it. I suppose today they are being served for lunch. I wonder who'll taste best. Felix laughed, and it sounded like a poker raking over hot coals. Behind Felix's booth, plastic chairs and folding tables lay helter-skelter in the patch of grass. In the center of the clearing, the trophy lay blown over in the wind. It seemed to twinkle sadly at me, wondering where all the smiling faces had gone. What did you do? Lila shouted. We stopped ten or so feet from Felix. He was no longer smiling. What have I done? He asked. I have come a long way for you, Lila. I heard your dreams and wishes, and I made sure that no one else in your rotting, stinking town came to my booth. I wanted to make sure you got what you asked for. I put that whistle on layaway for you. I expected you to come thank me. You begged to have Ethan to yourself. You give anything to keep him in Kearney with you. Isn't that right? You said it every night for weeks. I looked over at Lila. She was shaking from head to toe. Dogs barking a few streets away, and hoped they were not eating someone else I cared about. This was your doing, girl. If you had just let the dogs eat you, and let me do it my way. The two of you would be together forever. You would have had eternity. You did not want the dogs to eat you. You should have picked something else from my selection. Something else. I suppose in a way that solved the mystery of the dreams. Whatever I might have picked, or whatever Lila might have picked, would have tried to kill both of us. I ran at Felix to hurt him, to strike him with my fists or feet or whatever I could hit him with. With the casual, jittering speed of lightning, Felix grabbed my collar and hoisted me into the air with a single gloved hand. I'll have no more interruptions from you, he said, and heaved me into the air. I soared, shouting for Lila, and crashed into the earth. When I opened my eyes, the fish feast trophy was looking back at me. Felix had thrown me the distance of half a football field. I turned my head, my neck cracked in protest, strained but not broken. Felix was saying something to Lila, but they were too far, and the wind too strong for me to hear what. She was sobbing with her eyes shut, and she was walking to her, one hand outstretched. I didn't know what kind of deal Felix had made, more with himself than with her, but I could guess what he might be taking from her. When dogs climbed out of their graves, and mysterious salesmen struck satanic deals in your mind, of course it would be the immortal soul he was after. If Felix was not the devil himself, the two of them were at least in the same line of work. I climbed to my feet, and without thinking about what I was doing, I armed myself with the fishy feast trophy. The second my fingers closed around the stem of the trophy, it began to glow. It was warm in my hands, and I turned it upside down, coming towards Felix with my two-handed club. The trophy seemed to be speaking to me through the warmth and shining gold as I wielded it through my hands and into my brain. It said that there was a force giving me power through the trophy, not God or anything so grandiose, but the good and white to oppose Felix's evil red and purple. The gold and good was equal to Felix at best, certainly not greater than him, and maybe a little weaker. The trophy was an object which people had, in their own way, poured their souls into. Hope, camaraderie, laughter... 
and other elements of good had been poured into the golden plastic ever since it had served as the emblem of Fish Feast. And that was why the white and gold force was able to use it to channel its power through me. It told me that the good force would not last forever. I had perhaps one good strike before the power faded to nothing, and we were done for. Felix spun as I grasped the trophy, sensing that I had found a weapon or that the weapon had found me. His eyes burned with black flames. Die! He screamed and pointed a long, pale finger at me. His fingernails were ink-black and sharpened to razor-thin points. Nothing happened straight away, but the trophy throbbed forebodingly in my hands. Time was short. I accelerated my shambling walk towards Felix into a jog, and as I broke into a run, the ground beneath my feet shook like a mild earthquake. Something was coming. Undead dogs stampeded into Victoria Park towards us. They snapped and barked at us. Some of them were laughing at us, too. Deep, squawking laughter that came into crow-like bursts. Most of the zombies were nothing but skeletons, and it was easy to pick out the dog in the lead. Diva was tied to me by the bond we had when she was alive, and she had followed this bond, like a physical thread linking us together, into town. I guessed that she had been sprinting towards me since I drove away from my house. I ran at Felix, coaxing the last burst of speed from my aching legs. The light of the trophy was beginning to fade. It would be gone any second now. I swung at his head, but he backstepped, and I missed him. Lila screamed behind me. I had swung too hard, and Felix took a step forward again, the trophy still swooping in its arch. Too heavy to pull back in time. He reached a hand at me, and I dropped my weapon. She caught it under my arm. Felix did not see her until it was too late, and he already had one hand around my neck and the other snaring my wrists together like handcuffs. His hands were ice cold. He let go, hissing like a snake, stepping back again, out of reach to avoid a second attack. But he was too slow. Lila's strike caught him under the chin, and Felix's neck snapped back. He screamed, one long cry of injustice and pain and exploded into ashes and smoke. His last scream of fury lingered in the air, and was caught and carried off in the wind. I turned. Diva was there. She took another step towards me, leapt, and burst into dust less than a foot from my face. The dogs behind her went too, one after the other, as if dissolved by an invisible ocean wave. In a moment, they were all gone, blowing away in a wind that was already calming down. Then it was just Lila and I. She was covered in sweat, and I realized I was too. Sweat and dirt clung to my skin from where Felix had thrown me into the earth. She smiled, and I smiled back. I went into her arms. She had dropped the trophy. The glow had faded out of it. It was just plastic. Are you okay? We both asked at the same time. No. We both answered and laughed. I think he's done for, I offered. I don't, she replied, a shadow cast over her face. I think he's gone from here, from Kearney, and maybe he won't ever come back. But he's somewhere. Creeps like him are never gone for good. Maybe you'll see him in our dreams, I joked then wished I'd get my mouth shut. What if it was true? What if he was all we ever dreamed about ever again? Unending trips to Fish Fest to pick out cursed trinkets. But Lila was shaking her head. No, she said. I know that's not how it works. I grabbed her hand, squeezed it to tell her she didn't need to explain. I knew things too. Things I had no business knowing about the forces of good and evil. The trophy had given me the courage to attack Felix and inspire Lila into action. Maybe it had given her the knowledge she needed after it was all done. Did you really pray that I wouldn't leave? I asked her. I didn't know you were religious. I'm not, she said, blushing. But I felt like I had to try. I'm so sorry. 
You couldn't have known. No, uh, not about this, she said. The hand not holding mine swept over the chaos around us. We passed under the fish fest banner again and strolled into the parking lot, and she continued. It was selfish of me to want to hold you back. I know you have to go away to school. I love you, Ethan. It was the first time either of us had said it. I love you too, I said. Then, in a burst of passion, I added, Come to New York with me. Come with you? She asked, climbing into my car. Why not? The ownership of our parents' houses will pass to us. I'll have to split the money with Brad and Sierra, but I'll make them sell. They won't argue. You could sell too, and we could get an apartment together, and... She put her hands to my lips. Let's do it, she said. She kissed me. I kissed her back, and I drove. We let the town of Kearney burn around us and didn't look back. Let's get a cat. I know the timing of this story is very odd, and a lot of people will be confused as to why someone like me would openly admit to doing what I am, and you know what? I don't blame you. I wouldn't dare confess to what I've done, but I feel like it's time for me to explain why I do it. First, I do not condone or support other killers. In fact, two of my uh, victims were murderers of the worst degree. Second, all of those I have killed have committed at least one of three crimes. One is murder, but it has to have been committed by no other reason than pleasure or enjoyment or in cold blood. The other two might cause this to be taken down, but one is forcing minors to do unspeakable things, and the other is forcing themselves onto others. That's all I'll say on that. Because of these crimes, they would have a first-class ticket to hell. That means they were the perfect candidates for what I had to do. I wouldn't blame you for thinking I'm just a sicko making excuses. I would think that too. But my time is limited, so I'll just get to the points and give you the reason I do this. I kill and sacrifice them to stop the world from ending. This all began in a night out with two of my friends, Luke and Juno. We were at a bar and Luke was talking about his terrible teacher when Juno whispered to me, Hey, Matt, I think you have an admirer. I turned to where Juno was looking and saw a beautiful brunette smiling at me, with teeth as white as pearls. I smiled back at her and raised my glass. The woman returned the gesture with a wicked smirk. For context, I was only out of a long-term relationship with a woman I truly loved. We were happy, till I found her in bed with her best friend. Because of this, I was a bit rusty and reluctant to jump back into a relationship or even a one-night stand. Luke glanced back and saw the woman. Holy hell, dude, he began. That's one hot bi- Woman. Juno cut across him while giving him a glare that could turn Medusa to stone. After their staring contest, Luke berated me and told me to go and talk to her. After a minute of this and Juno's gentle nudges to do so, I got up and approached the bar. I leaned on top of the counter as I called for the bartender. When he got to me and asked what I wanted, I said, One Bud Light and whatever the lady here wants. She smiled and said, It's just a Jack and Coke for me. Thank you. Out of sheer awkwardness, I struck out my hand and said, My name's Matt. What's yours? As I felt myself cringe inside, the woman took my hand and shook it. My name's Chloe. Nice to meet you, Matt. We talked while we waited for the drinks. Chloe was in her final year of archaeology at the nearby college. You're uh, beautiful for a 22-year-old, I said. She giggled and said, No, I'm actually 26. I was in a terrible job for a few years before I eventually made it here. Well, uh, you could have fooled me. You look only 20, I chuckled. We continued and I told her about myself. I eventually brought her over to introduce her to my friends. They seemed to like her, especially Luke. 
As we talked, I saw two people enter the bar and look around. One was a tall, bulky man with long black hair and an extended goatee that made me jealous. The other was a short, slender woman with her blood-red hair tied back in a ponytail, and her face was covered in freckles. Chloe saw them and said, while waving to them, Those are my friends. Do you guys mind if they join us? Before I could say it, Juno said, The more, the merrier. And we took two nearby chairs and made room for the two newcomers. When they got to us, Chloe made the introductions. Uh, guys, these are my friends, Nate and Amanda. We said hello and shook their hands while Chloe continued. This is Luke, Juno, and Matt. As the night progressed, we all got sufficiently drunk. As I sat there, giggling to a stupid joke Luke made with slight difficulty, Chloe tapped my arm and asked me if I could help her to the bathroom. With a bit of difficulty, I got off my seat and helped Chloe to the bathroom. When Chloe went inside, I felt the need to drain my bladder myself, so I went into the men's room and went into the last stall, but I left the door open. As I finished and zipped myself up, I heard the door open and footsteps approaching. I had just turned around when a sharp, stabbing pain erupted from my neck. I gave a yelp of pain and surprise before falling back and cracking my head on the stall wall. The last thing I saw was Chloe, holding an empty needle and smiling before everything went dark. I woke up as my head slammed against something metal, and I jolted awake. I looked around to see a darkness around me, but I saw Juno and Luke beside me, hands bound by a lot of duct tape. I moved my hands to get it off of them, but I realized I was in the same predicament as them. I asked them what happened, and they told me that Chloe said I wasn't responding to her, and they found me in the stall. Nate and Amanda then stuck them with needles, and they woke up just before me. Where the hell are we? Juno asked, worriedly. Before I could answer her, a voice rang out from the darkness. You're in the back of our truck, and we're nearly at our destination. A shape appeared from the darkness, and Nate stared down at us, with a wicked smile plastered onto his face. Before I could swear up a storm, the vehicle came to a slow halt, and Nate said, Look, we've arrived. The door swung open, and I could see Amanda's face peer in from outside. Get them up, she barked at Nate. Nate gave her a mocking bow and said, Yes, your highness, before grabbing Juno and Luke's bonds and dragging them to the door and carried them out, one then the other, like a bride on her wedding night. I was last to be dragged and carried out, but I was carried like a sack of potatoes. Nate threw me to the ground. I could feel the hard impact of the grassy floor on my back, and all the air escaped my lungs. As I struggled to catch it, I looked around and saw that we were in a clearing surrounded by trees and a single dirt road. I also saw my friends having their bonds cut off, and Luke was forced to stand in place, with Amanda grabbing him by the hair. That was when I saw what she had to her throat. It looked like a hand axe, but it was completely black. Midnight black. I felt my hands being pulled, and I saw Nate cutting the duct tape off my hands and legs, but leaving me on the floor as he joined Amanda. I saw Nate pick up a scythe that was the same color as Amanda's axe off the ground and held it upright. I saw Chloe approaching the trio from the side of the truck. She saw me and smiled a smile that made my guts clench with fear. She approached them and pulled out a dagger. She spread her arms out and looked up to the sky. Oh, great dawn, the dark one, god of death, she called out. Please accept this sacrifice in your name and know that these are the final three souls to release you from your realm and know that we, as your eternal servants, will serve beside you for all of eternity. I watched in horror as Amanda slid the axe across Luke's throat. As my friend spat out blood and had a waterfall of it cascading from his throat, Chloe stuck her dagger into his chest, into his heart, and twisted. Luke's eyes were wide as he fell forward and laid still on the grass, blood pooling around him. 
Juno made it to me with tears in her eyes, and we both began to run. I could hear Chloe say, Get them before they escape, Nate. I heard footsteps coming quickly behind us as Nate came sprinting towards us. Juno picked up a large rock and spun around, avoiding Nate's swing of the scythe and connected with his skull with a sickening crunch. Nate sprawled out on the floor and Juno picked up his scythe. She screamed out as she buried the blade into the back of his skull. As she freed it from his skull, I called out to her when I saw Amanda quickly approaching. Juno turned to face her, but Amanda's axe caught her in the stomach, and Juno went down, dragging the axe from Amanda's hand, but threw the scythe towards me. I scrambled to the scythe and picked it up as Amanda freed the axe from Juno's stomach and was about to deliver the killing blow when the scythe caught her under her left breast and threw her back. Amanda dropped the axe and fell backwards, dead before she hit the ground. I knelt down and tried to get her on her feet. As I got Juno to hers, she yelled out my name. I turned and felt a sharp, burning pain emanating from between my lower ribs on my right side. Chloe retracted the blade from my body and went for a second stab to my chest. No, Juno said as she swung the axe into Chloe's side. Chloe cried and buried the blade into Juno's throat. I made a move and dragged the axe head from Chloe's side across and opened her stomach. Chloe's eyes went wide as she fell to her knees and stared at her insides. She gave a shaky smile and said, I will live forever by the side of the almighty Don as he shapes this world into his own. Before she fell back and stared without looking at the stars, I stood there, covered in blood, and in a state of shock. I was just about to puke when I heard someone clapping from behind me. I spun around and stared into the face of a shadow. The featureless being separated from the shadows of the trees and approached me. Well done, it said. Its voice was as smooth as butter, and I felt a sudden sense of calm. You were the last one standing. I am amazed. I stared in awe as the thing began to take form. Its body took on a large but slender frame, and its face took a human-like shape with a small but sharp nose, a mouth full of sharp white teeth, two blood-red eyes, and black hair that hung down to his ears. What the hell are you? I asked with a shaky voice. It smiled at me. I'm the god of death. Some even refer to me as a lord but you can call me Dawn. I stared at it. What are you? Didn't they need one more sacrifice? It gave a smirk and replied. They gave me enough souls to appear in your world, but I cannot affect it physically. Are you waiting for me to die to claim mine? I said, as I applied more pressure to my wound. If that was why, i will be willing to wait a while. That girl didn't hit any important organs, so you'll only bleed to death. But that would take some time. Then what do you want from me? I said, realizing that he had no real reason to be talking to me at this point. Ah, you are smart. I'll give you that. Seeing as I most likely won't receive any souls with my supplies dead, I would like to make a deal with you. I stared in disbelief. A god wanted to make a deal with me. But why? What do you propose for this deal? As you already know, if I enter your realm, I will rule over it, but I will allow my army of undead souls to feast on every living being they can get their hands on. I am a fair deity, though, so I propose to you this. If you can give me what these three failed to do, I will return to my realm, and leave this one alone. Are you insane? An idiot can see that you want me to repeat the process and let you free, I said, shaking my head in frustration. Those three killed innocents only. You would be killing those who deserve it. Those who have ruined lives and spit in society's face. 
If you can sacrifice the originally agreed upon number of souls within the same time frame, I will never return to this plane again. I swear upon the other deities that I will not return. I stared at Don. I glanced down at his outstretched hand. What was the original number agreed upon? I asked. Don smiled a toothy grin and said, One hundred souls in ten years. I gulped. One hundred dead in ten years. That was a tough choice, but I made my decision. You have a deal, I said, taking his hand firmly and shaking it. Good. Good, Don said. I will provide you with the necessary tools and necessities, and I will guide you to those that are worthy or unworthy enough to be sacrificed. I heard the sound of hooves approaching, and I turned to see a beautiful white horse galloping towards me. Isn't she a beauty? Don said. I... yeah, she is. I said, as it stopped just in front of me. I will contact you soon when everything is in motion, he said, as he got onto the horse's back. Oh, before I forget, you agreed upon all the originally stated agreements, correct? Don said, as he sat high on his horse and stared down at me. Yes, I did. Why? I asked him. Don smiled once more, the same way that Chloe smiled before killing Luke. Because if you fail to get me those souls, your own soul will be forfeited, and that will count as their hundredth soul, and I will walk this world with my army. He said. Fare thee well. Mr. Porter, I will keep my eye on you. Don't forget it, he said, before signaling his horse into a gallop and disappeared as the sun rose, leaving me in a field of blood, sorrow, and pain. My first kill was after my friend's funerals. Juno told us about her uncle, about how he abused her as a child and how she couldn't tell her parents because of the fear he put into her. When I saw him at the funeral, I got angry, but his body glowed red while everyone else stayed the same. Before I could speak, I heard the voice of Dawn whispering, He will be your first, much like he was to your friend. I followed him home afterwards, and made it painful for him. After that, I would locate my prey and would find the perfect time to strike. I got better and better as time passed, and I never second-guessed those I killed. I would always get flashes of what they had done, courtesy of Dawn, that cemented their fate. This worked until now. I was watching a man enter his home late at night, and I knew he was going to be my last. It had been nearly ten years since that night, and I've killed ninety-nine criminals. I decided that this was my moment to strike. So I did. I entered through the back door and crept into his living room. As he sat there, watching the show uh, Dexter, because of course he does, I wrapped the wire around his neck and dragged him out of his seat. As he kicked and screamed, I asked him, Is this how it felt? To kill a little girl this way? Through his chokes, he asked, What girl? The one you choked to death with piano wire? The one you sold to her that very day, I said. This sicko ran a music store and sold his victim piano wire for her piano. When it was closed, he went to her house and snuck in to defile her. When she wouldn't be quiet, he choked her with the wire until she stopped moving. He abandoned her and ran like the coward he was. He was going to pay. Before he could choke to death, I pulled out my dagger and slammed it into his chest, right into his heart. He stopped kicking after that. As I got up and breathed in some fresh air, a strange sensation came over me. I could suddenly hear laughing coming from behind me. I turned and saw Don strolling into the room, laughing. Why are you laughing? It's done. This was the hundredth soul. I asked in a bizarre confusion. You are a fool. Why would I truly help someone lock me away? 
I helped you kill those other 99 because I wanted their souls regardless, but that person, he pointed to the corpse on the ground, that was some innocent music store owner. My head reeled as I realized what I had done. You monster! I screamed at him. You better find that hundredth soul, Matthew. Your time is nearly up, he said, as he pointed to the clock on the wall. It was nearly sunrise, meaning that the world would end when the sun rose. Dawn vanished into the darkness, cackling madly. I swore up a storm and cursed myself for believing that he actually wanted me to stop him. I tried to think of something to do or say or anything. As I looked at my bloody hands, I realized something. So, here I am, still at the man's house. I accessed his computer and got into some nobody's account on Reddit to tell you all this. I found a way to stop Don from entering the realm. In his attempt to stop me from sealing him away, he created his seal. I am now a murderer. I killed an innocent in cold blood. I am now a sacrificial soul. I hope the look on Don's face will be priceless. I really do. When I upload this, I will take one final drink of whiskey, and I will do what has to be done. But before I die, I will remember my friends' faces for one last time. I was in high school, 15, 10th grade, oblivious, totally unaware of the curse that had been bestowed upon me. I remember very clearly where it first happened. I was at home, watching the news, and then I saw it. Paul Newman had died. I didn't read the newspaper. I didn't have a phone back in 2008, unless you count a crappy call and text only Nokia so it was the first I'd heard of it. Have you ever felt like your throat swells up when you cry? Have you ever choked, uh, even momentarily? Imagine those two things simultaneously, but somehow unlike either one. It was strange. It is strange, and I still find it difficult to describe outside losing an allergy. When I saw the story on TV, I started choking, or my throat swelled up, or... An invisible demon wrapped an arm around my neck. Take your pick. At the time, I wasn't sure what was wrong with me, but I wasn't concerned because the sensation was painless and went away after a couple of minutes. Well, before my mom called me to dinner and my father grumbled about work. The next morning, I woke up in real discomfort, this time edging into pain that I can only equate to bronchitis. That raw feeling you get in your throat from a virus spreading its clones inside your body. I wanted to see the nurse at school. Since I was otherwise fine, my teacher didn't believe me. So I went on my lunch break, of my own volition, evading teachers and hall monitors under the guise of a bathroom break. The nurse didn't know what I was sick with, only that I was definitely sick. She called my mom, and I was taken home for the day. Fortunately, my father worked, so he didn't have to pick me up. That would not have gone down well. My mom was the typical worried-filled, sympathetic parent, doting about my pain and asking what soup I wanted and if she could do anything else for me while I recovered. As it was, my father berated me when he got back that day. What are you sick with? He asked me, point blank. The moment he walked through the door and made his way up to my room. I, I don't know, Dad, I told him. He grunted. Well, you're never sick. You're not trying to skip school, are you? Uh, no way. I was not that kind of student, and he knew it. But he loved accusing me whenever he could. I have a quiz tomorrow, and the nurse said I should stay out until at least Thursday. He cocked his head turned around and then turned back and looked at me with a sudden anger, the kind he reserved for a bad test score or, God forbid, a lunch detention. You better not be messing with me, he said, his voice deadly quiet. 
I'm not, I said. I'm not sure how I kept my voice even. His look might have made a bear piss itself. He paused, considered, nodded, and finally he left me alone. I did not sleep well that night, but it was not because of him. I was uncomfortable again. I don't understand why that incident, uh, the death of Paul Newman, affected me like it did. Uh, random celebrity deaths are only minor discomforts to me now. Uh, mass deaths, like shootings, affect me more. But the symptoms are temporary. My guess is that it was my first experience. Simple as that. No reason other than the disease introducing itself, planting its roots, and shocking my system before I adjusted. I was bedridden with a fever and returned to school the following Tuesday. At that point, I'd missed a quiz and about two dozen homework assignments. I don't like getting behind. Uh, who does? So I was upset, to say the least. My friend, Brady, thought I was still sick. That's how nervous I was. My doctor wasn't sure what was wrong with me. My throat was swollen like I had bronchitis, but that doesn't usually mean fever. He told me it was the flu. It was a reasonable diagnosis, and he never could have known the true cause. That sickness constituted the most time I ever missed in high school. I did have the flu uh, later that year, uh, the real flu, and I only missed two days. I guess you could say I'm resilient. I don't get sick. I don't let exhaustion or stress get in the way of my work. Unless that sickness involves death. What happened to you? Brady asked the day I got back. He gave the kind of grin usually reserved for a little kid. Innocent. Mischievous. You pissed the bed? Something like that. I told him. You are okay, right? Brady's face became stone. He was always like that, even in high school. He could joke around with you one second and then become more serious than a funeral director. Sure, I said. I believed it at the time. There was no real reason to think my flu had been anything but a fluke. No one avoided getting the flu in high school. Not even me. I was okay, in a physical sense. I didn't know what had happened. That revelation would not come until years later. The freedom of adulthood merged with the responsibilities, read none, of childhood, all mashed up into a party-filled drunken stupor, is what some remember as college. I enjoyed it, sure, but I wasn't an English or phys ed major. I wanted to be a chemist. Uh, people who haven't done STEM don't understand just how rigorous it can be. I've taken English classes, and they require work. can even be confusing at times, but you never stare at a book and say, What the hell is this? You never struggle for hours with a single problem, wanting to rip the head off of your professor and chunking it into sulfuric acid. You never find yourself buried in your notes at four in the morning, despite keeping up with your studies. I had fun. I went to a couple parties, but my focus was always on my coursework. Brady had teased me about that in high school. He often told me to get my books out of my rear end, and I suppose he had a point, because he made a good living as an electrician after going through trade school. He didn't struggle, didn't want to bash his head against a wall before a physical chem exam. Maybe that's why it took me so long to understand. I kept my head in the sand went through the motions, made friends, but none that I kept in touch with later. I went to clubs that padded my resume, but were not exactly fun. Throughout all of that, I swallowed death. Celebrity death. I thought something was stuck in my throat. Mass shooting. Sharp pain in my throat the morning after, like I'd screamed until it was raw. Family members. My great-aunt died right before my 19th birthday, and I really did get bronchitis. The doctor tested for it. Not that it was the real cause of my pain. It's so obvious to me now. Back then, I didn't understand. I didn't connect the dots because there were no dots. 
only random points in space, like stars that didn't quite form constellations, far-off masses that to my eyes were no more than specks, not even visible beyond the clouds. I met Caroline that summer. I was doing an intramural soccer program. She did track. We hit it off instantly. I can't exactly say why. Uh, we didn't have much in common. Our majors were different, our hobbies were different. I barely managed intramural sports while she could run a mile in about five minutes. I didn't deserve her from the start. She was beautiful in every sense. The type of person that volunteers at dog shelters, not for her resume, but because she loved animals. I have no idea what she saw in me. I was a gangly 19-year-old college kid. A, a nerd. My personality droll compared to her own. She was the one to ask me out on a date, about a month after we first met. She took me to a little hole-in-the-wall burger place that served fries dripping with grease on scratched plastic plates. We talked about a lot of stuff that I don't remember. Most of it's inconsequential. News, the latest student gossip, crazy stories from our brief time spent on campus. I remember telling her about a guy that pissed on another girl at a party. She told me how she'd pissed herself once, and I found that so hilarious that I was crying from laughter. We didn't only talk about the mundane. After that first date, we delved into politics. Fortunately, there was no friction there. Philosophy, plans after college, and beyond. I, of course, wanted to be a chemist. She planned on becoming a nurse. It would have been the perfect job for her. She was radiant, could bring energy into a room of depressed, sleep-deprived college students. She already volunteered at a hospital. When a friend of mine from high school was paralyzed in a skiing accident, she came with me to visit him six hours away, and I think she talks to him more than I did. She wasn't just on the same wavelength as me. We were linked as if by quantum entanglement, inseparable across infinite distance. Talking to her was easier than talking to my mom. Sex with her was pure ecstasy, like an injection of pure morphine, and it wasn't because she was my first. To this day, I hadn't had an experience like I did with Carolyn. We dated for nine months, up until her death. My parents loved her. My father didn't care. He only paid attention to my grades and my future career. My mom gushed to her friends about the lovely young woman I'd met. Brady said she was a smoke show. I punched him in the gut for that one. When she was killed by a drunk driver, something in me broke. Something that hasn't fully healed since. I hadn't had a girlfriend in high school, unless you count a couple movie dates and prom. I wasn't outgoing, and I hadn't had the guts to even ask Carolyn on a date in the first place. She was killed the day after I finished finals that fall two days before her last exam. I don't remember much, only going home and sulking in my room, alone, browsing YouTube videos about people laughing while I cried, shaking off my mom even as she tried to comfort me and yelled at her for it, hurting her as much as I hurt myself. My father came to visit that weekend, the first one after Carolyn's death and the day before her funeral. He smiled, I gave me a hug and tried his best to show his support. I treated him like an outcast. He wasn't the worst dad in the world, but he never cared about anything except my schoolwork. Had never expressed interest in Carolyn. And since his divorce with my mom the year prior, he had essentially checked out of our lives, just doing the bare minimum by paying for my education. My mom said she stuck with him for my own sake. He made the money and did work around the house and carried the weight that no child support could. He never abused her, and he didn't abuse me either. He just didn't care about me. My mom was the type to save a stray puppy on the road. My father would have kicked it to the curb, wouldn't have even bothered calling animal control. I was indifferent to him, and somehow he understood. I'll give him that much. 
when it was clear that I had no intention to reconnect, certainly not at a time like this, he backed off. He left and didn't come back, except for holidays and family gatherings. He was pleasant enough at those. I just couldn't get past the cold, judgmental man from my childhood. I'm old enough now to know that people change. Back then, I wanted to cut him out of my life forever. The funeral was awful. Carolyn's parents cried on each other. Her family was beside themselves. The minister had trouble making it through the service. At least, that's what I was told. He might have had trouble because of me, but... I doubt it. Carolyn wasn't the kind of person you forget, even if she hadn't been active at her church. The minister couldn't care less about me in comparison. I tuned it out. I tried to block my emotions because I'm not an emotional guy. Word of advice to anyone who loses a loved one. Talk to people. Share your feelings. And definitely don't withdraw from your social circles. The minister had just started talking. That's the last thing I remember. I felt like someone had wrapped an arm around my neck. My vision wavered. And within a minute or so, I had blacked out. The doctors called it shock. My professors told me to take a couple weeks off before the next semester. My mom cared for me like I was her infant son again. Only I knew the truth and I had been introduced to it in the worst possible way. I swallowed death. If it's minor, impersonal, if it's a mere discomfort, if a lot of people die, I have temporary pain. If it's someone close to me, it hits like a truck, and I'm out of it for days, if not weeks. Because of how it occurred, everyone bought into my diagnosis. The grief, of course, was not why I blacked out. It wasn't why I coughed up blood that evening, or why I could have sworn someone took a potato peeler to my throat those next few days. I stopped watching the news after I returned to school. I tried to stay away from death in all forms. If I don't know about it, death doesn't affect me. Otherwise, I would die myself, as millions around the world perish so I withdrew as much as I could. My college friends tried to stay in touch. I pushed away. Brady reached out. He was halfway across the country, finishing up his own schooling, but he was willing to fly over if it would help my mental health. He asked me, like he had asked years before, if I was okay. This time I didn't lie. I gave him a flat no. I'll come out then. He said, You need some support. I don't go back to school for three weeks. I had already planned to tell him no before he asked. You can't do that, I said. The plane ticket's too expensive. To hell with the plane ticket, man. This is your life we're talking about. I told you about my apprenticeship, right? I have money. His parents wouldn't help him out. His mom had overdosed, and his dad could barely pay for his education. So he went on his own. I wasn't going to make him burn what little he'd saved. Don't be stupid, I told him. You can just talk to me over the phone. He agreed in the end. He'd never do something I didn't want. He couldn't have known, of course, that I would only call him once in the next three months and that I'd not kept him away out of kindness. I hadn't wanted to face him, or anyone for that matter. I wanted solitude. It took me a long time to come out of my shell. I did, eventually. Just in time for the final stage of my condition. By the time I graduated, I was back to what could be called normal. As it often does, though, the shadow of loss lingered over me, like the shadows that appear every morning and evening. It took me a long time to come to terms with Carolyn's death, not just because of what I had learned, but because of the event itself, mostly the event. I can't ignore what it unleashed, though. 
I had been made aware of a curse that I had to endure alone. If I told anyone, they would call me insane, or I'd have to go to more therapy like I did after I passed out at the funeral. I didn't want that. I had a change of heart at some points and shifted to education instead of pure science. I became a high school teacher. It doesn't make any sense why I wanted to do that. Deal with people that didn't care about moles or redox reactions, but life is strange. Maybe Carolyn rubbed off on me and I wanted to help people in what little way I could. I enjoyed it. I returned to the dating scene almost five years after Carolyn died. The relationships were rough. I was inexperienced. I wasn't committed. And my past still loomed over me every time I kissed a woman or laid against her breast. None of them ever can be. I should have gone back to therapy. But I was afraid of telling too much and ending up in a psych ward. My mother was proud of my career. Glad that I'd found my calling, and doubly glad that I'd gotten away from the gloom that had enveloped my sophomore and junior years of college. She would have been dismayed to know that I hadn't. That I had just learned to compartmentalize and accept, but that I still cried every few weeks for no reason. She didn't know that my girlfriends meant no more to me than work colleagues, or that I had no friends besides Brady outside of work. It did not help that I continued swallowing death. It got worse, like a physical disease. Each time I inevitably heard about a celebrity death, uh, when my grandparents died, when my aunt succumbed to cancer, and my cousin was killed in Afghanistan, it started wearing on me. I had to take days off of school, both for my physical and mental health. I tried to make it irregular, only staying home two or three times a year, but that became impossible. I went to see my doctor. I went through all sorts of screenings, and nothing came back positive. She knew about my past. She knew how hard I'd been affected by Carolyn's death. Still, that could not explain the almost continual rawness of my throat, or how I'd coughed up a pint of blood after my cousin's death. I was referred to a hospital, where more doctors probed me and more questions remained unanswered. By my fourth year of teaching, I was constantly tired, unable to do much more than go to class and grade tests before I collapsed on my couch. My pathetic dating life fizzled out. There hadn't been much there to begin with. My mom called me constantly wanting to know if the doctors had figured out the source of my fatigue and sore throats and depression. The depression, of course, had an obvious cause, though I couldn't tell anyone about it. Brady, bless his soul, came to visit me despite living in California when I was still stuck in Wisconsin. He didn't bring his wife. Guys' nights, he called them. We pulled out an Xbox and played Halo and the original Call of Duty games and all the others we remembered from our childhoods. We drank beer and watched movies and talked about our lives. I was brutally honest with him. He didn't judge. He listened, uh, nodded, offered his support. It came out unintentionally after I'd had one too many butts. I told him about my condition. My real condition. He didn't doubt me for a second. You believe it? I asked him, my words coming out slippery, like I'd shoved soap in my mouth. He nodded. He wasn't drunk. He's 6'3 and could down a bottle of vodka without losing his balance. Of course I do, he said. But it's crazy. He smiled. Life's crazy, man. I know what happened to you. With... Uh, um... He didn't need to say it. Anyway, I know what you've told me, too. Your fatigue and everything. You believe me? I had to hear it again from him. I couldn't believe it myself, at the time. I've known you for fifteen years, Jack. He leaned forward, his eyes intense. 
his muscles taut. I can tell when you're lying, even when you're drunk. And you're not lying. He's the only person to this day who knows what is wrong with me. I never had the guts to tell him in the first place. The alcohol made me. I couldn't have told my mom, because knowledge of my suffering would have destroyed her. In the end, it didn't much matter. The diagnosis was unexpected, to say the least. She was 61, and never smoked, ate healthy, exercised. Yet, she had lung cancer, and by the time it was detached, it had metastasized. She died a year and a half after that diagnosis. She lasted longer than most, from what I've been told. She was fortunate to have made it for so long. I felt about as fortunate as a political refugee. I felt like my life had been unraveling ever since that first time I swallowed death. Two days after my mom's funeral, I stopped breathing. It wasn't instantaneous. I felt my throat swelling up and managed to call 911 before I passed out. When I woke up, I was intubated and unable to breathe on my own. I was conscious, which surprised the doctors almost more than my condition itself. They didn't know why my throat had ballooned and then deflated, leaching blood like a sponge, or why my lungs had failed when they were right there, fully intact and healthy. Brady rushed over as soon as he heard the news. He understood. He grabbed my hand and told me that I'd make it. I responded with my phone, telling him that was ridiculous. Brady, always the realist, amended his statement and said that I had to enjoy what little life I had left. What is there to enjoy? I wrote. Everyone I love is dead. What more can I get out of life? Life is always worth living, he told me. You never know what might come next, and you have people that care about you. I couldn't laugh, but I smiled. I care about you, Jack, he said. I don't want you to die. Is this really better than death? I asked him, living on a ventilator until someone else dies and pushes me over the edge. You don't know when that'll happen, he said. It could be in one year or ten. Hell, you could live longer than me. People like you have lived perfectly good lives. I knew what he meant. Stephen Hawking, Christopher Reeve, Helen Keller. People make fun of her, but she really was a remarkable woman. They had lived through worse. I can still move and see and write. I just can't talk or leave my hospital bed. Not that it matters. My health insurance covers most of my care, and everyone. Brady, previous co-workers, friends of friends, have chipped in. I won't have a problem with money, unless I do outlive Brady. Brady missed his calling. He should have been a therapist, or maybe a guidance counselor. I'm not sure how much longer I have. I was confined to a hospital bed seven months ago. I'm still doing well, physically at least. The doctors are just as confused as they were before, but thrilled at my overall health. I eat and breathe through tubes, but find that I don't really care about that anymore. I used to be afraid of a moment like this, when my condition would take me to my own death. I find now that I do not fear what will come. I've lived as well as I could, struggling through tragedy and pain of all kinds and managed to make a living despite it all. It seems that people do care about me because the donations and visits haven't stopped. That is what I missed all those years ago, when I withdrew and never quite came out of my shell. We must value life instead of mourn death, celebrate those we have lost and those who still live. You can't forget about the dead, but dwindling on their fates is just as dangerous as the physical condition that I have now. It can destroy you. Maybe what I have isn't a curse. In the past months, 
I have come to appreciate what I have, despite all that has been taken away. I don't think I ever would have come to that conclusion myself. Back in October of last year, I applied for a job as a hotel bellboy, and the interview came with some peculiar rules. I've been laid off in August, like many others, due to the pandemic. This opening came up in passing during a conversation at a bar. I was camping on a college friend's couch at 22, and we decided to meet his girlfriend to get out of the house and have a drink with her old sorority sisters. The term outdoor and 50% capacity has been stretched to its limits in Hoboken. The only real change since the pandemic was that no one could sit at the bar and put less tables on the floor, meaning seating was cramped. That's how I met Catherine. In the commotion, my group had rushed to find seats with some friends we already knew. Catherine had been talking to my friend Jill when everyone scrambled to make room for us, and she hesitated to move during the seating shuffle. When everyone was settled, my roommate had stolen Jill away to another table, and Catherine was trapped with us. Catherine, a pretty blonde girl with big brown eyes, and definitely one of Jill's sorority sisters. While conversation kicked up for our group, Catherine was quiet, obviously feeling kind of awkward and excluded. I guessed she only really knew Jill, so I struck up a conversation with her to be polite. Of course, there's a limited number of topics near strangers are comfortable having with each other at first. Inevitably, I asked her what she did for a living. I work at the Magnum, she said, as if I'd known what that was. To be fair, most of my friends who'd taken up business degrees and gotten jobs as analysts of some kind answered the question that same way. My biology major didn't lend itself to company names. When I asked, she explained it was a luxury hotel in the city. I thought hotels weren't doing so well right now, I said. It's the type of place with clients rich enough to rent out floors for six weeks, Catherine explained. We kind of don't worry about rotating traffic. Pays well, tips are pretty good too. The biggest problem is the short staff, since, uh, you know. The giant unemployment elephant in the room all us young workers refused to acknowledge hovered wordlessly between us. I spent the rest of the night talking to her about hockey, latching onto the fact that she was a devil's fan, at least. I didn't really get desperate enough to consider hotel service until a month later, when my already pathetic savings had dwindled to almost nothing, and none of my other prospects had panned out in my field. I was staring down my last can of tuna, and uh, though Brian hadn't asked, I knew I should be paying rent or moving out by now. I wasn't going to move in with my terrible father, and my mom just sold her house to pay for her own hospital expenses. Money, any money would do. I decided to take a chance and text Catherine hoping she wouldn't be offended that this was the first time I was reaching out to her since we met. I got an automatic message back that I was texting a landline. I half assumed that she gave me a fake number, one off from her cell or something. A part of me found that amusing. I called it, half expecting an automatic machine to tell me it'd connect me to the moon in the rejection system. This would be a funny little anecdote to tell Jill if that was the case, and that may be a little concerning for my social skills. But no. Two rings in, Catherine picked up. Hello? Oh, uh, hi, I said, stilted, shocked she was actually on the other side. Catherine, this is Catherine, right? Right about then, I realized I didn't remember her last name. Uh, from the bar the other night for her Jill Delaney's sorority sister reunion. It's uh, Jessie, by the way. Smooth as sandpaper. Yes, I remember. You all right over there, Jessie? Uh, yeah, I just didn't expect you to answer a landline. Right, she said sheepishly. I forgot that. They don't really let us use cell phones here, so I kind of fell into the habit of giving out people my work phone. Sorry. You can call me Cat, by the way. Cat, okay. 
You're working. I, I can call back, or you can call me back, or... I heard myself making a bigger deal out of a simple question than it should be. I had a question about your job, uh, if you were still hiring. I mean, the Magnum. Like, if it was still, uh, hiring. I was listening to myself nervously rattle off nonsense, wondering why I wasn't dropping dead from mortification yet. Somehow, after that mess, Catherine didn't immediately hang up. She even told me she'd asked the manager about potential openings. I didn't hear back anything for two days, and had almost forgotten about it, when my friend Brian dropped a manila envelope on my lap. It was addressed to me, though I usually had my mail forwarded to my mom's in South Jersey. But there it was, and when I opened it, there was a little introductory letter to me in type and textured paper. Dear Jesse Folks, your interest in joining the Magnum's hospitable team... We have been referred your information and believe that it may fit the goals of our hotel. We would like to extend an invitation to conduct a formal interview and further discuss your skills and qualifications in relation to further opportunities. Please arrive at the following address at no later than 10 a.m. sharp on Saturday, 10-10-2020. Before your interview, please be sure to study the following rules before arriving and to come prepared. 1. If you arrive by car, you may park on the east lot in any blue space. Do not park in the white or reserve spaces. These are for guests. 2. You will enter through the eastern entrance. An eagle in the bronze filigree on the door is the correct entrance should you not notice any signs. 3. If the door is open, walk in and proceed to step 3A. 4. If the door is closed... Walk around to the south side entrance marked with a decorative woman and proceed to step 3B. 5. Please bring a printed copy of your resume. 5A. If you have arrived at the situation described in 2A, hotel staff will be there to greet you. Give the blonde attendant your coats and hats and other personal belongings if you have either, and drop any electronic devices on your person into the bin sitting on the accent table beside the mirror. 5b. If you have arrived through the situation described in 2b, you will be alone. Place your electronic devices, likewise, into a bin on the nearest accent table without a mirror in front of it. Leave your personal belongings, including purses, handbags, backpacks, timekeeping devices, wallets, keys, papers, notebooks, books, pens, pencils, and hats on the chair beside the table. You may proceed with your coat. 6. Proceed to room 002N on the map provided. Please take the time to memorize both routes. You shall not be permitted to speak to staff or guests under any circumstances. 6a. Do not interact with the staff or diverge from the most direct route possible. 7. When arriving, knock twice. Enter when you hear two knocks in return. 8. If you have arrived in situation 2A described above, sit in the chair to the left. If you arrived in situation 2B described above, sit in the chair behind the desk of your interviewer. In the unlikely event that there is only one chair, stand in the left-hand corner. 9. If it is only you and the interviewer, you will introduce yourself first with the following phrase. What a swell day it is to be yonder. Lovely to meet you. I'm... Your full name, hear about the position. If you entered through the situation described in 2B, however, you may introduce yourself as you please. 10. If there is anyone else in the room, you are to wait to be spoken to. If there is a woman in the room wearing green, or a man with a feather in his breast pocket, do not speak to them no matter what they say to you. If there is a man in the room with a hat... Look immediately to the floor, and do not look up at him for the remainder of the time he is in the room. If there is a man wearing red in the room, do not say nor confirm your full name throughout the duration of the interview. When asked to speak in this group, the phrase you will say in turn to your interviewer. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. I am excited for this opportunity to become a part of the Grand's illustrious team. 11. The interview will be conducted at this time. Answer honestly all questions, 
barring the caveats mentioned above. 12. You are not to leave the room until dismissed. 13. Upon leaving, you will wait for any woman in the room to stand and exit first. Do be sure to stay if they rise from their seats, and return to your seat when finished. If the man with a feather in his breast pocket is in the room, you will wait for him to dismiss you before leaving. 14. When exiting, you will leave to the east side entrance. 15. Discuss this list with no one. We are excited to meet you. Call with any questions or clarifications. The Magnum. I looked at the rules and flipped to the other pages in this packet to see a map of the parking and first floor, a contact information, clothing requirements, and an old-fashioned brochure listing benefits, uh, responsibilities, and average salary of a bellboy, all of which were far too good for what I expected to be a minimum wage experience. I think I'm being pranked, I told Brian, letting him read over the rules. Brian laughed and told me to toss it in the garbage or just frame it. It was garbage, yeah, but I knew the only person who would have tailor-made this garbage for me. I was flattered, really. This was pretty elaborate, and I'll admit, very detailed, down to the weathered look of the floor map. I went to text Kat, then remembered I still had to ask for her cell. I called the landline to say thanks for the prank gift. I didn't send you anything, Kat said, sending genuinely surprised. I thought it was funny, Kat. The rules list is kind of uh, just dramatic, don't you think? Rules? Kat sounded confused over the phone and then laughed. Oh, right. I forgot how weird they are when you start this job. W what? I didn't send you anything, Kat said again. All I did was mention you to my manager. I lied a bit and said you had some experience in hospitality. It's not like this job is demanding. He asked for your name and address, and I knew you live with Jill's boyfriend, so uh, easy enough. Your name is Jesse Folks, right? I uh, yeah? He sent you a package, right? Lots of weird rules. If it is only you and the interviewer, you will introduce yourself first with the following phrase. What a swell day it is to be out yonder. I read dramatically. <laughs> yeah, Kat said, laughing a little. You're actually supposed to follow them. Uh, seriously? I'm not going to remember all this trash, I said. Uh, not without a checklist or something. Hold on. Cat hung up, and she didn't call back in a few minutes. Uh, she didn't call back until the next day. Hey, uh, Jesse, Cat said. So, I asked around, and I was right. You don't have to worry. It's always the same. The rules are overcomplicated. If you want, I can go over them with you, but essentially, you're supposed to follow the 2B rule set. Uh, that's it? Yeah. I felt the biggest weight lift off my chest then, thinking of having an income again. If these people wanted me to sing and tap dance, I'd learn the choreography. Fine. At the end of the day, I'd have the job, and it's easier to hire someone than fire them. If this was all just a complicated hazing, fine. I asked Kat exactly what lines I had to know for my play act of an interview. She started listing them off casually, but then sort of petered off. If you don't think you'll have it by Saturday, Kat said, a little hesitantly, I can come over and help you go over it. I grimaced. She was inviting herself over. Cat seemed sweet, and I wanted to think of it as a kind gesture, but this felt a little too above and beyond. I held the phone to my chest, panicking, looking for Brian to hiss my concerns at, but he was off at the gym. Suggest somewhere public, I thought to myself. Uh, how about we talk it over at, uh, like, the park instead? Uh, tomorrow. When do you get off work? I'm off at six tomorrow, actually. It'll be dark by then. Uh, there's a coffee house nearby. Uh, we can meet at the green. She agreed, and I hung up, feeling pretty good about relocating it to somewhere impersonal. Brian laughed at me, and I realized I probably made it sound more like a date. Well, perfect.
The not-date review of the rules was actually not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Kat seemed truly eager to get down to business, reviewing what to do and when. She kept the list in her hand and made me recite each step. We ignored all the caveats and kept to the bare necessities of the path she and the other employees went through. And after, you leave your stuff in the bin. But the jacket I can take, I chimed in. When you get inside the room and sit in the back chair, you'll say, It's a pleasure to meet you as well. I'm excited for this opportunity to become a part of the grand, illustrious, ridiculous team. Catherine smiled wide, observing me with wide brown eyes. You're hired, she teased. I felt pretty all right about Saturday. The attire required was another hurdle, but not as bad as the others. Black pants, black shirts with a collar, black shoes, a red tie. I had some slacks for my graduation and borrowed the shirt from Ryan. Jill and I found a tie for a buck at a thrift store. I took the subway into the city and made it to the Magnum at some time around 9.50. As Kat had promised, the east entrance was closed, which meant I was going around to the south entrance. The building itself looked like any other hotel I'd seen in the city. Tall, stone structures with filigree and crests that added some extra air of importance to the structure's existence. To add to that, it was right across from the park, but only four blocks from a Chipotle. And nothing in the city is above being neighbors with convenient fast food. Before I even got inside, however, everything kind of quickly went sideways. The east side entrance was closed, as it was supposed to be, and I hardly even looked at it before walking over to the south side. But then the south side door was closed. It was the south side door. The filigree was of a woman, and it was the door I was supposed to walk through. But I pulled on the handle, knocked, and waited. No one came, and I rushed immediately back to the east side door, half dreading that it was the open one. If that was the case, I was screwed. I only knew the rules for the B scenarios, but when I tried that door, it was just as locked as the other. The hell? I walked around the street looking for another entrance, but couldn't find one. It was soon 10.05, and I was wondering if something had gone wrong, so I did the only thing I could think of and called Cat. She answered quickly enough. What do you mean the door's closed? Cat snapped. It's Saturday, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You're supposed to be here. I saw it on Robert's schedule. He... Uh, hold on, I'm coming down. Just go to the east side of the building and walk past the door and to the alley. There's an employee entrance there. I can let you in. Just wait there. She hung up on me, and I practically sprinted back around the wide building. The alley she was talking about was the odd backing to an otherwise opulent building. The walls were flat, the dumpsters crowded both sides and half open, reeking with garbage. Even in the middle of the morning, it was dark in that little crack of space. The door Cat mentioned was a bland gray door that looked severe and functional, completely detached from the gaudy facade that decorated the front. I paced up and down the chipped asphalt, dodging the glass chips and piles of crates. Then the white door opened and I turned at attention. But it wasn't Cat at the door. What are you doing back here, kid? You lost? A man asked. He wore a trim red and black uniform and a little name tag that said, Eddie. Instinctively, I would have answered no and babbled about being here for an interview, but I knew I wasn't supposed to be back here. This was off the interview's script, and if this was my only entrance, I couldn't be shooed away from it. Uh, I'm the new guy. Jay, uh, Rob told me to come in this way today, I said, boldly plucking the name I heard Cat use. But I, uh, I, I made an awkward gesture toward the door, trying to convey going through and hoping vague complications seemed like an understandable enough thing for him to understand. Oh, he said, seeming to think my uncertainty was warranted. His thin lips pressed together tight, and he gave me an odd kind of look. He may have wanted to say something, but instead quickly shouldered a large garbage bag that had been laid at his feet before him and held the door open for me. Go on, then, 
He's got an interview or something today, so you can wait for him in the break room. 15E. I took the door from him and held it open in turn so we could take the garbage. Thanks. Eddie nodded. His bag was dripping garbage slime, which is never pleasant, but he didn't seem bothered to have it hauled over his shoulder. When he walked it past me, there wasn't the lingering smell of garbage, but there was something like iron. He walked on, and I walked into the hotel. The door closed behind me. I looked down at the polished floor, and there were stains where the garbage bag had been. They were a little ruddy red-brown, like the kind you'd see on a counter or a cutting board after cutting up a steak. Expired meat, I thought to myself. I realized Eddie wouldn't take long to throw out the trash, and I had to be out of sight by the time he arrived to not get caught. I sprinted down the hall, through a few sets of double doors, heading inwards to the best of my approximation, hoping to hit a lobby or room number to guide my way. Soon enough, the tile floor turned to green carpet, and the ornate facade was back as I walked into the main rooms. I looked at the first door beside me, 025E. It wasn't where I was supposed to be, but it gave me an idea of where to go. Cat showed me a direct route on the map, so I knew I had to walk to the north wing first, which meant following E's numbers until they dwindled to one near the lobby, and then continuing on the way I would have if I entered through the southern entrance. I still had my coats and my phone, but this wasn't unmanageable. I could fake it. First things first, I had to get rid of my stuff. The hall was ornate, decorated with slim wooden tables and delicate golden electric lighting. There were pieces of ivory, jade, and copper art that looked expensive. I quickly removed my coat and my phone by O11E and kind of bundled both up and shoved it in a nice, wide porcelain vase. I wasn't about to lose a stupid interview over a technicality. I continued on, half afraid I was already lost, until I hit the first wall with a copper bust of some 1800s guy. Cat had mentioned it before. It was in the hall directly behind the lobby, and standing directly behind the concierge desk now. All I had to do here is turn left. Or I would have if I was coming from the south side. Now I just had to keep walking and I'd be there. I'd keep going, turning right at the woman's restroom, and then 002N was on the right. As I got to the bust, two chattering women, dressed as staff, rounded the corner and spotted me. When they did, they went dead silent. They didn't slow down, but they stared, jaws falling a little slack at the sight of me. I tried to smile back, but they ducked their heads away and kept walking. One of the girls dropped something. It was heavy enough that they should have been able to hear the dull thud, but they rounded the corner instead of stopping. It was a key. I picked it up, and it was clearly an old-fashioned room key. Not a card for an electronic door, but a heavy brass key with a little tag that said 001. I backtracked a little, trying to catch their attention. They had huddled closer together, walking arm and arm, whispering and giggling to one another. One threw her head back to sneak a glance at the empty hall and looked genuinely surprised to see me. I held the key up, showing her wordlessly what she left. She nodded and tossed her head to the side, as if to say, Get going. But she raised her hand to her lips and turned her back to me, breaking into a run arm in arm with her friend. I turned the key over in my hands. This was the part of the hall I was supposed to walk into. The instructions said I wasn't supposed to talk to staff. Maybe she knew that. And maybe she was one of Kat's friends and was helping me out. Should I have left the key on the ground? Was this a part of this weird uh, hazing? I have debated just leaving it on the floor, but it was in my hand anyway. I'd turn it in to the guy at my interview and tell him what happened. And maybe that was the point of it. Finally, I found room 002N was where Kat said it would be, the second-to-last door in a dead-end hall. The last door, 001, was propped open, slightly ajar. It was open just a crack, but the lights were off, giving me only a glimpse of the carpet. I knocked twice like I was supposed to. 
Come in. I heard from the other side of the door. I remained outside, at ease, knowing what Cat and I had rehearsed. Hey, I said come in. The guy on the other side called a little louder. I shifted a little, debating if I should knock again. No, two knocks. Cat had even wrapped her knuckles against the table when we went over it. I was supposed to wait for two knocks. As I waited, I heard another noise just behind me, from 001. The door squeaked on its hinges. When I turned, it was a little more open, but I still couldn't see much inside from my angle. I could hear something inside, though. Someone was moving around, scratching against the wall just across from me. I heard a voice like an old man's moan weakly. Help, he said, his voice sorrowful and cracked. Somebody, help. I don't know what made me weary. Maybe it was something in the voice. Desperate and gravelly, yes, but a little too clear. Like it knew I was there to hear it. Some instinctive part of me told me to stay put. Then the groaning stopped, and there was a heavy thud, like a fist pounding the wall. I heard the man inside groan and shuffle again, slowly making its way down the length of the room, closer to the door. I knocked again at 002N. Hey, uh, hey, there's someone here! I called, only to be met with no response. The groaning crept closer to the door. Help. Jesse. Help. I rushed to door 001, grabbed the handle, and slammed it shut. I didn't look inside, but I caught a waft of the smell. The pungent stench of a sewer on a rainy day came to mind, like something had died and rotted inside. Then, a hand reached out and grabbed my wrist and tugged. I was thrown back against the opposite side of the hall, and there was Cat, pulling the door closed. Room 001 shook as the thing on the opposite side threw its full weight against the door. Cat turned and looked at me, holding her hand out. The key, she hissed. The key. My hands were shaking as I fished into my pocket for the brass key. I hardly had it out of my pocket when Cat snatched it away and locked the door. Another powerful bang sent her stumbling back to the opposite side of the hall. It was then I heard two calm, controlled knocks behind me. I nearly jumped back to the other side, before suddenly remembering this was 002N, and I was waiting for them. I looked at Cat, who paused, midway through fixing her blouse. Cat pulled me onto my feet and fixed my tie. Don't worry about that, Cat whispered hastily. Tell them you locked the door with no one's help. I wasn't here. Go. I practically threw the door open and sprinted in. Three members of the hotel staff sat inside, all very composed and evidently confused by my heavy breathing and my no doubt priceless expression. What's the matter, love? You look absolutely shaken, the woman behind the desk asked. I... I immediately shut my mouth, taking in exactly who was in the room and where. But they weren't... uh, they were more distracting than I expected. Cat told me to expect there to be a man in a red vest, and I did since I'd stumbled into his chair. What I didn't expect was for him to be badly burned. A nasty pinkish scar ran up his neck, shriveling his chin, his ear, and his nostrils. One eye was permanently shut, and the other was crooked. The other was a woman who stood in the corner. She loomed over the chair next to the man in red, her sunken eyes fixed intensely on me. There's no other word to describe her other than intense. I felt like I was under scrutiny for how I moved and how loud my steps were as I passed her. She was very tall, so tall that she had developed a hunch from years of bending her neck to look down at people. She said nothing to me, but her head turned, tracking me as I went. The last was the woman in green I wasn't supposed to speak to, and she was sharply dressed and quite pretty, but was also the one sitting behind the desk where I'd expected my interviewer to be. I wasn't supposed to speak to her, wasn't I? That was the whole point that Cat had drilled into my head. 
The one I wasn't supposed to worry about was the looming woman who twitched when I took my seat in the chair behind the desk. Could I get you a glass of water, love? The woman in green asked sweetly. You're our ten o'clock, aren't you? Jessie Folks. I wasn't allowed to speak to her, wasn't I? Did that include nodding? He's skinny, the tall one said. Buggy eyes still set on me. Her pale tongue darted out to lick her lips. Sticks. Behave, Lori, the man told the tall woman. Jesse, this is Lori Belliford, honorary front's office manager, he said, nodding to the tall woman. He then gestured to the woman in green. Frederica Saudi, the general manager of this hotel. And I am Robert Strauss, chief concierge and hiring manager. You can tell us a little about yourself. I, 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 it's a p pleasure to meet you as well. I'm excited for this opportunity to become a part of the Grand's, uh, I, I couldn't remember the stupid word used between this part. Illustrious team, Frederica supplied. Close enough, I'd say. The three of them chuckled a little. I looked at Robert. I, I, there's something in room one that... Robert held up a hand. We'll get to that. Uh, okay. Did you have any trouble finding the entrance? Robert asked. No. No? I, I, someone walked out when I walked in. At what entrance? The east one. Why did you lie? I, I, I didn't have any trouble finding the entrance. Do you know what was in the bag? Lori asked, her voice pitched high and eager. What bag? Robert asked, looking confused. The bag Eddie had, Lori said. I shook my head, too terrified by her gaze to really reply to her. Robert arched a brow. You saw Eddie, the janitor. Uh, for a second, I said hesitantly. Robert and Frederica shared a look, but Frederica smiled. It is an east side entrance. Robert cleared his throat and moved on. Then you saw two girls drop a key to room one. Why'd you keep that? I, I, I wasn't going to keep it. I was going to give it to you when I came in, but then... Room one, the woman in green supplied. I almost answered in the affirmative and then stopped myself. She smiled wide, amused to nearly catch me. What did you do? Robert asked. I, I closed the door and locked it. That's it? Yeah. Why didn't you go into the room to see who was calling? He asked. I... I had a bad feeling. And you weren't tempted to look? Walk in, just to see? Robert asked. That was a test, wasn't it? I asked. Are people supposed to look? If they don't want to be here. Lori said, with that wrinkled, over-ear grin. Does she upset you? Frederica asked me suddenly with a wicked grin. As she did, Lori's wrinkled face curled into a frown, and her eyes were still menacing facing me. I wanted to protest, but I'm not supposed to speak to her. And then I started weighing how much I cared about the rules in a place already as twisted as this. She does, doesn't she? Frederica taunted. Hear that, Lori? He thinks you're disgusting. Lori stomped forward and suddenly was looming over me, and I had nowhere to go but the back of my chair as buggy eyes glared further and further down at me. Then Robert cleared his throat. That'll be enough. Thank you. Lori and Frederica stood, and I stood as well, as they both made their exits. I looked to Robert then. What kind of place is this? One that requires discretion, a good sense of memorization and improvisation. I think you'll be a good fit here, Robert said, standing and walking over to the desk. He unlocked a cabinet drawer and pulled out some papers. He then drew a handkerchief and reached up, 
pulling up a piece of the skin at the top of his forehead. I nearly leapt out of my seat as he started peeling the skin back. Holy... Robert kept pulling until half his face was removed, and there was no fleshy muscle beneath, just a regular half of a face. It was makeup, burn makeup. Excuse me a moment, the prosthetic itches, but I'd like to make you an offer to sign on with us. It was all makeup? I snapped. Part of the interview... The bag Eddie carried was meant to be suspicious, and Joe gets a kick out of scaring the new guys in room one. See, like I said, this is a job that's unpredictable, and we look for a certain personality type. We try to learn it as quickly as possible. Robert wiped off the rest of the makeup with his handkerchief, and looked like a normal man in his mid-forties. Most people break with Lori or forget the rules with Freddy. I looked dumbfounded from the door to him. Uh, That's it? That's the interview? Yes. Don't you want to ask me questions? I've learned about everything I need to know from you. The fact that you were able to find us and send a letter of inquiry to us at all is a start. To let me know, you know what kind of place this is. Following the rules and your reaction to our surprises for you tells me everything else I need to know. What kind of place do you work that you need me to know how I'd react to a bloody bag and a guy moaning from another room? Robert straightened and smiled, as if that was a question with the most obvious answer. We're a luxury hotel. Half our job is going about as if it's a business as usual, but it's not. There's a lot of protocol to follow, and it requires you to know what to do in a lot of situations. Did you have anyone help you with the rules? No, I say, as I rehearsed. I wasn't supposed to show them to anyone else. Also an extreme part of this test. Good, Robert said. If you can't memorize and follow these instructions in the time we gave you, then you wouldn't be able to handle this job. But you were a natural but you still have enough independent thoughts that you're not completely lacking in critical thought. You'll do well here. Listen, uh, after all this, I don't even know if I want this job. Robert didn't say anything. Just showed me the starting salary. This was the walk through fire, but I can guarantee if you sign on with us, so long as you stick to the rules, you'll be fine. The first set of rules wasn't so bad. This was all an act, and if this was some weird idea of promoting discretion, that's fine. Joe and Eddie were a setup. I could keep my mouth shut. If they'd let me in and all I had to do was learn a routine, fine. So I took the job. It was better than anything I'd get in a lab. And in that moment, things had gone from terrifying to completely lax. I signed a contract there and went home with a set of rules, a schedule, and a signing bonus. I was giddy all the way home, waving my check in Brian's face. Jill came by later, and I wholeheartedly thanked her, too. Jill, I'm so glad you keep good friends, I said as I tore into the new rules list. What do you mean? Uh, Catherine. Who? Uh, Catherine. I still couldn't remember her last name. Uh, Jill, uh, your sorority sister. You were sitting with her at her reunion before we arrived. Oh. Jill nodded. I turned back to my employee contract and pulled out the new list of rules, flipping to the first page. You mean that blonde girl? Jill asked. I thought she was a friend of yours. Rule one. Never speak to Catherine. Never give her your name. Well, shit. It was supposed to be a nice weekend in the mountains. Just myself and my beloved Josh. We've been together for five years. We've had happy times, but lately he's been so preoccupied by his work as a biologist that we hardly spend any time together. When we did, 
He was often tired and only spoke of his experiments. Uh, the papers he read, papers unfinished, uh, papers in prints, and discoveries made by others that should have been his. We've been growing more and more apart recently. I only wish he'd... Now, uh, let's cut the crap. Our relationship was in ruins. We hardly ever fought, but that was exactly the problem. Josh had become cold and distant. He has never been very emotional, but the way he behaved around me lately made me feel like an object. The only times his eyes lit up was when he was talking about his work. We did have sex, yes, but from his side it seemed more like a habit than pleasure. I tried to bring this up many times, but he pretended he didn't know what I was talking about. It drove me crazy. As naive as it sounds, this weekend was supposed to fix all of that. The car ride was nice. As soon as we left the highway, we were graced with the sight of majestic mountains, forests, and waterfalls. Our way led us up a small dirt road with huge trees on either side. We laughed a lot, talked about the old times, how we met, and so on. It was like a little window into a happy past. I also used to study biology. That's where I met Josh. However, unlike Josh, I dropped out after my second year. I just couldn't go on studying. Right now, I was tending to my little shop of carnivorous plants, my garden, and playing guitar in a punk rock band. Josh respected my decision, of course. However, we still talked a lot about biology. I wanted to support him in his career, if not practically, at least emotionally. Sometimes, however, I tried to change the subject. Sometimes I got bored. Sometimes, maybe, I didn't want to be reminded of what I couldn't finish. In these moments, he tried to encourage me, saying things like, You understand more of these things than some of the professors I work with. I know he means well, but sometimes I hear a little bit of a silent reproach in his tone, as if he was disappointed in me. As I thought of all these things in the car, I became unsure if this weekend was an honest attempt to save our relationship, or if it was actually a desperate measure to mask that we were, in fact, not really together anymore. We arrived at the house. It belonged to Josh's grandpa, who used to be a hunter. It was a cute little cottage in the middle of the woods. A little run down, maybe, but it definitely had its charm. The sight of this little romantic venue made me forget my troubles again. We smiled at each other, kissed, and entered. After we started up the generator, we jumped straight into bed to enjoy some of the best sex we've had in years. At that moment, I thought that my worries had been exaggerated and that everything was going to be okay. The effect a nice holiday and good sex can have on our mood is amazing. The next day, after a healthy breakfast, we went for a hike in the woods. The forest was beautiful, and we had a lot of fun running, joking, and screwing around. At some point, Josh pointed to a small bush, carrying blackberries. Wow, look at this! Awesome! He looked at me in the eyes as if he expected me to say something. Come on, Jenny, you know what this is, he said with a smile. I just smiled back and pointed at the cliff that was visible through the tree line. Let's go up there, I said. Uh, okay, Josh replied, seemingly disappointed. Of course I knew what it was. Atropa belladonna, deadly nightshade. But I wasn't in the mood to earn myself a pat on the head. We walked up the cliff. The view was fantastic. We just stood there for a while, taking in nature's majesty. Then we looked at each other and smiled. It was beautiful. We watched the sun getting lower, and I noticed some distant storm clouds coming our way. Let's go back, I said, knowing there was no other way but down. Okay, Josh replied. As we turned around, he slipped on some rocks, lost his balance, and fell. He rolled down the far side of the cliff, bouncing off rocks through bushes and branches until I couldn't see him anymore. Josh! I yelled. No answer. Josh! Then I heard some painful moaning. Oh, Christ. 
Josh, are you okay? Yeah, I think so. It hurts like hell. Hold on, I I'm coming. I climbed down, crawling over rocks and through bushes. It took me forever to reach flat ground. I found myself standing in a dense undergrowth. Josh, where are you? I'm over here. Come take a look at this. When I found Josh, he was standing in a crooked way, pushing down on his bloody knee with one hand. Little bruises and small wounds covered him. Oh my god, are you okay? What happened to your leg? I just grazed it, I think. Uh, look. He pointed into a hole in the side of a hill that was covered with the thick roots of the dead tree that grew above it. When I fell, I took this bush down with me, roots and all. And this opened. As we stared into it, our eyes adjusted to the dark, and we realized how deep it was. Without a word, Josh crawled inside. So I followed. After crawling through this dark and narrow birth canal, we ended up in a small chamber, just big enough for the both of us. It was cold, and the air smelled funny. The walls consisted of roots and earth, which had a weird gray color. A single, thin ray of light came through somewhere in the ceiling. In the middle of the chamber, there was a thick root sticking out from the ground, its end suspended in the air on eye level. Sitting on the end of this root, illuminated by the ray of light, there was a little yellow mushroom, no bigger than a pin. It was sitting on a small green patch of moss, growing on the end of the root, the only thing of color in this dark, gray chamber. Grains of dust were calmly floating in the light. It looked almost mystical. Wow, Josh whispered. We carefully moved in closer as if you would when trying to get close to a butterfly without scaring it away. With our faces only inches away, we noticed that the tiny mushroom was actually growing out of a dead ant. It looked so frail and old that you'd think it would just vanish into dust if you spoke too loudly. Huh, it must be a cordyceps. You know, the uh, ant zombie fungus, said Josh. Yeah, I'm not sure. Lamella are red. And look at the little dark spots. Josh squinted at me skeptically. He took out a small plastic bag, which he carried in case he found something interesting. Maybe you should leave it. Oh, come on. There's more where this one came from. Josh said as he picked the tiny thing. As we crawled out of the hole, I couldn't hear any birds or insects. The woods were dead silent. On our way back, the sky darkened. We walked faster. Shortly before we entered our cabin, I could feel a few raindrops. About half an hour later, it started pouring down, and roars of thunder echoed throughout the mountains. Well, that's it for our romantic evening by the lake. Josh just sat there, staring at the mushroom. Uh, you want to eat something? I asked. Uh, yeah... Sure, he answered without looking at me. Guess I'll cook then, I thought. Dinner was quiet. Suddenly, Josh's voice pierced the silence. It's a cordyceps. Yeah, maybe, I replied indifferently. Oh, come on, it clearly is. Yeah, why not? I just wanted to have a nice dinner. You drive me crazy. It grew out of an ant's head. Can you please put that thing away, Josh? It's weird to find one up here. I became annoyed and laid down my fork. It's not a cordyceps. Of course it is. Look at the color of the lamella, Josh. Cordyceps aren't red. Sweetheart, you have no idea what you're talking about. I have a PhD in biology, and you... What? I was getting angry. You just don't know what you're talking about, okay? So just shut up. I snapped. Screw you, Josh. I threw my plate across the room. It shattered against the wall behind Josh. I can be impulsive and emotional at times, but this was a lot, even for me. With tears in my eyes, I yelled. I just wanted to have a nice dinner with you. 
I listen to you jabber on and on about your work, to show interest, and all you do is just patronize and belittle me. How about Mr. Brilliant Scientist can show some interest in me for a change? How about you don't make me feel like an idiot and show me that you cared for me once in a while? It's not my fault you quit college, Josh yelled. It's been a while since I've seen him passionate about anything other than his work. You don't love me anymore, do you? I do. Then put that thing away, Josh. Josh's expression became blank, cold even. Suddenly, he put the tiny mushroom in his mouth and ate it. A clap of thunder echoed through the air. Uh, what? Cordyceps aren't poisonous, Josh said stoically. I buried my face in my hands. Oh, Jesus, I said, exhausted. Relax, Josh said. Everything's going to be fine. About half an hour later, Josh started to feel sick. You shouldn't have eaten that thing, I said. The cordyceps are perfectly safe to eat. It must have been your cooking, he said with a smile. In my anger, I had to giggle a little. He tried to tough it out, but suddenly he got up from the couch and sprinted to the bathroom. I found him there with his head in the bowl. Are you okay? In between spurts of vomit, he answered. Never been better. After he ejected dinner and hopefully most of the poison, I brought him to bed. The storm outside grew louder. As he laid there, shivering a little, I stroked his head. I'm sorry for what I said, Josh muttered. It's okay. Me too, I said, not knowing if I meant it or if it was just the pity talking. You focus on getting better, okay? You'll see. You'll feel a lot better soon. But he didn't. Two hours and half a dozen trips to the toilet later, Josh was still lying in bed, shivering and sweating, pale as a sheet, and I was getting worried. You're getting worse, Josh. I'll be alright, I just need to. Suddenly his body shook, and he gagged again, but his stomach was empty. So all he did was cough and gasp for air in the most pitiful of ways. It was painful to even watch. Thunder struck close to the cabin with deafening noise. Josh, listen. You've eaten a poisonous mushroom. We have got to take you to a doctor. This is serious. Look at you. Maybe you're right. Uh, not about the poisonous mushroom, of course. <laughs> he stammered. I took out my phone to call the hospital, just to discover that I had no signal. I went and got Josh's phone. No signal either. Must have been the storm. Josh, listen. I'm driving you to the hospital, so we're gonna have to get you up. I struggled to get him to his feet. He felt so heavy. I was hardly able to support him as we walked to the car. It was pitch black, and the heavy wind relentlessly lashed the rain at us from all sides. As we got closer to the car... I saw that a huge tree had fallen on it. It was completely destroyed. My heart sank. My God, what am I going to do? I carried Josh inside and let him fall on the bed. Then I fell to the floor myself. Okay, listen Josh. I'm going to take care of you, alright? We'll hold out until the morning. Then we'll have a signal for sure, okay? It's okay, honey. I don't feel sick anymore. I placed my hand on his sweaty forehead. It was so warm. He was burning up, and his heart rate was through the roof. Josh, you have a fever. I wet a towel with cold water and brushed it over his head. I had to think. Okay, look, I'm going to start walking. It'll take me about four hours to reach the nearest town. I'll get help there, okay? You wait and try and call the hospital, okay? Don't be silly, Jenny. It's not that bad. Besides, it's storming like crazy. You'll get lost, or worse. I think it's the best option. I'll be alright. Just try and... Suddenly, out of nowhere, Josh started screaming like a madman. It made me jump. Josh, what the hell? My head. It hurts so bad. It's so hot. It feels like I'm burning. Josh. He screamed again 
his entire body tensed up. He tore his shirt right off his body. Josh started shaking. His eyes rolled back, and foam was coming from his mouth. He was having a seizure. I did my best to hold him down and put a book in his mouth so he wouldn't swallow his tongue. It took him over a minute to settle down. When he finally calmed down, I noticed that he had pissed himself. My God, I whispered. Jenny, I'm scared, he stammered. I was scared too, but damn sure I wasn't going to let him know that. It'll be all right, okay? We're going to get you help, and you'll be right as rain. Don't leave me alone, Jenny. Please. I gulped. What was I supposed to do? I just sat there, talking to him, giving him water, wiping the sweat off of him, telling him everything was going to be all right. Then another seizure came, and another. Each time they lasted longer. The last one was so bad that he fell unconscious when it ended. I just sat there for a minute, trying to calm down. That's when I saw the bruises. They were red, blue, greenish, and gray. They didn't look like a result of an external influence, but seemed to be coming from within. Also, I could clearly see the veins under his skin. They were of a dark purple color, quite like you'd expect them to look like on a junkie's forearm, but they were running across his stomach and chest. Josh's breath was shallow, but his heart was beating normally. As he was calm now, I used the time to walk around in and outside of the house to try and catch a signal. No luck. In the kitchen, I fell to my knees and started to cry. What was happening to him? I just needed a second to cry and to despair. Only for a second. Then I heard him scream again. As I entered the room, I noticed the strange smell. Maybe it was there all the time, but I only noticed it now. It smelled funny, kind of synthetic, like if you would combine melted plastic with rotting meats and cellar odors. I knew that smell from somewhere. I... I had a nightmare, Josh said, with a weak, shaky voice. He continued, I dreamt that... I walked around the house. Everything was dark and quiet, and I felt kind of weightless. Then I saw you sleeping on the couch in the living room. I wanted to wake you up, but then I went into the bathroom to look at myself in the mirror. That there in the mirror wasn't me. It was a dark figure. His movements didn't match up with mine. I started to get really scared. I tried to turn away, but... I couldn't. Suddenly, he asked, Who are you? And I started to scream. I've never been so scared in my life. I didn't know what to say. I just stroked his face and tried to calm him down. A minute of silence passed. Then Josh's body started tensing up again. I threw myself on top of him to hold him down when the spasm started. But this time it was worse. I couldn't keep him down. His twitching and shaking was so violent it threw me off and onto the floor. Suddenly, a gush of blood spurted out of his nose and onto me. I screamed. Josh tensed up really badly, his body contorted in the most unnatural of ways. Suddenly, I heard the sound of snapping bones. His fingers broke under the intense pressure of his tightened muscles. Then I heard it coming from his elbow, then his leg. Josh screamed with every bone breaking, and so did I. I felt so hopeless. I just had to watch how his body broke, how he suffered and screamed. Blood was guzzling from his mouth and nose. The strange bruises multiplied within seconds. I just held him, telling him we will be all right, and prayed silently. All of a sudden, he slapped me so hard I got knocked across the room and almost passed out. He screamed as his right arm flung wildly in the air. I just sat there on the floor, trying to get back to my senses. Then Josh sat up. For a second, 
he looked at me with a blank expression. A flash from outside lit up the room and his face. It didn't look like Josh anymore. He jumped out of the bed and started running, crawling around the room in an inhuman frenzy. He flipped over the nightstand. He tore open the cushions and the mattress. He punched the window and broke it. He screamed like a rabid animal. With his left hand, he choked himself, and with his right hand, he tried to tear away his left from his throat. Then he went back to thrashing the room. He hit the lamp, and it got pitch black. I could only hear him, rampaging and screaming, the noise getting closer to me. Flashes of thunder lit up the room. I could see him getting closer. His eyes were... I felt something hit my body hard, then my head. His hands tore at me. Without thinking, I grabbed something solid, maybe a piece of wood, and swung it in his general direction. I hit him again and again, until his screams became muffled and turned into gargling and moaning. On all fours, I crawled out of the room. I grabbed a flashlight and quietly sneaked back in. It was a total mess of broken furniture, torn up books, feathers from the bed, and shards of glass. Then... I saw him. He sat on the floor, leaning against the wall. His face was covered in blood, and he was barely breathing. Tears started swelling in my eyes. I lit some candles, hoisted him on the bed, and laid him down. So, I'm so. He had a hard time speaking. I tried my best to get a grip of myself. It's okay, Josh. It's okay, but I'm gonna have to tie you down. I got my and Josh's belt to tie his hands to the bedpost, and I used a sheet to tie down his legs. As he laid there, I tried to take care of the wounds I had given him. I think I broke his skull. It was strange. There wasn't just blood, but thick black and yellow liquid oozing from his head as well. It looked like pus. I tried wiping it off, but it wouldn't stop. It looked so terrible. What the hell was happening to him? Jenny, I'm so scared. Hang in there, Josh. I... It's weird. I have strange thoughts. Like they're not mine. Like I'm being pushed out of my mind. I didn't know what to make of it at the time. As I managed to wipe his wound more or less dry, I discovered that his skull was indeed split open. I had to bind it, but there was something. The candlelight made it hard to see. His tissue was permeated by little orange, yellow, and blue vein-like threads. They looked like little roots of some kind curling, spreading through his flesh. They continued under his skin, down his neck, and farther down. They almost looked like... like rhizoids. I started patching up his head. Jenny, stop. Josh, just stop, Jenny. I ignored him and continued. Jenny, he moaned. Hold still, Josh. Jenny, I... His body started shaking again. He was screaming and gargling. I tried to hold him down, but he wouldn't stop. Blood started flowing from his nose, his mouth, his ears, and even his eyes. His screams got so loud, I couldn't bear it. I tried my best, but I realized that no matter what I did, this was happening. I let go of him. His body was ravaged by spasms so violent it looked like he was possessed. His head looked like it was going to explode. The veins all over his body ruptured, drenching the sheets and me in his blood. I screamed. The little vein-like roots grew through his skin. They came out from under his eyelids and covered his eyeballs, putting more and more pressure on them. His screams became unnaturally deep. All of a sudden, his left eyeball burst, then his right, sending thick red liquid spurting across the room. 
I couldn't look anymore, but I couldn't turn away either. I couldn't do anything except for watch my beloved Josh go through unspeakable agony. His gargling became less vocal. It was muffled by the black pus coming from his mouth. His body let loose, and he sank back into the sheets. Some spasms here and there. And soon, he just laid there in his own juices. A bloody, broken mess. Motionless. Silence, and without breathing. I sank down onto my knees. Everything was so weird. So unreal. I couldn't feel anything anymore. Without thinking, I got up and walked over to Josh and untied him. Then I took the white cloth that was draped over the nightstand and put it over the bloody, pulpy mess that was once Josh's face. I covered him as I tucked him in. Then I left the room. I went over to the sofa in the living room and just collapsed. Everything went dark. After what seemed like an eternity, I slowly opened my eyes again. As I regained consciousness, I remembered some horrible, uh, horrible things. No, it couldn't be. I'm sure that was a nightmare. It's just not possible. I'm sure Josh is... My eyes fell upon the dark figure sitting in the chair in front of me. With a loud scream, I sat up. Suddenly, I was wide awake. That man, or thing, his body slimy and dark, a blood and pus stained white cloth covering his face, just sat there without moving. I remember, he said in an unnaturally deep voice. Speaking slowly, I remember Mom making cookies. I remember playing with my dog. How my dad died, holding your hand, and I remember being Josh. But I'm not Josh. What am I? I closed my eyes, took a deep breath, and opened them again. You're a fungus. I couldn't believe what I was saying myself, but it just came out of me. You took over Josh's body, attached yourself to his nervous system. You infected his brain. That's why you can access his memories, why you can talk. That's why you know what he knows. Such an organism is unheard of. How is this possible? I'm not sure. You might be a punctual mutation of the ant zombie fungus. Possible, but unlikely. They repeated. Yeah, there's another option. My guess is that you've been around for quite a while. You've attached yourself to large insects and such. But most of you went extinct. For some reason, you, you alone, survived in this cave. How? I don't know. I almost completely destroyed his body. I was able to walk over here, but now I can't move anymore. I'm paralyzed. Yeah. Yes. I guess it's the first time you tried taking over a higher mammal. You were even able to reach consciousness. But Josh tried to fight you, and too much got damaged. So, I failed. Yes. Fascinating. Yes, it is. I started to cry silently. The horror of what was sitting in front of me was just unbearable. But all I could think of was Josh. He did love you, though. I looked up at him. What did you say? He loved you very much. He was just afraid of the commitment. 
But he really wanted to be with you. He was actually planning on asking you to marry him on this trip. What? Have a look in his backpack. There, at the bottom, you will find something for you. I did as the fungus told me. There, at the bottom of Josh's backpack, I found a little black box, and in it was an engagement ring. As I saw it, I started to cry. Thank you, I said to the fungus. I put the ring on my finger, and for a brief moment, I imagined myself living with Josh happily ever after. Then I took a deep breath and got up. I took the shotgun from the wall and a box of shells out of the cupboard. As I loaded the gun, it asked, What are you doing? With tears still flowing from my eyes, I said, I can't let you live. No, please. I promise I won't hurt anyone. Look what you did to Josh. I screamed. That was not my intention. It's just my nature. Exactly. Please, just, there must be some other way. There isn't. You will spread. You will take more lives. You will either wipe us out, or they will discover you and try to weaponize you. And then you will wipe us out. Please, it's not my fault. I'm just following my instincts. Me too. I cocked the gun and aimed for his head. I don't want to die. Please. He begged. I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I said. With that, I pulled the trigger. I blew his head straight off. The room was dripping with pieces of skull, blood, and slime. Then I went into the shed to get a huge can of gasoline. I poured half of it over Josh's mutated body. The rest I poured out around the house. I lit a match and flicked it on Josh's corpse. The fire took a hold of it in a matter of seconds, and then it spread through the living room. I watched the flames grow taller and taller. I heard the wood creaking and breaking. I just stood there, watching my Josh burn away. The smoke made it hard to breathe, and it was getting quite warm. I was waiting for something to make me leave. Suddenly, there it was. My instincts kicked in, and I left the house. The little cabin was completely ablaze. I watched it for a while. Then I started walking down the road, praying that this specimen was the last of its kind. Somebody had to make sure this wouldn't happen again. I knew they were not going to believe me, but I had to find out where this thing came from, how it works, and how to kill it. The orange glow of the fire lit my way for quite a while. Then the stars became visible. It was so peaceful. I followed the road for a couple of hours, as I weirdly thought of going back to college after witnessing the most horrible thing ever. I could already see the small city lights flickering on the horizon. We'd all known Dennis had less than a week, and we'd all braced ourselves for all the good that would do. This was going to tear us apart and leave a ragged, gaping hole in all of our lives. But that would be it. It would fit within our understanding of things, and we could all assume he went wherever we thought people go. That would have been so much easier, so much less troubling than what actually happened. Dennis had been diagnosed with cancer a couple of days after his tenth birthday, and it was all downhill from there. There was never an upswing, never an opportunity for surgery. All the scans showed the same thing. The oily black webs have grown larger and denser. 
the fact that we were twins and had looked identical right up to when he started chemo just made it worse. There I was, right beside him, a perfect image of what he used to be before his hair fell out and his color drained and his cheeks sunk down into his skull. An emaciated ghost constantly contrasted with what he should be. And then, finally, the doctor shut the case, snuffed out the last wisps of hope. Dennis will most likely not last more than four days, a week at most. So we'd all set up camp in his musty room at the hospital. The walls were freckled in pea green. The only light slanted in from between the shutters, glaring bars stretching out across the floor to end just short of Dennis's bed. The staff managed to bring in another, simpler bed for me, and my parents slept in old wicker chairs. Dennis looked really bad at this stage. You could just well see his skull. We all wanted to talk to him, to make the most of whatever time was left, but he slept for most of the day, and when he woke up, there'd just be silence. Nobody knew what to say. There were no right words, and there was this underlying fear that the moment anybody interacted with the situation, they'd somehow make it real, and it would hit everyone. The first sound would knock us all off the tightrope, and we'd fall into tears and chaos, and we wouldn't be able to pick ourselves back up. So there was silence. My parents occasionally forced smiles that never made it to their eyes. The third day was when it finally happened, when the steady beeping of the heart monitor started to break down into frantic electronic wails, and Dennis began to shake feebly as a dry, cracking sound rose up from his mouth. My parents exploded out of their chairs, my mother heading straight to Dennis, grabbing his shoulders and pleading at him to stop it and be all right. My father was at the room door, screaming down the hallways for help. The doctors and nurses at the hospital had changed lately. They'd started treating Dennis differently. Before, the resuscitations were always these frantic, desperate efforts, like hundred-meter sprints. There was a desperate desire to succeed in every single moment. Now it was different, more like a steady jog. These were people who were going through the motions, ticking off things they were meant to try from little checklists in their minds. I don't think it would have made a difference either way. The cancer had finally tipped over, and his system just couldn't shoulder it anymore. They called it and left offering their condolences and saying they'd take away the body when we were ready. The door clicked shut behind us. Me, Mom, Dad, and Dennis's corpse. We all inched closer, up to the side of his bed, and just looked. My mother cracked, breaking into great howling tears. My father pulled her close, trying to keep it together, but losing it in his own way. No sobs from him just the occasional tear running down his face and sharp breaths bursting through his clenched teeth. I was just quietly staring at Dennis's face. We all stood there for a long time. I finally realized that this wasn't just one thing. This wasn't just a single event. For the first time, my mind started running away with itself and unfolding all the endless implications of this every one of them causing my gut to sink and for me to miss him so much, even though he'd just been here. I was never going to talk to him again. He was never going to laugh at me again. We were never eating dinner again. We were never going to school together again. We were never going to be in the same class in the school again or talk during classes at school again. It just kept going and going as I realized that this wasn't just one person I'd lost. I'd lost a million things. Something that was meant to be this constant presence was gone, and nothing would ever be as good as it should be again. Everything I was going to do would be soured by the certainty that I wouldn't be doing it with him, or that I wouldn't be able to tell him about it later. It had only ever been a childish assumption that any of that would happen. 
I was the first to see his lips quiver. Mom, Dad, his lips are moving. My parents froze, still clasping against each other. My mother curled over and supported by my father. We looked down as his lips continued to quiver. My parents went quiet again. They must have been trying to hold back hope, assuming it was some kind of nervous tick. But it kept going. And finally, in a dusty, hoarse voice, so faint it was like you were hearing it in the wind, he said my name. Harry. My father sprinted across the room, yelling for the nurses to come back. My mother was clutching her mouth and stumbling back from the bed. The workers tumbled back in and went through the checklist and shocked him with the defibrillators a few times and reached their verdict. We're sorry. He's still dead. But, but I heard him talk, said my father in a small, pleading voice. Look, it could have been gas escaping. But, said my father, before a tiny, scraping sound cut through the room, everyone turned towards its source. It was coming from Dennis, halfway between a sigh and a croak. Harry, it's all so dark, so cold, so dark. And it's pulling me down, pulling at my insides, and taking me down. A moment later, nurses started on their rounds again. But this wasn't some perfunctory run through the checklist. You could see it in their faces, and how hurried their movements were. They didn't know what was happening. They weren't even sure they were doing the right thing. They moved on to the defibrillator again, sending crashing waves of power down through Dennis's chest before listening with a stethoscope. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. One was mumbling. After ten minutes, they all just stepped back. They'd run the checklists out. Nothing had happened. What's happening? My mother screamed. One of the men, a doctor, I think, answered. Nothing is happening. We tried and pumped in oxygen, and it does nothing. There's no pulse and we can't induce one for more than a second or two. The body temperature's down three degrees. He's deceased. But we heard him, I said. I know, but he's dead. The dry grating came again, and everyone shut up. Please, Harry, where are you? I walked over to his side. I wasn't relieved he was talking. I... I was only afraid. This was wrong. I wanted to run. I wanted him to just be gone so I could cry with my parents and be done with it. But I kept walking and put my hand on his, his bony, cold, and clearly dead hand. I'm here, I said. I can see gray. A little bit of gray, but it's so far away. I don't just see it. I feel it. And I never knew something could be so far away. I'm already so far down, but I need to go so much farther to get to the gray. I didn't know how to respond, so I just stood there. I stood there and listened to him talk about the darkness and about the distant gray smudge. Sometimes he'd answer me. Sometimes he wouldn't. A lot of stuff happened around me in the next few hours. Everyone who worked at the hospital must have been in and out. Even my parents started to leave sometimes when they accepted I was the only one Dennis seemed to be aware of. Dennis was looked at by every type of doctor they had in there, and nobody understood. They started moving him around on a stretcher, taking him to the equipments they couldn't just bring to him. I had to come along. I was the only one who could keep him talking. It was a long time before anything was turned up. They'd gotten desperate and had put Dennis in an fMRI machine. They'd fully prepped a corpse and put it in a machine for the living. My entire family was in the room. A cold, confused fear had settled in my gut, making me feel a little bit like throwing up. I, I think we got something, said the technician who was looking at the monitors. Please, just tell me what's happening, said my mother. She moved past terror and hope, 
and was now above all else exhausted, her red face slack and empty. Look here. This scan looks for where the blood is in the brain. Well, the thing is that none of the blood in the brain is moving. We know that from his pulse, but something is happening in there. Something the machine can only pick up a little, but there's some kind of activity. Now, I can't be sure, but I think the activity is clustered around some of the parts that control movement. Everything else is totally dead. He's obviously conscious. He's using complete sentences, but... But what? said my father. But it's like whatever is doing the thinking is somewhere else, still interacting with the stuff that does the talking. That's exactly right, came a voice behind us. I looked over my shoulder and saw an old man in a grey business suit. He had a well-trimmed silver beard and was all around a strange contrast to the clumsy chaos that had engulfed the hospital. Who are you? said the technician. I'm Daniel Cohen's, he said, handing the technician a crisp business card. I'm with the Orpheus Institute. We're a semi-private medical research body, and we've dealt with a few cases similar to this one. The hospital president has already agreed to let us look into this. Almost invisibly, a number of men had moved in behind Cohen and were now making their way over to the technician. These men will help explain the confidentiality situation surrounding issues like this. We'll handle the boy from here. More men. These ones in pure white scrubs that had a strange logo on the left breast got Daniel back on the stretcher and led us all into the hallway. We followed wordlessly, never thinking to say anything because at least these new people represented new possibilities, a completely new road that might lead to an explanation. They rolled Dennis into an operating theater, and my mother gasped. Look, just what are you doing? said my father in a husky voice that made it obvious he was still holding in tears. Cohen's, who had been striding ahead of the stretcher, with a speed that belied his age, had stopped once we got to the theater, and was now taking deliberate care to look all three of us in the eyes. We were still in the hallway, the operating theater door shut beside us. He answered in a low, comfortable tone. We're not performing surgery. It's just the quietest part of the hospital, and there are no distractions in there. We want nothing more than to understand what has happened to your son. This sort of thing has happened before. Your son is conscious, and, as we understand, he will only talk to his brother here. We want to use Harry to ask Dennis our questions. We believe this would work best if he and Harry were alone. We've got the theater wired so that we can hear the answers. My parents didn't say anything for a while. My father broke the silence with weak, staggered words. Do you think he might come back? I know that even if he does, it wouldn't be for long, but I'd really like him back for however long. I didn't say enough. I wasn't big enough to say the things we had to say to each other. If such a thing is possible, I swear we will do everything in our power to make it happen. We've prepared a private waiting room for you too. Cohen's gestured down to the turn in the hallway. There were two people in the white scrubs standing there. Pete and Shirley will lead you two there, if you would please go with them. My parents began to shuffle down the corridor. My mother still buried in my father's side. My father kept throwing looks back over his shoulder at me, like he was afraid I'd vanish. Soon, they were gone, and I felt Cohen's hand come down on my shoulder. I turned around to him, and he knelt down so we were closer to being level. I know this must be the worst day of your life, but do you think that you're up to a quick history lesson? I couldn't bring myself to answer properly but some curiosity managed to rise through the delirium and shock, and I nodded. Cohen's smiled. One of the most significant moments of human history was the moon landing, and it's not even the fact itself that makes it so important. It's that we had contact with them the whole time they were up there. They were sending radio signals back to Earth, and could be talked to. Do you think the moon landing would be what it was if we didn't have that kind of connection to our men 
as they strode the unsettling and inhospitable surface of a planet we were never meant to have knowledge of. What if they'd just gone up and never came back? What if we knew for sure that they got there, but had no signals for them? I was still quite out of it, so I couldn't say I was properly digesting all of this. I slurred out. I, I don't know. They didn't know if they could get the astronauts back. It was a very real possibility that they'd be left to die up there, stranded. Yet, they still did it. It didn't matter if there was no triumphant return. Do you know what mattered? What mattered more than anything was speaking to them while they were up there. To have that connection to three brave men in the void, describing man's first steps into the unknown. If they'd never come back, it wouldn't have changed anything. As long as we, down here, for however long, had men up there. Men to describe the soil. Men to explain the feeling of being so light. Men to tell us what the earth looked like, cut in half by the lunar horizon. Men to teach us about a new world. His hand tightened on my shoulder. None of it would have been possible without the people in Houston. Without the men who talked to the astronauts, kept them focused made sure we got the information we needed. Harry, we believe Dennis is in a very strange place that humanity would do well to learn about. You are Houston. Your brother is an astronaut. He pulled a laminate sheet out from under his lapel. Here's a sheet with some topics you should focus on and questions you should ask. This should help you get the most useful and needed information but the most important thing is to keep him talking. Stop talking for five seconds, and you could lose him. I accepted the card, having given up on reaching a decent understanding of the situation. He ushered me into the operating theater and shut the door behind me. I was alone. The only sound and almost inaudible ringing that emanated from the mass of stainless steel racks and implements and the cold, sturdy operating table Dennis was lying on. I approached the table, and, in need of any source of guidance, I looked at the laminated sheet. General principles. Try to keep your loved ones slash the subjects unaware of their deceased state. Past experience suggests that the shock may cause disconnection. Maintain constant conversation as this has been shown to help maintain the connection. Do not ask leading questions, such as whether your loved one slash the subject is having experiences in line with your own religious beliefs. First step, ask your loved one slash the subject to describe their experiences and or surroundings. Encourage them to be as... A gasp pulled my attention away from the sheet. Harry, Dennis said. Yes, it's me, I answered, grabbing his hand. There was now no doubt that he really was dead. The hand was ice cold, and the fingers had locked in place at odd angles with rigor mortis. His entire body had gone from the sickly white of the dying to the rain cloud shade of the dead. I got to the gray, to the ground. I came down easy, like a leaf. Cold. I'm standing there now. Uh, Dennis... Can you describe where you are? It's still gray, but it's more real now. Solid. Gray sand underneath. Gray ocean beyond me. Gray clouds above. I don't remember. Don't remember going through the clouds, but they're there now. The clouds. They're screaming. Uh, an ocean, I said. Can you see anything in the ocean? Dennis took in a phlegmy, pointless breath. Far away, the horizon. It gets darker. Dark, hungry line where even clouds stop. Where everything stops. Darkness is clawing, moving like it's alive. Miles and miles of angry, hungry dark. Can't go there can't go that way. At this point, 
I lost the thread of the exchange as perspective suddenly hit. All the things I didn't understand and the fact that whatever Dennis was, he wasn't alive. I broke, crying and wailing and digging my face into his bare, emaciated ribs, cold like meat straight out of the fridge. I kept squeezing his hands, harder and harder, pushing the stiff fingers closer together. Dennis, please come back. Please, wherever you are, just get back here. Harry, Harry, are you crying? It's hard to tell. So much here already sounds like crying. His words struck me deep enough to make my sobs catch in my throat, and I just started looking at him again, settling back to my previous catatonic distance from whatever was happening. I can't come back. No getting back. Like spilling something on the ground. No getting it all back inside and right again. It took a few seconds to force myself to accept this, but I carried on, hoping that maybe I could steer him towards some sign that he was wrong. What's in the other direction, away from the ocean? That's the way I have to go. If I try and swim, the darkness will tear me up, shred away everything until only my pain is left, and it'll toss that into the clouds. Into the clouds, and I'll scream. Dennis, tell me what's in the other direction. Just sand. Just the sand. The gray sand. On and on. Not many bad things to see yet. There'll be more when I get where I'm going. I'm going to start walking now, Harry. Where are you meant to be going? I said. I started digging my nails anxiously into my forearm. There was something nauseating, dreadfully true about everything he was saying. It was like the first time he learned the world is round. It was like the first time you learn the world is round, and it feels weird for a second. But soon you get used to the idea, and you see it's the truth. That's the big secrets, and it doesn't matter how flat the ground feels. It doesn't matter how little sense it makes. It's true. And he just kept talking. I can see another person. Uh, can you talk to them? I said, trying to keep my voice steady, feeling like I shouldn't be the one who couldn't keep it together. I suppose I could, but I can't. What do you mean? It's just not a talking kind of place. We're supposed to have done all our talking before we came here. Now we should just keep quiet. But you're talking to me, Dennis. But my voice isn't here. My voice is all the way up there, with you. Dennis, I said, now squeezing my eyes to force the tears back in. Dennis, please tell me what's happening. I think I'm finally dead. And what's happening now is what happens next. The thing that was always going to be happening next. It feels right, in a scary way. It's been expecting me for so long. Since before I was even a fuzzy little thing that might happen. Since before our parents and their parents and so far back it's been expecting me. Please stop talking like that. You don't talk like that. You never have. Sorry. You just sort of see things different here. Some things you know without ever being told. Some things you forget. I couldn't think of anything to say and started to worry, remembering that if I left the pauses too long, he could stop answering. Hey, said Dennis, and the edges of his mouth strained out awkwardly imitating a smile. I see a few more, more people, and they're all naked, but really naked. Their clothes are off, and they're all gray and wrinkly, but that's not it. You can kind of see inside them, like all the walls have fallen down, 
and you can see who they are, all their thoughts and feelings just kind of hanging around them like ghosts. It's like someone's pulling the clothes off their whole past. They're so naked, hairy. He made a light, coughing sound that was meant to be a laugh. That's really scary. Oh, I thought you might have thought it was funny. I don't think we're going to laugh at the same stuff anymore. I, I think you're different now. I guess that makes sense. So, what are all the people doing? Most of them are moving. Same direction as me. Towards the center. The center of what? It's just called the center. The center of this place. It may be the center of everything. But why? I said, starting to lose control. Why do you have to go? I don't have to. Nobody has to. Just like you don't have to shake someone's hand when they put it out. Or answer them when they talk to you. But it feels wrong not to. It's what you're meant to do. And there's not any other good options. You don't want to stand still. What happens when you stand still? Depends. A few days ago, I passed this woman. A few days? I said, gripping the cold steel of the operating table as I was filled with an eerie sense of vertigo. You haven't been dead for even a day? I passed here a few days ago, he said, carrying on like he hadn't heard me. She didn't reach the center. She just sat down started going her own way. She's pulled one side of her ribcage out, and it's all stretched, spreading up to her left so high, stretching out the arm, grabbing its corner. Most of her skin started to get hard and flaky, like old wood or crumbling stone. I can see herself, a musician, uh, liked music, kind of thought of her life like a song, Sometimes, it repeated itself, some bad notes here and there, but it was pulling itself together. She was reaching the chorus, and it ended, and it was over so fast, and she can't accept it. She's picked this sharp rock off the ground, and she's scraping it past her ribs, like a huge harp or something angry, trying to make music. To keep the song going, but it's an awful sound, sawing bone, and it's never going to replace what should have come next. She's already grown into the ground. She's going to be here forever, trying to make music, trying to make music she missed out on. There was nothing to say to that, so I just went quiet for a while, assuming he'd keep talking. He didn't. Dennis. Dennis. No answer. A terrified jolt ran through me, and I started slamming my fist on his chest. Dennis, come back. Dennis. A growl tore out of his mouth, and his frame thrashed upwards, causing me to jump back and tumble down onto the floor, smashing into surgical shelves and causing gleaming surgical instruments to rain down around me. I didn't have time to think before I'd forced myself up again and bent over the operating table to stare desperately into my brother's eyes. I took his hand again, squeezing it as hard as I could. Harry, he said, and relief flooded through me. It's been so long, so long. It's been years. What? I've been walking for years. Years and years, and it keeps getting worse. It hasn't been a day. It's been so many years, and everything keeps getting worse. What? What's worse? It gets worse closer to the center. There's so many people now. Thousands. Tens of thousands. And they're all walking to the center. But, but what's so terrible... 
There's more. So many more, like the girl with the harp I told you about. Stuck in place. Trying to fix what happened. Angry about what happened. Rooted to the ground. Moaning. Calling out names of the people they think did this to them. Sometimes, a few join up. And when they get all hard and crackly like old statues, they start to grow together. Start to feel each other's pain. Sometimes there's mountains of them, entire landscapes of people crying about how unfair it all is. I'm still walking. But where are you going? I told you, the center. I'm getting close now. All the clouds with their screaming faces are curving. All curving and being pulled in the same direction, twisting their way into the center. Please, just stop walking and come back. Can't. No coming back. Besides, I have to keep moving like everyone else. Doing something weird. It's the quickest way for the walkers to notice you. Oh God, what are the walkers? Started seeing them more as I got towards the center. They're all over the place now. They're these things... Walk around on three legs like stilts, covered in sharp, black shells like thorns. Remember the aquarium? They're kind of like those urchins we saw at the aquarium. But the top part, the main part, it's more exact, kind of arty, like a sculptor designed the shape. Reminds me of some kind of chess piece. When they notice you, they come over you, toppling towards you, but never falling over on those long legs. Spindly. It, yeah, is that what you said? They're spindly legs. And they stop right over you. You're just between their legs, and you see the holes underneath their main bits. And the tendrils come out. Red, windy tendrils with these itchy hairs come down, and they start curling and swinging all around you. You almost don't mind at first because they're red. You've been seeing nothing but gray and black for years, and the tendrils are red, and it's beautiful. But then they touch you. They touch, and it's awful. Every bad thing you've ever felt, every bad thing that ever happens to you, starts bubbling up to the surface, drowning you. All the pain that ever went into you rises up and out, and the walkers feed on it. They lick it with their tendrils. They love the taste, the taste of all the things that shouldn't have happened. They love to taste the misery. Even they get full and move on, and you, you get up and keep walking. Jesus, Dennis. It's fine. They're bad, but you get a sense of perspective here. Sure, they're scary for you, but they're nothing next to the center. They're bottom feeders, moss that grew on the outskirts. If they're really like sea urchins, then the center must be like a shark, or a whale, or some huge thing right at the bottom of the sea that's too big to come up near the surface. You've never said things like that before. I don't know how to describe it. When you're here, stuff just breaks down a little, and you don't always need to have learned a word to know it. This place is less obsessed with causes, and two plus two equals four. Its job isn't to make sense. But what is its job? I don't know. Maybe I'll find out at the center. He went quiet again, and this time I wasn't sure I wanted to stop him drifting off. I wasn't sure I wanted to hear any more of this, but regardless of what I wanted, another groaning sound creeped out of his mouth, and he was back. Shit, I see it now. I see the center. His hand began to close, slowly but inevitably around mine, overcoming the rigor mortis to press in on my fingers like an iron vice. I kept trying to get out, 
almost yanking off the table, but I couldn't even budge inside the agonizing grip. It's inside. Inside this huge thing, like a beehive, floating above the ground. It's gray, too gray, and covered with streaks and ridges, like it used to be liquid and hardened, or like made of webs or something. So big, hairy. I've never seen anything like it. All the clouds are swirling down into the hole at the top of it, still screaming. Hundreds of holes, messy, ragged holes, pitch black on the inside. It's bigger than cities, Harry, and everyone's heading towards it. Thousands and thousands swarming under it, pushing against each other to climb the bridges, messy bridges from the ground right up to the holes, right into the pitch black. The center's in there. Harry, I'm here. Please, I said, whimpering with the pain in my hand. You can't go in. There's nothing good in that place. I knew this as a fact, not just because of the description, but as a gut feeling. I knew that what he was talking about was real and fundamental and important. As important a part of our existence as the sun and the moon and birth, but bad somehow dripping with wrongness to its core. Where else is there to go? I'm at one of the bridges. Please, you could come back. No, that'd be like going back into the womb. Can't be done. This is what's next. Oh. What? Why? Oh, God. I'm starting to feel something. I think the center's doing it. I'm getting bitter. Every mean, spiteful, everything angry thing in me. It's swelling, spreading out and smothering the rest of me. I'm so mad, Harry. I'm getting so much smaller, and my hate is getting so much bigger. His hand tightened, and I screamed. Why was it me? Why was it me and not you? What did you do that I didn't? What did I do that you didn't? I'm sorry, I said, fully in tears. His voice had changed. It was still quiet, but it was rabid. Each word growled and soaked with vitriol. I hate you. Do you know that? Still able to stand, still able to run, still able to breathe. I hate you. I was hurting all the time, and you just stood there feeling sorry for me. You couldn't feel any of it, just wanting to see me die so you can go off and do everything I never would. I was yelling and screaming for someone to come in and help. I'd almost pulled Dennis off the table, his torso hanging over the side, held straight by whatever force was allowing him to squeeze his hand. In all this, his eyes were still as dead as they'd always been. And then he went limp. His hand let go. His back sagged and he crashed to the floor. He'd broken three of my fingers, but shock was keeping it distant. I threw myself down onto my knees to see his face, slapping it and looking for any sign he was still there. He gasped again, fainter than ever now. Oh no. Oh Jesus. I'm inside, and it's so much worse than I thought. It's beyond worse. It's so far past the worst I thought something could be. Please, Dennis, listen to me. Please tell me what's happening. It's the center. It's so big. Big and floating above me. It's so much bigger than the hive. So much bigger than what's inside the hole. Inside is so much bigger. It's... it's so big. It's gray, too. Always gray gray and cracked like stone all over endless miles of it. His voice had changed. It was whiny and small and afraid. It's hurting me, Harry. It's hurting me much more than I've ever been hurt, and it hasn't even noticed me. Please. The man told me you need to describe it. He said if you keep talking, you might stay. So big, he said his voice wobbling and breaking like he was crying. 
Its fingers are bigger than skyscrapers, and it has so many fingers, millions, and ribs. The body is all ribs, or are they just figures all folded up? I don't know, but there are so many, and so big, hairy. And the masks, Jesus, the masks. What masks? The masks. Its face is bigger than countries, all different. Some of the eyes are perfect circles. Others have huge pointy holes where the mouths should be. Some are blank, and some have eight eye holes, and some look like human faces. Like perfect human faces with deep, dark, whole eyes, all of them. The inside of all of them is so dark, a living dark. A pulsing dark, pushing all together. And it's so huge. So huge, and you can feel it pressing in on you. Filling the air with badness, and crushing down on you. And from inside, you can feel the bad in you reaching out of it. Out of it like a baby, reaching out for its mom. And, Jesus Christ, Harry. He was breathing in and out, faster and faster. Shallow, scared breaths, instincts overcoming the fact that he didn't need air. Dennis, talk to me. What is it? It's not the devil. No, that's what I thought at first, but it's... it's not. It's... it's more like God. It's like if God hated everything. His breathing hiked up again. Oh, Jesus, it sees me. Please... Please promise me one thing. Just one thing, please. What? What is it? Please, don't ever die. One last breath rolled out of his mouth. I tried everything to get him back. Everything I could think of in an animalistic burst of desperate energy. I hit him, shook him, pleaded. But he was really gone this time. I kneeled there in the room for a while. His last words, carving into a deep part of my mind, I knew I could never dig them out of. The next few hours, in fact, the next few days, were kind of a blur. I remember men in the Institute's white scrubs coming in and dragging me away from the body. I remember getting my hand seen to and put in a cast and sling. I remember Daniel Cohen's sitting me down in a bright white room, and interrogating me. He called it a conversation, but it was an interrogation. A warm interrogation by a man who could be kind if it meant getting what he wanted. He asked me if I'd had any visions or any strong sensations, if I thought Dennis was telling the truth, and if I could explain the ways in which Dennis was acting differently than he already was. I was detached and drowsy from exhaustion, and trauma and pain from my hand, and just answered honestly. At the end, Cohen's made me memorize a phone number and sign a load of confidentiality forms, making it very clear that not a word of this could leave the hospital. I was to call if I started experiencing any phenomena I thought was related to my Dennis, and finally, they left. My parents and I took a taxi home. We didn't talk about what had happened after Dennis died, and I suppose that even that was this secondary add-on to the simple fact that Dennis was now properly dead and not coming back. We went home, got to bed, and the next morning we had a wordless breakfast with an extra chair pulled out. The years flew by, and... The whole experience became something I just had to live with. Some dreaded thing my thoughts would sometimes steer me back to, but mostly I managed to keep living, to accept it all as something. I couldn't understand. The fact that Dennis was gone was always worse than the way he went. However terrifying and unnatural it was. But lately... I've been having a dream. It started off vague and incomplete, but every few nights it repeated, 
getting longer and more vivid. It always started the same, with me and Dennis, both of us kids again, on a green hill on a bright, clear day, crisp air sighing past us. I can't remember most of the words, but the gist is that he's bragging, showing off, saying that Dad loves him more, that he's better than me, that he's going to keep being better for as long as he's alive. He's going to keep making Dad love him more for as long as he's able. And I get so mad, way madder than I'd ever gotten if he'd said those things in real life. I see a rock, and without thinking, I pick it up and attack him with it knocking him over and beating him again and again until his skull was swollen and torn and you would see parts of his skull underneath. He managed to push off and run and I would follow, never thinking twice about it. I chase him so far until finally he runs into a pass between two mountains in a long, dark range that I somehow never see until that point. The range extends to either side, seemingly forever, and the sky above it is saturated with heavy, dark clouds. It's like Mordor or something. I always stop running at this point, knowing that I've chased him far enough. The job is done. I start to leave my body, surging forward down the paths. No longer myself, just a nameless, thoughtless observer, gliding like a ghost for lack of legs. He runs down the dark paths, on and on and into a sunless, barren country on the other side, a place where the soil is gray and dry. He runs for ages, but soon he stops. Stops and fails and curses Stops and falls and curses me, screaming about how much he hates me and how much I cost him by driving him into this place. He rages for a long time. Then a second person comes. Sometimes a man, sometimes a woman, sometimes old, sometimes young. They say they, too, were driven past the mountains, or that they wandered past them by mistake and can't get back. Dennis always says the same thing. Then let's all suffer together. Let's hurt together. And this person always latched on to Dennis, and Dennis latches back and they scream or cry and say they want to see people who's wronged them skinned alive. And more always come, a trickle at first, then a flood, latching onto Dennis and the first person, all of them clasping together and piling up into a giant, deafening mass of squirming bodies, and eventually it's huge, almost up to the clouds. And then there's a rumbling, a massive, shifting sound. The countless bodies start to rearrange, forming deep canyons of flesh that make up a horrendous, rage-filled outline of a face. There's a shift greater than any earthquake, and the pile moves, rolling forward, pulling itself with enormous appendages made of the miserable and the bitter and the despairing. It inches and tumbles on and on, crashing down and dragging itself onwards with overwhelming, apocalyptic sounds and then I see that it's heading for the mountain range. It's heading back to the bright place with all its anger and hate and vengeance. And as much as it's made of millions and millions of people, I always know it's still one thing. One thing with one will, but all the hatred of everyone buried in it. All the way back to the first one. The first one to curse. His rage still in there. Rage directed at the first one to sin. It gets right up to the mountains. Then I wake up. I think something's coming. Something that got started a long time ago. Something that strips away good and builds itself on the bad. And I think it's almost strong enough to set out. To start moving. And I think when it gets here, the living will be no better off than the dead. I always had an overactive imagination. And yeah, I could get over emotional. Not to mention I was always weird. So I guess I couldn't blame the people of Stanwyck, Georgia, 
when they didn't believe a werewolf killed my family. And not many people believe me. Ashley Nelson, the quiet geek, a tall, fit, black girl, even then, I was lonely and constantly alienated by my classmates. My long, wavy black hair and big brown eyes always besieged by restless mannerisms. Regardless of my quirky fashion and cute glasses, I had a social anxiety I could never harness, a low self-esteem I constantly struggled with, and a quick temper I constantly suppressed. But on that awful April night, my issues were overshadowed by tragedy. At sixteen, what little innocence I had was forever shattered. The police came to my house around midnight, way too late to save my parents or younger brother, Chris, from the monster, and way too late to save me from the paralyzing trauma. Our house was a mess, a crime scene closer to a slasher movie than anything resembling real life. Blood and flesh were our new wallpaper, severed limbs and scattered organs our new furniture. This was a redecorating job sculptured by slaughter, and I was the sole survivor, found cowering alone in my room, covered in blood with a few cuts, no bruises, no serious injuries, and yet the police didn't believe my story. Hardly anyone believed me when I said a werewolf killed my family, but ultimately, I wasn't charged for the massacre. Instead, I was set free to the wild, free to an unforgiving public. After the summer, my senior year crawled by. Now living with my grandparents, I really had no one to turn to. Not my parents, not Chris. I was alone and against the world. Even grandma and grandpa never talked to me. Like prison guards, they just kept watching over me behind suspicious glares. Then again, so did all of Stanwyck High. I was the girl who literally cried wolf. And now I was even more hated by my classmates. Even more ostracized. And needless to say, my teachers and counselors were less than supportive. In the span of a few months, I'd gone from being ignored to outright despised. From alienated Ashley to the wolf girl. Anonymous internet death threats became normal, as did all those dirty looks in public. I was constantly called Wolf Bitch by Carol Lane and her preppy best friends. I guess I should have been glad I was never charged. There was no evidence against me. I talked to the cops and I told them what happened, how I could do nothing but run to my bedroom, that by the time the werewolf ripped open Chris's innards, my parents were long dead and I could do nothing. I couldn't help if I was lucky enough to survive. While I escaped the lycanthrope, I couldn't escape the suspicions. I heard everyone's excuses, everyone's theories. I heard them whisper behind closed doors, shouted on TV, or in all caps on the internet. All the stories that I was a crazy geek who enjoyed horror movies a little too much. Nobody believed me except my boyfriend, Patrick. He was soulful and introspective. With messy brown hair and bright green eyes, Patrick was cute but quirky. The same height as me at 5'8", and a total weirdo as well. Even so skinny, he still had a nice body. And to top it off, Patrick loved writing scary stories. I guess our shared creativity helped fuel our passionate relationship not to mention our shared love of horror. Patrick had actually been at my house before I saw the werewolf. He left before nightfall, before the monster left my family in pieces. And like me, Patrick had been questioned by the police, and also suspected by almost everyone here in Stanwyck. The constant hatred made Patrick and I feel like outlaws at 17, but we did the best we could. And through it all, I loved Patrick, and always depended on him, especially since he was the only person who believed me. Patrick was my therapy, and of course the sex was passionate, Patrick made sure of that. But through all the negativity, we had each other, and that was all we needed. 
By the middle of September, Patrick and I were surviving the torturous prison sentence that was senior year. We were doing okay, though. Until Carol Lane got a hold of us. Right after third block, she stopped us during our march to the library. Hi, Ashley. Carol's playful southern accent yelled. Helpless, Patrick and I stopped right outside the library, cornered by Carol. Under the dim lighting, we knew no one would be near the library or its long untouched books to help us. Like a gang leader, Carol led her army towards us. All of them were dressed in uniform, all of them in tight name brand ripped jeans and even tighter name brand shirts. There was Carol Lane in all her blonde hair, blue-eyed southern belle glory. Carol, the future prom queen, future valedictorian, and current bitch. Her boyfriend, Roy, nothing more than an eye candy distraction. He was a dumber and taller version of Carol, complete with big muscles, curly blonde hair, and flawless skin. Just the type of meathead dunce Carol would likely dump after graduation for smarter, hotter men. Behind the couple lurked their hangers-on, Frank, Jean, and Becky. Frank and Jean were the B-list couple to Stanwyck High royalty like Carol and Roy. Yeah, they were attractive, but not quite as hot or rich as their idols. Frank was pale with dark hair, social but too corny and silly to be funny. Jean was a light-skinned black girl with big glasses, strong-willed with a long, lean figure. And then there was Becky. I figured she was the ugly one of the bunch, but then again with her long black hair. I guess she was a bit cute behind the extra pounds and thick makeup. Probably could have been much prettier if her self-esteem or fame from being Carol's childhood friend would allow it. Or if Becky wasn't such a grade-A cunt. We just wanted to invite y'all to the party, Carol told us. She exchanged smiles with Roy. Just a little get-together at my house. Yeah, it'll be fun, Becky chimed in. Excitement in her squeaky voice. Carol shined her glowing blue eyes towards me. We'd like to get to know you more, Ashley. Slowly remorse, showing remorse, she paused. A fresh start. Nervous, I looked at Patrick. I like to think I wasn't starstruck by these assholes, but I was. I couldn't say a word. Couldn't tell Carol and her cronies what a pack of assholes they'd been, nor could I tell them to fuck off. Instead, my mind went blank. Honestly, I'd always had a hard time standing up for myself, much less when I was being confronted by Stanwyck High royalty. Patrick just flashed me a confident grin, totally unfazed by the cool kids. Maybe we should go, he said. He helped me shake off the silence. I, I, I don't know, I said. I faced Carol. It's at your house? Yeah, Carol answered with equal parts friendliness and exuberance. It'll be chill, I promise. I hesitated. I, I don't know. I could feel the click's collective pretty eyes beaming on me like spotlights. Just let me think about it. With a delicate but persuasive touch, Patrick squeezed my hand. Nah, we'll go. Struggling to suppress my anxiety, I glared at Patrick, but his confident smile, his sheer handsomeness crushed my anger. Carol and her gang lit up with smiles of perfect white teeth. Good, Carol said. Be at my house around five. Still conflicted, I confronted Carol. That's kind of early, isn't it? I asked. Not really, she replied. Carol glanced at her comrades for the support she could always count on. That's what time we usually start it. Yeah, that gives us more time to party, Jean added. To my dismay, Patrick didn't fight back. Well, we'll be there, he said. My self-conscious insecurities kept me from groaning right there on the spot. Not only was I a prisoner at Stanwyck High, now I'd been trapped at Carol's house on a Friday night. Before I could persuade Patrick, Carol rode her gang off into the sunset, back to the wilderness of our high school cafeteria. We'll see you there, 
Carol yelled towards us. For emphasis, Roy let out a playful howl, a call of the idiots. Patrick, what the hell was that? I muttered, annoyed. Patrick smiled at me, his cuteness a temporary remedy for my dread. What? He said. It's just a party, babe. A party from hell, I grumbled. Patrick's left hand caressed my face. Look, we'll have fun, alright? I got lost in his green eyes. Yet another cure for my constant worry. And if it sucks, we're gonna leave early, Patrick continued. I guess he had a point. From what I heard, Carol had a Lake Douglas mansion, an isolated fortress by the water. And she also had a shitload of Jose Cuervo. At the very least, Patrick and I could attend for the booze, and hopefully get too fucked up to have to deal with any of Carol's bullshit. So I let Patrick drive us over there. His car was easily the ugliest one in the long paved driveway, but we didn't care. By now, both Patrick's chill mood and our little pre-gaming helped me relax. Walking hand in hand, Patrick led me up to Carol's garage door right past all the lovely cars and cute lawn ornaments, like a South Georgia Hollywood, like Douglas had hills, privacy, and a variety of million dollar views. And Carol's two-story house was no exception to the neighbor's luxurious standards. Inside, I was surprised by the low-key party. Not that it was lame or lacking, it was just more chill than I expected. Instead of sorority-like antics or frat house theatrics, all of us just sat in the living room's main recliners and sofas. Just me, Patrick, Carol, and the rest of her tight-knit clique. The five of them still wore their expressive uniforms while Patrick and I rocked our colorful thrift shop finds. My Caribbean blouse a stark contrast to their pretty blandness on the huge flat-screen TV top 40 music videos played at a low volume. In the corner, a small bar featuring Carol's notorious treasure chest of alcohol. A hallway connected the living room to all the bedrooms. Small town ornaments gave the house a wholesome charm, while large picture frames showed off photos of Carol and her eternally on vacation parents. The frames repressed a sprawling chronology of Carol Lane from innocent baby to conceited teenager. The booze was potent, strong, and absolutely fucking amazing. This wasn't PBR or Natty Light. You got what you paid for here at Lake Douglas. Throughout the party, everyone stayed in their zones. Outside of pedestrian conversations, no one amongst our outcasts and preps dared cross over to the other side. Not that I minded. As the hours went by, Patrick and I were having fun just chilling and listening to music. Around seven, I stole a glance out a window. The sun was beginning to fade, and once darkness hit, I suspected Carol's calm guard and party would throw into a rowdy nightclub, would turn into a rowdy nightclub, one I was eager to escape. Carol stood up and muted the flat screen. All eyes went on her as she placed her humongous purse on top of the TV. Like she was ready to deliver a toast, Carol held up her red plastic cup. I'm glad everyone can make it tonight. She displayed a wicked smile. We have quite the special event in store. Confused, I faced Patrick. A special event? I asked, my voice louder due to the booze. Cackling, Roy pointed at us. It's just for you, Ashley. Just for Ashley, Jean shouted with drunken enthusiasm. The anxiety roared through me, even through the liquor. Patrick, what are they talking about? Patrick's hand caressed my arm, but not even that could soothe my swirling unease. It's okay, babe, he said. Carol motioned towards the windows. Becky, close the blinds. At Carol's command, Becky lowered all the heavy blinds, squashing the stray sunlight. A few ceiling lights were now our only solace in this upper-class cavern. Awkwardly, I looked all around us. Carol's gang now gathered by the TV. I, I don't understand, I said, looking at Patrick's calm face. What's going on? His grip tightened around my arm. 
Babe, just relax. No. I pulled away from him and confronted the preps. What the hell is this? We're trying to help you, Ashley, Carol said in a moderate but authoritative tone. Roy pulled Carol in towards him. Yeah, we're going to catch a werewolf. Like a laugh track, all their friends forced a chuckle. I placed my cup on the floor and stood up, my mind somewhere between outraged and intrigued. Is this a fucking joke? I asked. My voice came off weak. I was nothing more than an intimidated mess. Sensing my unease, Patrick grabbed my hand. Babe, they're serious. What? Patrick stood next to me. I already talked to them, Ash. They want to help. That's all they want to do. He leans in closer. I know you weren't lying, babe. I always knew, and now we're going to prove it. Carol strutted up to us. At first, I didn't believe you. She stopped right in front of me, her poise the polar opposite of my defensive demeanor. But then I figured it out. We all did, Jean added. So you've seen him? I asked, excited. I stole a look at the lineup of cool kids. For once, even Roy was serious. You guys really believe me? Yep, Becky retorted. We know the truth, Ashley, Carol said. A werewolf did kill your family. Feeling relieved, I struggled to suppress my tears. My emotions went wild. It wasn't your fault, Carol added. Reassuring me, Petra kissed my temple. I told you, babe. Carol walked towards her purse. There's only one thing. What? I asked. Veering from polite host to wicked competitor, Carol confronted me. One of us is the werewolf. A deathly quiet overtook the room. The entire house. No one said a word. Not a sliver of a smirk on any of their attractive faces. I don't know whether to laugh or cringe or, hell, even shiver. I looked over at Patrick. I, I don't understand. What the fuck? Ah, uh, it's cool, Patrick replied. She's serious. Through the confusion, I couldn't respond couldn't do anything except just stand there. I did a little investigating, Carol said. She reached into her purse. None of us had an alibi for that night. I stepped towards her. But how do you know someone is the werewolf? The sight of Carol pulling out a pistol made me stop dead in my tracks. The weapon was old, but in mint condition. A real Colt 45 revolver. One fully capable of taking out all seven of us. Oh shit, I yelled. No one else looked surprised. They didn't even flinch. And deep in my unsettled gut, I realized they expected the gun. You're fine, Ashley, Carol said in a cool voice. She placed the gun right next to her purse. There's already silver bullets in it. So what? I struggled to say through the shivers. You're just gonna shoot whoever changes? Carol's voice took on a new layer of intensity. A southern bell gone mad. Exactly, she said. I scanned the scene for help, but like a morbid Greek chorus. Everyone wore the same somber expressions. Even Patrick. His green eyes now looked darker, hazier, as if the party's sudden shift had subdued his soul. But this is crazy, I said. Supportive. Patrick grabbed my hand. You'll be safe, babe. Unless she's the werewolf, Becky blurted out with glee. I wanted to call her an ugly bitch, but I didn't. Not when everyone kept staring at me. Patrick glared at Becky. That could be any one of us. Annoyed, Becky pointed at me. Well, she's the one who survived. I put my money on her. And what if it's you, huh? Patrick yelled. What if you killed her family? His burst of a response silenced Becky, but it didn't stop those harsh stares stuck on us. Look, let's just calm down, Carol said. She strolled up next to Roy. We'll just wait and see. She looked towards the windows. Even with the blinds blackening the darkness, I could tell nighttime was upon us. I could feel it. Once the full moon's at its peak, we'll open the blinds. 
Carol continued. She confronted me. Then we'll see the werewolf, Ashley. Just like you did. Trembling, I backed away. No, we, we need to go. Patrick held me there. Patrick, I said. He looked into my eyes. You need to see, Ashley. I struggled to pull away, but had no chance at escaping his staunch grip. Let me go. Ashley, please. His emerald eyes begging me to stay. They made me a prisoner to the party. You need the closure, Patrick told me in a gentle tone. You can't keep running away. I looked at everyone else. Carol's click was cooler than ever, each and every one of them showing no weakness, no fear. Tonight, everyone will believe you, Ash, Patrick said. You don't have to be afraid. I looked back at him. They'll believe you, he said, just like I do. Carol clapped, grabbing everyone's attention. All right, I think it's time. Will you do the honors, Becky? Staying close to Patrick, I watched Becky step towards the first window. A dread rather than anticipation built up inside me. Roy grabbed a hold of Carol's gun. Wait, do we have to do it right now? He said, unease piercing through the confidence. Annoyed, Carol pulled away from him. Uh, yeah. With subtle panic, Roy snatched Becky's arm. Hey, just wait a fucking second. Frank gave him a weird look. Dude, what's wrong? Like a defensive animal, Roy staggered back towards the hallway. A defiant glare overtook his handsome face. Shit, nothing, all right? I just think we should wait until later. Carol watched him with nothing but sheer suspicion. Why? The full moon's already out, dumbass. God damn it, Carol. Roy shouted. Just fucking listen to me. Scoffing, Carol pushed Becky over towards the window. Nah, fuck that. I watched Becky stop in front of the window. Clear unease made her hesitate, and I couldn't blame her. Look, I just want us to be safe, Roy said to Carol, his voice featuring more rage than concern. I felt Patrick wrap his arm around me. What are you so afraid of, Roy? Patrick hurled at him. Startled, everyone looked at my boyfriend. Shocked to hear him challenge one of the Stanwick's prized jocks. Roy growled. Hey, you and your creepy-ass girlfriend can shut the fuck up. Jean pushed Frank over towards Roy. I don't need y'all creeps accusing me of shit, Roy continued. My tower of anxiety grew even higher. Hey, leave her alone, asshole, Patrick yelled at Roy. Trying to play peacemaker, Frank grabbed Roy's arm. Dude, chill. Roy broke away from him. Nah, man, fuck that. He went for the gun. I ain't doing this shit. Concerned, Carol rushed towards him. Roy. Roy's glare latched on me. Especially with that crazy bitch. Motherfucker, Patrick yelled. He lunged at Roy, but I held him back. All the while, the anger boiled up inside of me. But no matter what, I couldn't unleash it. I couldn't let my inner beast out. Rather than exposing the fury within, I could only stay silent in Patrick's arms. Right before Roy grabbed the gun... Carol snatched his wrist. What the hell is wrong with you? She shouted. Amidst their struggle, I saw Jean shove Frank towards them once more. Stop, Carol, Roy yelled. Like a guard restraining an asylum inmate, Frank ambushed Roy, grabbing both his arms. Stop, man, Frank pleaded. Carol glared at Becky. Becky hadn't moved this whole time, too scared to raise the blinds. Open the blinds. Carol demanded. Carol's voice forced Becky out of her fearful state. Okay, she cried. With a trembling hand, Becky reached towards the lift cord. Nervously, I looked at Patrick, but his stoic calmness failed to soothe me. No, Roy screamed at Becky. Frank struggled to hold him in place. God damn it, Roy. Be careful, the concerned Jean shouted at Frank. Becky grabbed the cord. With a scratchy snarl, Roy shoved Frank across the room. Frank! Jean cried. Startled, Becky collapsed back against the wall. A scared mess who damn sure wasn't going to open those blinds now. In a terrifying display of strength, 
Roy turned and bolted for the hallway, his movements so manic, his howls murky and unsettling. My stomach sank to the floor. The noises harkened me back to the past trauma, back to the werewolf's wail, back to my family's tortured screams. What the fuck? Carol yelled. Jean helped Frank off the ground. Oh God, are you okay? She said concerned. Then Roy's animalistic cries rang through the house. Nothing but his howls and snarls hit us on a horrifying loop. Acting on simultaneous courage and stupidity, Frank snatched the gun. Jean reached towards him. Frank! Just stay here, Frank said. He ran towards the hallway, straight towards another harrowing howl. What the hell are you doing? Carol cried after him. Within seconds, Frank had disappeared into the upper-class jungle the snarling in Frank's frantic footsteps all we could hear. Frank! Jean yelled. She stepped towards the hallway. Carol restrained her. No, don't. Frank, come back! Jean shouted. Like a timid soldier, I did my best to stagger off towards the window, further away from those sounds. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Becky slouched to the ground. She covered her ears in a pathetic attempt to quash those nocturnal howls. Patrick looked at me, worried. Ashley, a sudden scream surrounded us. A human scream. No, Frank, Jean yelled. Acting off adrenaline, she pushed Carol away and forward. She pushed Carol away and followed her boyfriend's cries. Carol pushed Becky off the ground. Carol's intense blue eyes zeroed in on me. Come on! Patrick grabbed a hold of my hand. Together we followed after two preps. Patrick and I lagged behind in this long, dark hallway. By now, Frank's screams had faded off into an unnerving silence. All I could hear was footsteps and the occasional guttural growl. Then a loud thud echoed towards us. I jumped upon hearing it, and I could feel Patrick do the same. Up ahead, I saw Carol drag Becky through an open door on the left. Come on, Ashley, I heard Carol shout. At the open doorway, I felt Patrick let go of me. Patrick, I cried. Turning, I caught a brief glimpse of his uneasy face. Babe, I started. Carol's groomed hand yanked me inside. I stumbled inside the study. A large desk sat in the center of the room, several antique bookshelves lined up against the wall, all of them crammed with hardbacks and more cherished photos of Carol Lane. A huge window overlooked Lake Douglas. The blinds were lifted, revealing a glorious full moon shining upon us. Its beams so bright, the remnants strayed inside the hallway. I stopped at the desk, right by Becky and Carol. Near the window, I saw Jean crying over a bloodied body. Frank was sprawled out like a red snow angel. Crimson ran all along his face and torn t-shirt. Frank, the victim of a most brutal attack. The revolver lay a few feet away, silver bullets and all. Oh God, Becky shouted. He's dead. Horrified, I turned towards the door in desperate search of Patrick. Carol snatched my arm in a dead grip. Ashley, look out. Like a cheesy horror sound effect, a howl roared to life behind me. One more befitting monster mash than an American werewolf in London. Whirling around, I saw a creature rise up behind the desk. Roy transformed, his face replaced by pointy ears, a long snout, spurts of thick black fur, and two hungry red eyes. Snarling, he lunged at me. I screamed and tumbled to the ground right by Frank's dead body. Another corny howl pierced my ears. Scared shitless, I reached for the gun, until I got a closer look at this teenage lycanthrope. Roy still had his flawless name-brand t-shirt and jeans, his muscular arms and legs completely unscathed by excessive hair. Roy's howls shifted from campy spookiness to howling laughter. Then more laughter surrounded me, and I saw now... Everyone was chuckling and pointing at me. Carol, Jean, Becky, even Frank sat up, 
the fake blood unable to drown out his mean-spirited cackle. Oh shit, we got her, Jean cried out. Like invisible force, the heavy laughter combed with the mask's narrow eyes. The heavy laughter, combined with the mask's narrow eye sockets, made Roy stagger against the desk. Hell yeah, he said. That bitch got scared quick. I sat there on the verge of tears, my self-conscious soul on the verge of suicide. The hurt sank into my flesh like sharp hooks. I couldn't say anything. Carol pulled Jean off the ground, Frank too dominated by drunken amusement, to even stand on his own. Well, Carol began, trying to control her sadistic laughter. She pointed over to Roy. There's your werewolf, Ashley. Leaving his mask on, Roy raised his arms and lumbered towards me, his act about as creepy as an intoxicated straggler leaving a Halloween party. His howl is now more obnoxious than ever. I cringed at the silly sight. The girl who cried wolf, Jean quipped. Indeed, Carol replied. Chuckling, Becky walked over towards the window, a closer glance at the full moon. You got her good, she said to an audience of none. Still reeled from the scare, I crawled back towards the door. I realized teardrops were sliding down my face, and like always, I couldn't fight back. I really was going to weep like a scared child in front of the cool kids. The gang's giggling only grew louder, a laugh track well off the rails, a live studio audience from my pitiful state. With obnoxious glory, Carol pointed right at me. Hey y'all, she just saw another wolf. Looks like it. Frank quipped. A booming snarl ended their laughter real quick. Now fear latched into all of them. Outright terror. Everyone watched the beast lunge into the study. A muscular werewolf walking on its furry hind legs. The creature's brown fur was brisk and spiky. Its ears long and slender, just like the monster's intimidating snout. In the room, the werewolf flashed as a smile of razor-sharp teeth, its eyes redder than the fake blood scattered across Frank's body. Only tattered clothes were stuck to the werewolf's army of fur, and like huge retractable blades, eager claws extended out of its hands. I recognized those hipster claws, and even from here, I could tell the creature was exactly my height. Panicked, Roy grabbed Carol. Oh, fuck. His muffled voice yelled to the mask. Before Carol could scream, one quick swipe from the creature declared a double decapitation. Carol and Roy's heads tumbled to the ground. Their severed necks erupted like volcanoes of dark red gore. Roy's dying eyes looked at me. Sticky blood covered the mask's cheap fur. The plastic ears now crooked and bent. His mask pathetic counterparts to the real thing standing before us. I watched the other teens scream in horror, and for once, I was glad my self-doubt kept me from taking action, especially since it kept me from helping these assholes. Right now, I was one entertained audience. There was Frank reaching for his Colt 45. Only the werewolf's bare foot splattered Frank's head into a busted jack-o'-lantern of gooey flesh. Screaming, Jean and Becky rushed towards the door. The werewolf's bellowing snarl ushered them into a frenzied panic. Both girls kept stumbling into each other, their attempt at escaping so sloppy. Get out of my way, bitch! Jean yelled. She pushed Becky back, straight into the clutches of the creature. Becky cried out. Her squeaky screams silenced once the werewolf jammed its paw straight down her throat. Blood sprayed across the monster's hungry flesh. It retrieved its paw in a quick flourish, yanking out all sorts of intestines. A goodie bag of Becky's organs. Becky's corpse hit the floor, her mouth agape in a huge oval. A wide enough opening for a red river to come rushing out. Right when Jean reached the open door, the werewolf snagged her back in, its tight grip sunk straight into her fragile flesh. No! She cried. The monster turned her around. A brief taut of deep breaths and sloppy saliva hit Jen's face. She cringed in helpless fear. 
She knew she was fucked, and all she could do was scream and scream again. The werewolf went to turn on her vulnerable face. A machine of chomping ensued. The monster's mouth quicker and messier than a blender. Jean's screams died, even as remnants of her mouth kept twitching. Her flesh and all-you-can-eat buffet devoured in mere seconds. As the werewolf finished, literally defacing my classmates. I reached out and grabbed the gun. I staggered to my feet. Through the tears, my gaze strayed towards the window. The lift cord for the blinds was well in reach. Victorious, the monster threw down Jean's body. She landed with a splat near all the others. Now all their blood intertwined. The five bodies laid side by side in a prep cemetery. I stared at the wolf. Deep down, I knew I'd never seen it before. I knew I'd never seen it before. This wasn't the monster that killed my family, or at least I didn't think it was. My trembling hands did its damnedest to hold a gun in a tight grip. Patrick! I yelled out, my tone strong and steady for once. Drawn to my voice, the creature confronted me. Even behind the terrifying exterior, I knew Patrick recognized me. His eyes always gave away his emotions, even when they were red instead of green. Breathing heavy, Patrick stepped towards me, his ominous footsteps splashing through multiple red puddles. I pointed the gun right at him, but who was I kidding? Patrick didn't even flinch, much less slow down. He knew I couldn't pull the trigger. I took a deep breath and wiped away my tears. Reaching out, I pulled the cord. Like a dropped curtain, the blinds whisked straight down. The full moon was blanketed. Through the darkness, I heard Patrick howl in pain, heard his anguished cries. Terrified by the noises, I stumbled towards the desk. I struggled before finally turning on a lamp. There was Patrick, cowering a few feet away, weakened yet alive and in human form. Exhausted by the transformation, Patrick looked at me with those green eyes. Somehow, he looked more attractive, more radiant. I guess his revealing ripped clothes may have helped. Patrick! I yelled in excitement. I dropped the gun and rushed towards him. A weak smile crossed his lips. I hugged him close and embraced for the ages. Oh my god, I'm glad you're okay. Amused, Patrick looked at me. He haven't hugged me like this in a long time. I blushed, then struggled to tell him what needed to be told. Look, I need to tell you. Still smiling, Patrick traced his smooth hand along my face. I already know. Shockwaves rushed through me. What? I guess we, uh, we both have our little secrets. Patrick's grin remained. Yet it wasn't taunting or vile, but comforting. Supportive like he'd always been. I don't know, I finally said. I haven't told anyone. And you don't need to, Patrick responded. He stroked my hair. I know you killed them. I know you did it, Ash. And he was right. The whole town was right. The ticking teenage time bomb that was Ashley Nielsen had finally exploded. A Jody Arias meltdown led to me massacring my entire family. Sure, I tried to suppress those painful memories, and in some ways, maybe my werewolf story was true. Maybe Patrick had given me a helping hand that night. But amidst the immense anger, I couldn't remember much, honestly. All I did was give Patrick a knowing smile. His secret was safe with me, and mine with him. You don't have to tell me anything. A rebellious twinkle in those emerald eyes. I know what it's like to get frustrated. To fight back. Like what? I quipped. Patrick chuckled. Hey, I did it for you. He motioned towards the bodies surrounding us like scattered rice and bouquets of flowers at a wedding. I knew what they were going to do. He caressed my face, his mere touch melting my heart. I couldn't let them hurt you, Ash. You know I couldn't. 
No one had ever stuck up for me like that. Not even myself. And now I had a werewolf on my side. I struggled with the same issues. Patrick went on. I know. Patrick's eyes pierced into mine. And I know what can help. Reflective, I looked back towards the big window where the full moon awaited us. He just let me have one bite. You'll be like me, he said. You'll be confident. Shushing him, I put a finger to Patrick's lips, flashed him my own sly smile. You don't have to say anything else. In that moment, I knew I'd found my werewolf soulmate, and now I wanted to join. After all, I always had a hard time saying no, so I stopped now. My name is Boston Murphy, and I kill werewolves for the U.S. government. I didn't join the army to get medals or to have a statue in my honor. I joined it to simply get away from my family. My father's okay, but his new wife is the most evil person you could have the misfortune of meeting. She used to constantly berate me, calling me less than dirt and a waste of space. I tried telling dad, but... He didn't believe it, or chose not to believe it. I joined the army when I was 17. It was the only way to get away from the verbal abuse. Stepmom couldn't be happier that I was finally out of her house, but Dad was crushed. He understood why I chose to do it, but he still felt like it was his fault. I was shipping out today, and he gave me an emotional send-off. It was time to start my own life. I arrived at Fort Bronson by Thursday. I still remember having goosebumps arriving. This was it. I was really doing this. No turning back now. Fort Bronson was a massive base, expanding over 60 acres. The bus stopped, and drill instructor Haymeyer walked on board, gracing us with his hospitality. Attention, you piss cans. I'm Instructor Haymeyer. I'll be your friend for the next 18 weeks. Now get your sorry asses off my bus and get checked in. Do I make myself clear? Sir, yes sir, we all shouted in unison. We got our bags and got off the bus. Since I was sitting in the very back, I was the last one to leave. Haymire looked at me and stopped me. What's your name, cadet? He asked. Uh, B Boston Murphy, sir, I replied nervously. He looked me up and down, muttering to himself. You're not going with them. You're going to the special assignment ward, Haymire said. I haven't been here more than ten minutes, and I'm already getting a special assignment. Where is that, sir? I asked. In your room next to the mess hall, in the north building. Now get the hell off my bus, Haymire replied. I quickly got my bags and left. The north building was the farthest building on the base away from everyone else. The sun was furious that day, and I was sweating hard, yet I walked at a brisk pace. All I knew was that it could be the first test. I entered the building, the air conditioning inside greeting me like an old friend. The place was a maze of stairs and hallways. I had to use my map. The mess hall was located on the second hallway. I climbed the stairs, carrying my luggage with me. This building seemed less maintained than the other buildings, but who am I to judge? As I approached the mess hall, I turned to the door to the left. It looked like a janitor's closet. It had a faded special assignments sticker on it. I opened it, and a rush of old, musty air ambushed my nose. Once inside, I walked down a long hallway. There was no paint on the walls. It was gray. The fluorescent lights shined bitterly. Through a pair of double doors, I entered a waiting room. The place was empty, only a receptionist and another cadet populated the place. I went to the receptionist. Name, please, she said. Uh, Boston Murphy, I replied. She checked her notes, sighing. I don't see you in my notes. You must be new. Uh, yeah. Instructor Haymire sent me here, I said, sweating. She dialed a number on her phone, motioning me to take a seat. I did what she asked. The other cadet in the room was a skinhead called James. You're new here too, huh? He asked. Yeah, man, 
I replied. And me too. I was so ready to kick some jihadi ass, but I'm here instead. You feel me? He asked. Yeah, I lied. The truth was that I didn't join to kill. I was hoping to be a medic or something. My name's James. What's yours? He asked. Boston, I replied. You seem cool, Boston. Personally, I hope that was a mistake. I want to hit the range and make those bastards pay for 9-11, James said. Cadet James Fillmore, the receptionist said. I guess that's my cue. See you, brother, James said, patting my back. I waited to be called in, watching videos on my phone, the receptionist on the phone looking at me every so often, whispering. After what seemed like centuries, I was finally called up. The receptionist told me to go through the double doors and into the first door on the right. I walked through, luggage in hand. The hallway I walked in was small and dirty. The door on the right said, Lycanthropy Extermination with Greg Romero. Lycanthropy? Like as in werewolves? This had to be a joke. It surely Haymeyer played a prank on me, attesting how gullible new recruits are. I looked further down the hall. It only got weirder from there. Windigo extermination from Susan Fletcher. Thunderbird extermination with Otto Haymeyer. Zombie extermination with Tony Stevenson. I had half a mind to walk out and confront Haymeyer, but something told me that he didn't appreciate being called a liar. Despite my doubts, I walked in. Inside, it looked like a regular classroom, having desks and such. James was sitting in back while I sat near the front. Hey, Boston. Small world, am I right? He asked. I suppose, I replied. I sat down, and a man started speaking. Welcome, cadets. I'm Greg Romero, and for the next 18 weeks I'll teach you how to dispatch a lycanthrope. Mr. Romero said. James raised his hand. Aren't werewolves fake, though? He asked. I wish they were fake, but no, they're not. Lycanthropy poses a serious threat to livestock and humanity as a whole, Mr. Romero replied. I raised my hand. Uh, where's the rest of the class? I asked. Romero sighed. We're not as popular as Windigo extermination, but hopefully we'll receive more recruits next year. Romero showed a photo of a mutilated woman being eaten alive by a werewolf. I gagged. We have thankless jobs, gentlemen. Only two people know we exist, and that's the two of you. Who wants to kill a wolf? Romero asked. We both shouted in unison. For the next 18 weeks, I was taught how to kill a wolf. Silver does kill one, but instead of a crossbow, I got a mini-14 with silver bullets. I was trained how to track wolves and how to survive in the wild. It was hard at first, but I got the hang of it. On graduation day, I was so happy. James and I got drunk at his place. At first, I didn't like James, but during training, we became friends. I was deployed to Arizona, of all places. The assignment was simple. An elderly lycanthrope was spotted in the area, and I had to dispatch him. I had to cut off its right hand as proof and return it to my bosses. I was getting paid $100,000 for this. Since I was new, this assignment was sort of a test to see if I had what it takes. I arrived at Ground Zero, a campsite. The brass in Washington were nice enough to close its surrounding area so nobody could get hurt. I looked for clues, only to find a patch of hair. It smelled like piss, meaning that a wolf was nearby. The hair led deep into the brush, into the desert. The sun was angry that day. It cooked my skin under all my armor. It led to an abandoned farmhouse, but any sign of a farm was dried up a long time ago. I crept to a window, rifle in hand. I peeked, and not only did I see the wolf, but there were also two little wolves, seemingly surrounding him. Come on, Grandpa. Let's go play, one of the little ones said, nibbling on the big one's ear. In a while, I have to rest. He replied. My hands were shaking, sweat dripped from my brow. I had to do this. I was getting paid to. 
took a deep breath, and then I kicked the door open. I opened fire, shooting the big one in the chest four times, sending him backwards. The kids looked on in horror, screaming and crying. I brought out my axe and hacked off his right hand. I placed it in my bag, and the puppies started crying. Shut your fucking mouths, I yelled, pointing my rifle at them. They only screamed louder. I panicked. I didn't want to fail my first mission. I did what I had to do. I shot the puppies, hitting them both in the head. I hacked off their right hands, putting them in my bag. Once the adrenaline died, I threw up. What's done is done. I can't fix it. I had $300,000 in my bag, softening the blow. I returned to my boss and gave them the hands. They were surprised, to say the least. Damn. Not only did you take out that old fuck, but you popped his grandkids, too. You're the best exterminator we've ever had, but no mercy. I'm gonna call you Eisenerd from now on, okay? My boss said, signing me a check. It was from the United States Treasury. $300,000. I placed the money in my bank account when I got home. Before I left, my boss said, Your new assignment is to dispatch wolf pups spotted in Alaska. But I don't think that'll be a problem for you, Isonerve. He winked. Made me sick. I reloaded my silver ammo, bought some beef jerky, and flew to Alaska. A logger found a wolf pup hanging out around the woods near his house and locked it in his shed. I told him to stay back in case I got aggressive. I went in, closing the door behind me. Huddled in the corner, I saw four wolf pups. They looked scared. I wasn't proud of what happened next. I fired, and I took their hands. I returned to my boss and turned in the hands. He gave me 400,000 this time. I saw nerve you're making your country safer every time you go out. You're a hero, son, he said. I don't feel like a hero, sir, I replied. Just know this. They're monsters. They don't know right from wrong. All they know is killing. Take two months off, then come back, okay? He said, sending me off. That's all the time I have today. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. It all started four days ago. My job had just let me go because I was too slow at putting peppers on a freaking conveyor belt. So it was back to the hell that was job searching. Three applications a day, keeping an eye out for responses, and in general, just hanging with my parents that I could tolerate some days better than others. I honestly don't know what made me think of applying for that specific gas station. But don't get me wrong. I really do like the place, and I don't blame it for what happened. So I won't use the real name in this story. Let's call it Swift Pit instead. The gas station was family owned. Let's call them the Laika family. That has a nice ring to it. Miss Laika was a kind, short lady with gray hair and blue eyes, and a very gentle voice. $13 an hour sure felt like one hell of a deal for just running the register, filling the hot food section and keeping the shelves stocked. And the other workers were nice, which was more than I could have said for my last job. I don't think I need to describe what it looked like to you, because it's pretty much the same as any other gas station. There were four pumps, and the store itself was pretty small, but not so small it felt claustrophobic. During the day, they kept the hot food area well stocked, but... During the night, we kept only the bare minimum there, replacing it only when the initial ones were taken. The evenings were so slow, they'd only put one person in the station, though the boss lived perhaps ten minutes away and would be able to show up pretty quickly if I gave her a call. Not sure how the days went, though since they were still in business, I've got to assume quite a bit busier. I heard that they were toying with closing during the night to help save on expenses. It was my first night by myself, Nothing too eventful happened for the first few hours. I could have counted the number of customers that actually entered the station so far on one hand. One with a short old woman with a loud set of pipes. One was a short old woman with a loud set of pipes. 
Another was a man who really shouldn't have been driving from how badly he reeked of alcohol. There might have been a few more customers. It's a little fuzzy now. I spent a lot of time just standing at the register and staring out the window. I always grew up near cities, where you could only see the brightest stars. It really wasn't until I got this job, a few minutes away from the nearest city, that I really got to see the night sky in all of its glory. That night was no exception. The full moon was just... breathtaking. I could have stood there and watched the stars for hours. It was around one o'clock when I heard the gun shot, and it was close, really close. The entire night went into a panic. I heard startled birds flying for safety, watching a single deer sprint past the building. Then it was quiet, the night itself patiently waiting for an explanation, but I didn't have one. There was a huge forest nearby, sure. Perhaps a hunter? I don't know the first thing about hunting. Uh, maybe someone was allowed to hunt on this property. I was straining my ears when there was a loud clunk by the door. Nothing could have prepared me for what I saw. It was an adult wolf, who had one paw lightly stuck in the handle to pull it open. All it took was the wolf making a little jump backwards, and the door swung open. And for just a moment, I realized the wolf had gained entry, and I was very possibly in danger. The wolf threw something into the store and took off into the night, all within the span of a few seconds. It was all so fast. But it was what the wolf had just flung into the building that really had me shocked. It was a small bundle of grey fur, looking at me with big brown eyes. I couldn't understand what I had just witnessed. Had an adult wolf just thrown its baby into the gas station and bail? That didn't make any sense. The little wolf looked outside, then hobbled its way towards me without a second thought. I was still thinking about it when someone stormed into view. They were wearing a huge trench coat, a very heavy set of jeans, some steel-toed boots, and a thick pair of gloves, along with a heavy-looking hat. But what really had me scared was the huge gun the man was holding. It was some sort of rifle, and even without knowing anything about guns, I recognized it as a high-caliber gun. The man was walking towards the entrance to the gas station, and while I couldn't see his eyes, I got the feeling he was looking right at me. By the time he got to the entrance, the young pup was out of sight, and the man's attention was grabbed when the adult wolf howled somewhere off in the distance. The man immediately turned and ran toward the sound, his gun at the ready. I didn't know what to think about the whole situation. I've heard of plenty of people hunting deer, but I didn't even know if it was legal for people to hunt wolves. I also didn't know how smart wolves were. But here was a parent wolf not only playing decoy to protect its cub, it even knew how to work the gas station's pull door with no trouble whatsoever. I've had some dogs that figured out that kind of stuff, sure, but that was only after several hundred attempts. And if the wolf was that crafty, I got the feeling the man stood no chance of killing it. My thoughts turned to the cub when I felt it nuzzling against my feet. It only took one look down before I knelt down and began petting it. I've always liked dogs and kids, so a two-in-one package combo was an absolute delight. It took me a second to remember that it was a wild wolf cub. This whole situation was just so... weird. The poor thing was shaking like a leaf. Somewhere in the back of my mind I was wary. Even a fully tamed dog is likely to lash out at a person if it is approached when scared but that part of my mind wasn't the one in control, as I gently clutched the cub close to my chest. There, there. It's okay. I won't let the mean hunter hurt you. The wolf looked up at my face, then, to my delight, snuggled close to my chest. Good. There was nothing to worry about. But it was strange. As far as I know, most wild animals are scared to be around people. This pup was scared, sure, but had no problem whatsoever with me. Did it realize I wanted to help it? I, I don't know. Would that be a bit too smart for a wolf cub? It didn't take long before I realized I had to call someone. 
even if the poor cub was someone's pet, that meant that someone was missing their pets and probably looking for it. The only person who lived close enough that it even seemed plausible would be the manager. I hated the idea of waking her up at 1am, but I really wasn't sure what to do about the situation. The phone rang three times before someone picked up. Unlike the gentle voice I was expecting to come out from the phone, I heard a gruff and decadently male voice grumble its way through the receiver. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, I'm looking for Miss Laika. There's something odd going on at the gas station, and... My wife's sleeping right now, asshole. I'm gonna have to do. Well, this was off to a great start. I've never been the best at conversing with people, and I honestly hadn't realized she was married. Okay, okay. I, I heard a gunshot nearby. It took the man the longest time to reply, and when he did, I was startled at how nervous he sounded. All of that annoyance was gone, replaced with genuine fear in his voice. Uh, is, is that so? Are you in danger? Uh, not that I know of yet. I did see some weirdo in a trench coat carrying a rifle walking around outside, but they left after hearing a wolf howl. Shit, you, uh, didn't happen to see if there was a wolf with a cub nearby, did you? Well, that was suspiciously specific. I'm not stupid, and that was setting off red flags in my head. It took nearly ten seconds before I decided the only rational answer was that the Laika family owned a few tame wolves. I, uh, yes, actually. The wolf kind of uh, threw the cub into the gas station. I'm currently holding the cub right now. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to. Actually, first I'm going to question why the hell you'd pick up a wild wolf cub. You do know mother wolves aren't very forgiving if they see you playing with their kids, right? That made me blush. He wasn't wrong, of course. If I was a normal person, maybe I would have thought through it a little bit harder. I, uh, I like dogs. A lot. Fair enough. Anyways, I've heard about this nutcase on the news recently. Apparently it comes out every full moon starts shooting at any wolves he sees. I'm gonna grab my gun and meet you at the gas station. Just in case he decides to do something. As for the cub, well, you seem to have that under control right now. Also, this may be a strange thing to ask, but could you please not call the police? I mean... If the situation gets really bad, then go right ahead. But so long as it's just weird like this... I agreed with him, my throat becoming very dry. More red flags were going off. He knew more than what he was letting on. I could sense it. This whole situation screamed trouble. As I hung up the phone, I looked at the clock. 1.15. Now, before I continue... I want it on the record that I'm not always the best when it comes to putting things together, but it doesn't take a fucking genius to figure out the connection between wolves and the full moon. Of course, I thought, werewolf at some point during this conversation, it would definitely explain some nut marching around the woods, killing every wolf he came across. At the time, I thought this gunman was probably just some deluded psycho who believed in fairy tales a little too much. As I waited for Mr. Laika to appear, I couldn't stop the thoughts gnawing away in my brain. Why on earth had the man asked about a wolf and her cub? My more uh, creative side that likes to ignore reality played with the thought that perhaps this mother wolf and child were in fact not only werewolves, but family members to Mr. Laika. I've always had an overactive imagination, and it's gotten me in trouble more than once. And tonight... Faced with a mystery that the rational side of my brain had no answer to, the creative side was all too willing to spin a fantastical story of lies, murder, and love. Though, of course, the rational side was keeping it in check. The fantasies I was cooking up were nothing more than fantasies. Werewolves were not real. The entire time my brain was, uh, thinking this up, I was playing with the cup. For the first few minutes, I just stood there and petted the cub, but then we got bored of that and I decided to see if it could play fetch with a nearby pencil. The answer, to my delight, was yes. Somewhere in the middle of this, I started calling the cub Togo, 
which he seemed to love. Belly rubs were one of his favorite things, so I started rewarding him with a belly rub each time he brought back the pencil. It felt like forever before my mind noticed that there was something heading our way. I could hear it. Some soft, thumping sound. It made me feel uneasy, and I quickly had the cub sit at my feet while I stood up at the register, the cub well hidden from the doorway. It only took a few seconds before I saw the man wearing a trench coat walk into view. The man grunted as he took a step into the store, his large boots producing an audible thump with every step. His eyes checked out the right side of the store, then the left, before deciding it was safe to walk inside. In his left hand was a gun. Sorry to disturb you, lad. There was no sincerity in his voice, but it was deep, perhaps the deepest sounding voice I'd ever heard. And as he walked in the store, I had the pleasure of realizing the man was taller than me, which, considering I'm 6'3", is actually quite the feat. It wasn't just a little bit, either. He could have been seven feet tall. It would have been a lot more intimidating if he didn't look like some secret agent from a kid's cartoon attempting to blend in with society. But the gun was very real, and it was what I was mostly afraid of. Have you seen a wolf come by here lately? Rather tall, grey fur, blue eyes. I honestly told him no. I didn't get a good look at the adult wolf that came by earlier, and the cub had brown eyes. But the man gave another low grunt as he began sauntering his way over to me, his boots thumping the entire way. Well, what about a tiny wolf? Grey fur and brown eyes. I told him no, but even I knew full well it was pointless. I couldn't even maintain eye contact. His boots were getting on my nerves. I'm easily distracted by sound, and the thumping kept messing with my head. Really? He was heading my way, a crooked smile on his face as he lightly lifted up his gun. I'm not in the mood for games, kid. My throat was dry as the desert as I asked him why he wanted to know. The moon's full and there are wolves about. Do I need to spell it out for you? Are you trying to tell me they're werewolves? This man congratulated me on figuring it out. His voice soaked in sarcasm. I could feel Togo shivering against my feet, doing his best to stay out of the sight of this man. And in that instant, I felt a rush of paternal instincts kicking in. He was not getting Togo, no matter what he thought. Werewolves don't exist, sir. The thumping stopped, because he was now on the other side of the counter, and his eyes, a deep shade of blue, were trying to bore a hole right through my skull. I don't have time to explain the situation to you, so let's just settle with yes they are. Give me one reason to believe you. He lifted his gun slightly with a stone-cold frown on his face. He didn't aim it at me or anything, but the threat was clear. It was quite the experience. I've never felt a chill down my spine quite like that before. He really was crazy, and he was dead serious. Werewolves do exist. I've seen what they can do. What they are. They cause nothing but pain and misery. Now tell me where the cub is. I didn't want to hand any living thing to this psychopath. The little cub was huddled around my feet, shivering so badly that it almost felt like it was having a seizure. But at the same time, well, he was pretty much telling me he'd shoot me if I didn't tell him. And if he did, Togo would be easy pickings. There was a moment, a truly horrible moment, where I honestly believed there was no other choice. I was going to have to reach down, pick up the innocent pup, and place it within this monster's hands. Then reality struck me. Mr. and Miss Laika lived only ten minutes away, and I quickly glanced at the clock, which told me I'd made that call about twelve minutes ago. Help was only a few minutes away, and maybe even just a few seconds away. If I could just stall for time... He wouldn't try anything if there was something with equal firepower on the scene, right? What will you do? Kill it? Not immediately, no. You see, his mother has proven to be quite the difficult catch. Not letting me get a clear shot. 
Good, good, he's talking. I just need to keep him talking. Uh, okay. He gives a very irritated grunt as he shakes his head. God, are you really that retarded? I'm going to use it as bit. Retarded? Oh, he just struck a nerve. But it also told me just how agitated he was. Did he know I was stalling for time? Why the hell did I think this was a good idea a few seconds ago? Uh, let's say that werewolves exist. How do you know these two are werewolves? Let's put it this way. Wolves are smart, but they're not that smart. The mother wolf realized I was tracking her down after I failed to ambush her. What did she do? She ran out to the gas station, and a few minutes later I realized she must have brought her pup inside. She then tried to lead me away from the gas station. That's quite a bit of thought for a normal wolf. Okay, I had to give him that point, but the more I thought about it, the more this man's plan made me scared of him. He wanted to use a child to lure their mother into a trap and then kill the child. It was disgusting. Uh, did you see the mother doing something wrong? I beg your pardon. Uh, well, I'm assuming you have a reason you want to kill her. She's a werewolf. That was it. He made no other attempt to justify murdering what he fully believed was a sentient being. And he said it with such conviction, as if I was out of my mind to even think he needed more of a reason than that. It made my skin crawl. This guy was well on his way to becoming a serial killer. And if I kept attempting to stall him, I was starting to think I would become his first genuinely sentient victim. There was movement in my peripheral. A quick glance outside showed me that my salvation was just pulling into the parking lot. I'd never been so happy to see a beat-up little Subaru. But when I looked back at the man, I realized I had made a horrible mistake. He was following my gaze, and the instant he saw the car outside, his mouth curled up into a nasty sneer. You little shit. He raised the gun and aimed it at my chest. There was no hesitation. The sound was deafening. Pain tore a path through my chest. I staggered backwards while placing a shaking hand to my chest and held my hand up to find it covered in blood. He had actually shot me. I mean, it's one thing to threaten to shoot someone. It's quite another to actually do it. I should have fucking known. It felt like a dream as I looked up at him to find him aiming the rifle at the doorway. Standing there was a burly man wielding a gun of his own, aiming it directly at the man in the trench coat. My breaths were slow and ragged and I couldn't stop coughing. A few times I started coughing up blood. Mr. Laika and the man just stood there for the longest time, guns aimed at each other. At some point I fell to the ground. I don't think it had anything to do with the hole in my chest. I think it was just the shock of the entire situation. They started shouting at each other. I only needed to hear the first few sentences to realize they knew each other personally, and they despised each other. I tuned them out while reaching into my pocket and grabbing out my phone. It took only a few seconds to punch in the number and bring it to my ears. To my surprise, it hardly began the first ring before they picked it up. The welcome sound of a friendly voice came through. 911, what's your mer- The sound was deafening. I heard the man's boots thundering towards the nearest aisle as all hell broke loose. Somewhere in my mind, I finally realized this was really happening. A gunfight was going on right in front of me. I was shaking violently now, one hand clutching at the wound as I brought my knees to my chest and began whispering into the phone. I'm at the swift pit at the gas station. I was just shot. I couldn't hear her response over the gunfire, just the urgency in her voice. The guns sounded really different, with the man's making a loud bang and Mr. Laika's gun making a strange rat-a-tat sound, like it was firing three rounds at a time. Then it stopped. What followed was five minutes of silence, no one willing to make a single move. I was whispering to the operator, telling her everything I knew about the situation in a desperate hope that she'd have an answer as to what I should do. At some point, I took off my shirt and tightly wrapped it around my chest in an attempt to slow the bleeding. And poor Toga was curled up next to me, crying silently as the world itself stood still. My heart stopped as I heard a body fall to the floor. 
The man's gun fired last, not Mr. Lycus. I tried to rationalize it. Maybe it was a dead man's trigger finger. Oh no. Bad thumping sound effect. He was... He was heading my way. The young cub began whimpering. There was no point in trying to protect him anymore. I was about to die, and Togo was going to die right after. Time seemed to slow down as his boot came into view around the corner, landing with another loud thump. I looked up at him to see there were a few holes in his coat, but there was no blood. It took me a second to realize he was wearing a bulletproof vest underneath the trench coat. He had a nasty smile on his face as he rested the barrel of the gun right against my forehead. There was no hesitation, no guilt in his eyes. I could only watch, shaking my head pitifully and crying as I watched him pull the trigger. The smirk vanished off his face as he looked down at his gun with a raised eyebrow. The sounds couldn't have been more unexpected. The man's eyes opened wide in shock as he buckled at the knees, blood flowing freely from the three bullet holes in his forehead. His head slammed into the floor with a nasty thunk. I heard pounding footsteps as Mr. Laika ran into view, pointing his gun at the man's head. It was only ten seconds later, when it was clear the man was never going to get back up, that Mr. Laika turned around and looked at me. There was blood pouring out of a wound on his shoulder. But what really had me scared was the haunted look in his eyes as he got down to eye level with me, putting a hand on my shoulder. He looked me over and gave a huge, relieved sigh. I... I called 911. They're on the way. Good. Can you stand? It took a few attempts. My legs were shaking really badly, but I did ultimately stand. It took me a moment to realize Togo was standing in front of me, now nuzzling Mr. Laika's legs. He just reached down and picked Togo up, and gently touched his head to Togo's forehead. The front door opened. At first I thought it was the police, but to my surprise, I turned around to find the mother wolf now entering the gas station. She trotted up to us and waited for Mr. Laika to set down Togo, before gently picking up her cub and looking at me. The instant that her eyes met mine, there was a connection. I don't think I can fully explain how I knew her thoughts, but I knew exactly what she was saying to me, and I couldn't help the smile that came to my face as I scratched the back of her ear, even as the moment sent another wave of agony through my chest. You're welcome. She smiled before turning around. Red and blue lights were shining through the windows, sirens blaring through the quiet night. Before I could say anything more, the wolf sprinted for the back door, knocking it open and vanishing into the night with her baby. The next few hours were a blur. The police asked a lot of questions, of course, but I didn't say much. The ambulance wasn't far behind them, and they put some, uh, endotracheal tube in my lung to help with my current breathing problems. The ambulance called the Laika family to inform them that Mr. Laika was injured, but they didn't pick up. My family was a different matter. You'd have thought that I really had died from how badly my mom was crying, screaming that I was never to work at a gas station ever again. The doctors performed surgery on me within half an hour of me getting to the hospital. The bullet had gone through my lung and had nearly managed to exit through my back. It took a few stitches to close it all, but all in all, I was assured my life wasn't in any danger due to the wound. I'm currently writing this from the hospital bed. This is the first day where I haven't had some damn reporter shoving a microphone down my throat, trying to get my opinion on the whole thing. Apparently the cameras in the station couldn't catch what was actually said. There was just footage of me playing with the wolf pup, then the man came in, and it all went to shit. I told them everything the man had said to me, how he was hunting werewolves, how he wanted to know where the cub was. Right now, the TV in my room is showering the headlines on the werewolf hunter, as they've named my attacker. As of right now, he's a John Doe. He didn't have a phone or any form of identification on him. Not a single person is missing from town, and not a single abandoned vehicle nearby. Police are awaiting news from a DNA test. But here's what really caught my attention. There are no stories of him from before that night. Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, the actual news, 
I couldn't find anything, and I've had days to search. The closest I got was a man who swore werewolves existed and had killed his wife for thinking she was one. But he was several states away and was predictably in prison. I hadn't told the police that Mr. Laika had warned me of this man, that he had heard stories of a man killing wolves during the full moon. As for the wolf and her pup, no one had an explanation for what happened. There were animal experts trying to figure out why a mother wolf would put her baby with a complete stranger, why the baby trusted me with no trouble, and why the mother simply took her child back without attempting to maul us. Some are accusing me of having illegally tamed the wolf, saying that it explained why I had refused to hand the pup over, even with my life on the line. But others are defending me, saying that perhaps the wolf somehow realized I was protecting the child and pointing out that when the wolf opened the door, I was clearly alarmed until she left. In all honesty, I don't need an explanation. Miss Lyka had come and visited me since then, looking at me with her piercing blue eyes and apologizing for everything that happened, promising to give me an explanation that I don't really need. She brought her son, not more than a year or two old, with big brown eyes. I had asked her for the boy's name, and she told me it was Sam. Then the child spoke, and while his mother thought it was just baby noises, it brought a smile to my face. Togo. I dream about Robin almost every night. Together, we walk through the woods, tracking deer or elk. In the darkness, I can see her looking back at me and smiling. I remember that smile so clearly. I see her reaching out to take my hand, and I can't help myself but reach out. I can feel my fingers brushing against hers. I can see her gentle smile as her eyes meet mine, and then I hear it. The crack of a distant gunshot. I see her eyes, wide and lifeless. Her face is dirty, and she lies naked in the mud. The same way she looked the very last time I saw her, and then... I wake up. It's been two years since I lost her. Two years that I've been trying to find my way without her. It hasn't been easy. Loss is a hell of a thing. If you've never experienced it, I envy you. The pain never really goes away, and I still couldn't tell you how to handle it. Me, I drown it with everything I possibly can. Some nights I need a drink. Some nights I need to get laid. Most of the time, I hunt. It's nice to have a task of some sort to occupy my mind. I'm a hunter by nature. I've always loved the thrill of the chase, and I've always been good at it. Even without the wolf inside of me, hunting is in my blood. The wolf just makes it easier, more enjoyable, and when the moment of the kill comes, it makes the taste of fresh blood all the sweeter. I used to go out alone, right after Robin died. I'd head out after the sun went down and let the wolf out, although it was never the same without her. Once upon a time, the hunt was something we shared. In the darkness of the night, she and I would venture off into the woods, smiling and whispering to each other. When we were away from the town, we'd turn, and then we'd run, chasing animal scents. We were our own little pack, our own little family. It was perfect. Then I lost her. Fate can be cruel like that. The hunt is the only thing I have left. The only thing I can hold on to that I used to share with her. It's not something I'm keen to ever let go of, but doing it without her just felt empty. Hollow. Hunting as a wolf is such an intense experience. Nothing else really compares. I have friends I often go out with... Uh, people who don't know what I am. It's a shame I need to hide that from them, but werewolves don't exactly have a great reputation. We wait with our rifles and use our collars to lure prey. It's still enjoyable, but there's no chase. The rush isn't quite the same. Shooting a buck from a distance couldn't possibly compare to the primal thrill of ambushing it and ripping into it with claw and tooth. Regardless, I work with what I've got, and I'm happy to at least have that. 
hiding what I really am is a fair enough trade-off for holding on to what I love and having decent company to do it with. I don't get to let the wolf out as often as I'd like. These days, I'm lucky if I get to turn a couple of times a month, if that. Life gets in the way more often than not, and as much as I love the chase, I've learned to be careful. Werewolves aren't quite as resilient as some legends would claim. You don't need a silver bullet to kill one. I started my Sunday morning the same way I had too many times before. Slightly hungover, and in a stranger's bed at the university dorm. I vaguely remember the kid asleep beside me. Cute, blonde, probably five years younger than I am. I made a point not to wake him up as I got out of his bed and gathered up my clothes. It was early enough that nobody would notice me slipping out of the residence hall. I'm a little ashamed to admit that it wasn't my first time doing so. I was hungry, and since my life was already a disaster, I figured I couldn't do any more harm by stopping by the diner just across the street for breakfast. I ordered my usual, three over-easy eggs with a side of sausage, pea meal, and rye toast, and with a black coffee. The sky was just starting to light up as dawn broke, and I figured I had time to head back home and sleep in my own bed for a few hours before having to deal with the day. Then, of course, my phone buzzed with an incoming call. The name of the display read MJ, and I almost didn't want to answer. MJ Montgomery used to be the girl at the record store to me. I can't remember how we'd gotten to the subject of dead spouses, but it was something we had in common. I'd lost Robin, and she'd lost her fiancé. People bond over the strangest things. She'd coped a little better than I had over the past years and a bit. I had some suspicions that she and her housemate Shelby had a thing going on, but I was never quite sure. Either way, she'd made it her personal mission in life to check in on me every few days. It's not like I hated it, but... Every now and then, it grated on me just a bit. Hi, MJ, I said as I answered the phone. I didn't ask how the hell she knew I was even up at this hour. Up late last night, she asked. There was a hint of weariness in her voice, as if she knew what I'd been up to. Might have been. What are you, psychic now? No, but I saw you at the college bar last night. Just wanted to make sure you got back okay. You looked pretty toasted. Yeah, I'm fine, I murmured before a thought crossed my mind. Wait, what were you doing at a college bar? I just wanted to grab a drink with a friend. You looked busy, so I didn't want to bug you. You sure you're doing all right? I picked up the probing tone in her voice and didn't like where this was going. She'd probably seen me chatting up some guys and had spent the night worrying I'd do something dumb. She'd been half right. I'm getting by, I said, rubbing my temples. Our little chat wasn't doing wonders for my hangover. Sorry, MJ, I gotta run. I'll stop by later and say hi, all right? I hung up. She was sweet, but I could have done without her doting. I finished up my breakfast before heading home. It was a bit of a hike from downtown, but I didn't mind it. I figured the fresh air might do me some good. I'd hardly made it halfway down the block before the scent hit me. A scent I knew, but not one that I'd smelled very often. Another wolf. Not one that I recognized, either. I stopped dead in my tracks, taking in the morning air. Whoever it came from, it wasn't close. But Tavum Sound is surrounded by dense forest. Not a bad hiding spot for a wolf. The scent lingered in the air for a moment, and some primal instinct of mine demanded I follow it. If I could smell another wolf, there was no doubt that they could also smell me. Any lingering thoughts of sleep I had vanished pretty quickly. I am the only werewolf in Tavum Sound. A new scent was a big deal. Exactly what it meant, I couldn't quite say, but it had my undivided attention. I had met with other werewolves before... Aside from Robin, back in the day, she and I had even hunted with some of them, but it had been a while since one of them had passed through town. I won't lie, it did excite me a little bit. My social circle was fine, but 
I would have given anything to run into another wolf. Some old legends say that the first werewolves were brutal and evil people cursed by the Fae with a bestial form, although you'd never guess it by talking to most modern wolves. Contrary to what some might expect, most werewolves aren't all that hostile towards each other. In my experience, my kind has always been pretty sociable. Hell, in some cities there were even bars where wolves tended to hang out. At a glance, they looked like any ordinary establishment, and you'd never expect the patronage was bound by their shared inclination to turn into giant bipedal wolves. I was lost in thought as I made my way home. The smell was faint, but still present, and I was sure it was getting stronger as I got closer to home. Robin and I had owned an old farmhouse on the edge of town. It was a bit pricey to keep, but it had run in her family for years. Getting rid of it felt wrong, like a betrayal of some sort. Walking up the dirt road home, the smell was strong. The other wolf had been there, looking for me, perhaps. It didn't seem as if he was still around. The smell was too weak, but there was something else there, something dead. I paused and looked over towards the tree line. I couldn't see anything at a glance, but I knew that something was there. It was close. I trudged through the grass and into the forest. The smell got stronger. A fresh kill. Not just any kill, either. This was a bear. I smelled it long before I saw it. It lay in a heap on the ground, its stomach torn open. Its entrails were spewed out amongst the weeds. It couldn't have been dead for more than half an hour or so. I could smell the scent of the other wolf on its fur. No doubt they had been the one to do this. I scanned the trees around me, looking for movements, but I saw nothing. It was just me and the bear, well enough alone. I huffed before taking a step back from the dead animal, studying it and trying to figure out why it had been left for me. If this was some kind of threat or warning, it felt anemic. If I'd been trying to threaten someone, I wouldn't considerately leave a fresh bear in the woods by their house. I'd put its head on their porch. No, this felt more like some sort of offering or a gift, placed somewhere I'd smell it without coming into my territory. The other wolf knew where I was, and this was their means of reaching out. It was a little crude, but... They certainly had my attention, and I had lunch. I hadn't taken many days off from my job at the quarry since Robin had died, so I had plenty of time saved up to investigate. I took a few days off, starting the very next day. I didn't want to keep my new friend waiting for too long. Judging by the scent on the wind, the other wolf had stayed in the area. I was glad he didn't just seem to be passing through. I figured he was probably waiting for my response, and I planned on giving it to him in person. I packed everything I thought I'd need. Supplies for a few days in the woods, and a hunting rifle, just in case I needed it. Then I headed down towards the old campground on the south side of town, and started my trek. I had a feeling I wouldn't be out in the wilderness all that long, but there was a sense to follow, and my new friend clearly wasn't staying in town. It did occur to me that this was a little odd. Why wouldn't a wolf make themselves comfortable? However, I figured I'd get my answer soon enough. The scent was fresh. It wasn't hard to track the other wolf into the forest, and the further south I went, the stronger the scent got. About an hour after I started out, I began seeing signs as well. Nothing painfully obvious. A dead deer and signs of a camp. My new friend was also a hunter, it seemed. He'd taken what he needed from the body and left it for the other animals. The corpse was a few days old, and close by I found footprints. A trail I could follow deeper into the wilderness. Whoever he was, he certainly wasn't hiding. I stopped at his former campground for lunch, a slow-cooked bear sandwich, before I continued on. The daylight was fading, but the scent was getting stronger. The wolf had left a clear path, and I realized that he must have known I'd follow it. He was leading me on, and that just intrigued me all the more. Now I wanted to see where this ended. I needed to. 
In time, the trail led me to a dirt road. This was well off the beaten path. I doubted the road I was on even had a name. Up near the end, I could see a gravel driveway leading up towards a small cabin with lights in the windows. There were plenty of cottages around Tavum Sound, with lots of lakes that summer visitors enjoyed. This might have been a nicer one in the 80s, but now it was showing its age. Someone had obviously tried to maintain it, but it didn't look like they'd had much money to put into it. The sky was getting dark. My journey was almost at its end, and I headed down towards the cabin. I could see a figure sitting on the porch, no doubt waiting for me. I suppose I should have expected as much. As far as I could tell, he was alone. I could see a shimmering lake behind the cabin, and I could smell roast venison. No doubt prepared in anticipation of my arrival. He'd probably been able to smell me coming a mile off. I wasn't sure what I'd expected. A rugged older man with a beard, perhaps. Someone more stereotypically masculine. What I got wasn't that, but I can't say I was disappointed either. He was young and handsome, clean-shaven, but I suspected he would have looked nice with a bit of stubble. His hair was blonde, and he had a Nordic look to him. His body was toned beneath his clothes. He'd cleaned himself up well. "'You must be from Tavum Sound,' he said softly as I drew nearer. "'And you must be the one who left the bear,' I replied. I stopped just in front of his cabin. The boy nodded slowly. I hope I don't make you uncomfortable or frighten you, but I wanted to get your attention. When I came here, I could smell you. I hadn't met anyone like me before. I wasn't sure how to proceed, and I didn't want to come off as a threat. His tone implied something else, although I tried not to read into it. An offer? I said. Something like that. I made dinner if you're hungry. I've also got beer. His intentions seemed honorable enough. I didn't sense anything off, and so I went in to join him. Do you have a name? I asked him, as I joined him inside the cabin. It was modestly furnished, but still fairly nice. Graham. Uh, Luke Graham. He replied from the kitchen. Yours? Miller. Amanda Miller, I replied, teasing his nerves. You know, that was an awfully ballsy move, at what you did with that bear yesterday. Hopefully he didn't come off as too bold, he replied, coming out of the kitchen. He yelled a beer for me to drink. He pulled out a chair for me at his kitchen table, and I sat down across from him. The jury's still out on that, I replied, as I took a long swig. So... You've never met another wolf, huh? Nope. Haven't seen anything else like me since I got turned. You were turned? I asked, frowning. You weren't? No. Not a lot of people get turned unless they mess around with things they shouldn't. Old things in the forest and the like. A flush of embarrassment crossed his face. It told me everything I needed to know. Best not to get involved with those things. But I suppose now you've learned your lesson, I noted. Consider yourself lucky. It's not bad being a wolf. There are whole communities of us in Toronto and Hamilton. Probably elsewhere, too. But you're the only one in Tavum Sound, he said. Yeah. I always thought it was a little ironic. But most people indulge the human side of them more than they indulge the wolf. It's easier to build a nice life with a cushy job down in the GTA. They stay down there to work, then on the weekends they head up north, vanish into the woods, and have the best of both worlds. Not you, though, he said. I shrugged. I've got reasons to stick around, I said. You, on the other hand, I'm guessing you came up here to hide. I took another swig of my beer. I had a bit of trouble back in Sudbury, where I used to live, he said. I just got that feeling, you know, that need to hunt, and it felt good. Then I guess people started getting scared. It took some time getting used to what I am now. I wasn't too sure what else to do, he admitted. I haven't been like this for very long. I like it. I really, really do. 
The power you feel when you turn, it, it's amazing. I just... I don't know how to act. Around another wolf. I finished. He nodded. Yeah. Well, lesson one. Relax. The wolf doesn't make you any less human. It's not some beast you have to fight back. It's part of you. Embrace it. Love it. Don't be ashamed of it. You are what you are now. And don't ever apologize for it. Right, he said, and managed a sheepish smile. I mean, I'm trying. I really am. I... I'm sorry. I'm rambling. I imagined this going so much differently. I raised an eyebrow at him, and it dawned on me that his adorable sheepish demeanor was coming from somewhere else besides general social awkwardness. The way he blushed, the way he displayed the bear by my house. I'd seen this before. It all clicked into place. That little thing had been trying to flirt. He was absolutely terrible at it, but bless his heart, he tried. Did you now? I asked, half teasing now. Well, you got my attention. Now I'm here. What exactly did you expect was going to happen? I, I'm not looking for a fight, if that's what you're asking, he insisted. I've made my peace with this. I can live with what I am. I indulge it every now and then, you know. I enjoy it, but, well, why enjoy it alone? And there it was. He had a cute, shy smile to him that I liked, and I mulled over the prospect of giving him what he wanted in my head. So long as he had more beer, I was certainly open to it. He'd make a good enough distraction for a night, and he was my type after all, blonde and cute. I polished off my beer in silence, and he watched me intently, unable to hide the slight blush that had dusted his cheeks. I almost enjoyed keeping him waiting, even though I'd already made up my mind. If you think you can keep up, maybe I'll indulge with you, I said. I tipped him a smile and watched him melt. He tried to smile, the confident smile of some dumb, horny twenty-something who thought he could take on the world. I think I can, he said, and it was the first thing he said to me that he sounded entirely sure of. The sex was incredible. I hadn't expected such a meek little thing to be so rough. Graham had that insatiable stamina I've come to enjoy from men like him and I suspect the wolf in him only served to amplify that. I hadn't been with another wolf since Robin, but Graham had an energy to him that I outright adored. He almost kept up with me. To say that I enjoyed that odd little booty call would be an understatement, but at the moment I still don't see it as anything more than it was. Two strangers intermingling in a fit of animal lust for that familiar rush of dopamine that we're all after in one way or another. When all was said and done, I rolled off of him and rested my head on the pillow to sleep. I could feel him trying to spoon me, and I allowed it. If he wanted to pretend this was something meaningful for a night, who was I to stop him? Either way, I'd found what I was looking for, and I'd be gone in the morning. End of story. I'm not quite sure how long I slept for. Longer than I wanted to, to be sure. I know that I tossed in turns, but that's to be expected. I haven't slept easy in two years, and another hedonistic night of sex and alcohol wasn't going to change that. I still dreamt about Robin. I still saw her face, her gentle blue eyes and flowing blonde hair. I felt her touch on my cheek in the moonlight and saw her smile before. I awoke, clutching the pillow close to my chest. I had curled into a ball, and I could hear Graham's voice in the distance. His hand was on my shoulder, shaking me gently. Amanda? he asked. Amanda, are you okay? I felt my muscles tense as I grounded myself in reality again. I could feel my fingers curling into claws that ripped the fabric of the pillow before I calmed myself and sat up. I'm fine, I murmured as I rubbed my temples. In the dawn light... He didn't look convinced, and I didn't really care. What time is it? I asked, before remembering that I'd booked the day off. Uh, five, I think. Uh, six, maybe. 
You're moving a lot. Are you sure you're okay? I'm fine. A frustrated tone had crept into my voice. I got out of the bed and stretched. The bones in my spine popped in the most satisfying way, but it didn't ease any of the tension in my shoulders. I started looking for my clothes as Graham sat in the back, watching me. What are you doing? he asked. Heading out, I replied. Last night was fun. It really was. I've got to run some errands in town, though. You're not staying? he asked. I scoffed. Staying for what? Well, I... we just... I was hoping you might want to run off into the woods and rip some deer apart? I asked. He was silent. Look, I had fun, I said. I really did, but if you're looking for your Obi-Wan Kenobi, I'm not the mentor type, and I'm really not looking for a relationship right now. If you want to run or fool around later, you know where to find me. But right now, I've got to get going. The poor kid looked genuinely dejected, like some poor lost puppy. I almost felt bad for him. Almost. So, uh, maybe we could see each other again? He asked, hopefully. I paused, dressing and choosing my words carefully before I spoke. I've got a few days off work. Like I said, you know where to find me. He seemed at least happy to hear that. Right. Okay, then. Well, uh, could I give you a ride into town at least? Save you the hike back? Now that I couldn't pass up. Graham dropped me off at my place so I could at least get a fresh change of clothes and a proper shower. I'd been a little afraid that, when I was done, he'd still be in his truck outside my house, waiting for me, but thankfully he was gone by the time I was ready to head into town. I'd been meaning to drop some of that bear off at MJ's. Her housemate had a taste for wild game, and despite the doting, she's still decent company. MJ's a short and cute little thing, with long brown hair and big round glasses. Her face lit up with a familiar, timid smile when she saw me at the door. Hey, what brings you to the neighborhood? She asked. I held up the Tupperware I'd brought filled with bear. I had a special delivery, I replied. I figured you and your friends might want some. I don't think I can eat a whole bear by myself. Bear? MJ asked, taking the Tupperware. I didn't think you hunted bear. I don't, but a guy I know killed one and left me with it. A whole bear? MJ asked, obviously skeptical, judging by the look in her eyes. She was putting some of the pieces together. Jeez, he must have liked you a lot. <laughs> Seems to. He's a little brash and very awkward, but I guess we got a bit in common. Still, I'm not really sure I'm looking for a relationship right now. I followed MJ into the kitchen and watched as she put the meat in her fridge. She took out a pitcher of lemonade and poured us both a glass while I grabbed a seat at the counter. You tell him that? She asked as she brought me my glass. Of course. He took it well enough. Are you going to see him again? That was the million dollar question, wasn't it? Maybe. We'll see. I took a sip of the lemonade and listened for any movement upstairs. Shelby didn't seem to be around. Well, I think you should. You said you've got a lot in common, right? Maybe it'll be good for you. You know, having someone you can relate to. I... I just said I'm not looking for anyone, MJ. Who said it has to be anything? I just think that maybe it'll be good for you to just sort of have someone, you know? You don't have to date them, but... I don't know. You always just seemed kind of aimless. I hummed in response as I stared down at my lemonade. I suppose MJ had a point. Truth be told, it kind of worries me. I mean, I get it. But when I lost Nathan, I kind of just buried it all for a bit. Then, when I couldn't do that anymore, I really didn't know what to do with myself. If I hadn't met Shelby, I don't know how I would have handled it. It was nice to have someone around, though. And I think it might help you, too. You're dating again, I warned her, half-teasing. Sorry, she said, offering a small, apologetic smile. 
I gave her an affectionate nudge before emptying my cup and mulling over what she said. It wasn't the first time I'd wondered if she had a point, but something about her tone, it got me thinking. I'd met Robin on a hiking trail in Hamilton when I was around 18. I'd grown up in a rough part of town, and I'd been hanging out with the crowd there ever since I was a kid. Every weekend we'd get drunk, ride down to the forest, and let the wolf out. We'd tear through the woods, hunting fresh meat and ripping it to shreds. We'd never killed anyone, God no. But every now and then, some of us liked to spook the locals. I did it a little more than most, mainly because I thought I had something to prove. I'd leaned into my reputation as the crazy, fiery redhead of the group, and I probably would have kept doing that until one day, one of those hikers I'd startled fought back. One moment, I'd been staring down some cute blonde going for a walk, and the next, I was staring down an eight-foot-tall wolf who'd knocked me on my ass. I'd run off whimpering and scared for my life for the first time. I'd expected she'd chase me, but no. As soon as I was out of sight, she vanished. I ran into her again at a bar a few weeks later, and the moment our eyes met, I knew she recognized me. I'd expect her to get mad or something, but she just smiled at me and came over and said, Hope I didn't spook you too hard, pup. I never thought that would be how I met the love of my life, but that was it. When Robin came into my life, everything changed. Life stopped being about the thrill. She showed me that it could be quite simple and beautiful. If it weren't for her, I don't know who I might have become. Some of the folks I used to run with got put down after going too far. One of them killed a human. Another got hit by a truck. Yeah, things like that. It's not any way for a wolf to die. For so long, Robin had grounded me. She'd been my better half, and when she died, she took away the best of me. I would have given anything to get it back. Why don't we head out for the night? I'd said to Graham. I stopped by his cottage again, the day after I'd talked to MJ. We'd screwed and relaxed in the afterglow when I'd said it. Uh, out? He'd asked. Like a hunt? Yeah, why not? I'd looked over at him, and his eyes had lit right up. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to, he said, and I'd gotten out of bed. I didn't bother dressing myself, and just waited for him to follow. The sky above was beautifully dark, and looking into it, I exhaled as I unleashed the wolf. It felt so good to set it free again. Beside me, I could see Graham changing as well. He scampered away like a puppy, grinning from ear to ear. His eyes never left me. We both picked up the scent of some nearby deer almost immediately, and I led the charge. We closed on them quickly, prowling through the bush. He was clumsy, but he followed my direction. When I motioned for him to stay put, while I circled around to run them into him, he seemed to understand. The deer looked up once or twice at the sound of rustling brush, but they weren't spooked enough to run. Not until I wanted them to, at least. When I leapt out of the brush to startle them, they were already dead. Robin and I had done this a hundred times. The moment the deer saw me, they bolted and they ran right into Graham. He sprang from the surrounding brush and caught one of the fleeing deer, a doe, by the throat. With overwhelming strength, he slammed it against the dirt and sank his teeth into its throat, damn near decapitating it with the sheer force of his bite. His claws dug into its body, crushing its ribs, and it took me a moment to realize that the poor thing was still alive, for the time being at least. It wouldn't last much longer, bleeding out onto the dirt. I'll admit, I hadn't expected that much enthusiasm from him. Most wolves usually weren't so aggressive, but I chalked it up to adrenaline. The deer's companions ran off, but I let them go. We had our prey. Graham and I ate well that night. We hauled that deer back to his little cabin, and I showed him how to take it apart properly. I couldn't remember the last time I'd had so much fun, and if it had never stopped, maybe I would have been happy. Hunting with Graham became my new pastime for the next month or so. Every weekend, he and I would race through the woods, sometimes never changing back until we had to return to civilization. During my weekdays, I'd work at the quarry. 
Sometimes he'd come over afterwards and we'd sit and talk. He told me about his life up in Sudbury, where up until recently he'd been a quiet, miserable college kid digging into old Fay stories and I'd told him about mine in Hamilton. I knew he saw the old pictures of me and Robin on the walls, but it was a while before he ever asked about them. Who was she? The question had come out of nowhere on a quiet Thursday night, and it derailed my train of thought. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to. It's okay if you don't want to talk about it. It's fine. I sighed as I rested my head on his shoulder. I figured you were going to ask eventually. I took a moment, working up to it before I finally began. I told him everything. How we'd met in Hamilton, why I'd come up to Tavum Sound with her, and why I'd stayed after she was gone. If you don't mind me asking, what happened to her? Was his next question. I'd figured that was coming too, and I'd been dreading it. Some hunter saw us running one night and figured she was a bear, I said, struggling to keep my voice even. Vic Moore, I'd seen him around before. I heard he was a hell of a shot, I never thought I'd see it firsthand. He hit her in the throat. As soon as I saw her go down, though, all I saw was red. Every fiber of my being wanted to rip him limb from limb, but she was there, lying in the dirt. She'd changed back, and I couldn't stop the bleeding. She was looking into my eyes. One minute she was there, and then... I shook my head. She wasn't. Jesus, he said quietly. He tried to put a hand on my shoulder, and I shrugged it off. I think I'm going to call it a night, I said. Just talking about Robin had exhausted me. I'll see you later. Graham tried to stammer something, but I really didn't pay much attention to it. I just wanted to be alone for a while. It was Saturday when Graham called me next, a few days after I'd told him about Robin. As tough as that night had been, my mind was in other places as I drove down to his cabin. If anything, I'd say I was in a good mood and looked forward to enjoying this weekend just as I had the last few I'd spent with him. Graham was waiting for me out front of his cabin when I pulled up, which I found just a bit unusual. He looked like an eager puppy as I got out of my car and even came down to greet me with a kiss. Today my birthday or something? I asked, half-joking. Something like that. I was thinking about what you said the other night, so I got you a present. My eyebrow raised. A present, I repeated. Although before I could ask anything more, he took me by the hand and pulled me towards the woods. Come on, you're going to love it. I followed him, curious as to what exactly he had in mind and hoping that it wasn't another bear. I hadn't even finished eating the last one yet. As he led me through the woods, I picked up a scent of sweat and fear. It wasn't long before I saw his present, and when I did, I couldn't take another step forward. I hadn't said a word to Vic Moore ever since I'd lost Robin, but I never wanted to see him like he was then. His arms were bound above his head, and his body was lashed to a tree. His eyes were wide with terror, and he struggled to get free, and tried to scream through the rag stuffed into his mouth. What do you think? Graham asked cheerfully. I found him. Vic Moore, the guy you told me about. I stayed frozen to the spot, staring at him, before looking back at Graham. What the hell is this? I asked. You said he's the one that killed your wife, didn't you? He asked. I can see it all over your face, Amanda. I know that what he did hurt you. And it hurt you badly. I love you. I really do. And I don't want you to live with that pain anymore. So I thought, maybe it'll make you feel better to get some closure. Closure? I asked. It took a moment before my brain registered what he was talking about. No. Jesus, Graham, no. W why not? You said you wanted to tear him limb from limb. There's no one here but me. We can do it together. I can even cut him loose, and we could hunt him down if you wanted. No. Graham, just let him go. He blinked, 
looking back at me with genuine confusion. Why? Why? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Because we're not murderers. No, we're better than them. Better than him. You told me that the wolf is part of us. To embrace it, love it, and not be ashamed of it. You said that we are what we are, and not to ever apologize for it. We are the Alpha Predators. You and me. You have helped me embrace what I am. I want to help you now. This isn't helping anyone, I said. For Christ's sake, just let him go. Graham's eyes remained locked onto mine, still confused. Then a new look came over his face. He'll tell people if I do. But don't worry. It's okay. If you don't want to do it, I can do it for you. His body began to change, and as it did, Vic's eyes grew slowly wider and wider. Graham loomed over him, hulking and covered in coarse white fur. His blue eyes settled on Vic, and he drew back his claw for one fatal swipe. I couldn't let that happen. I raced to Graham, my body changing as I did. When I hit him, I hit him at top speed. We hit the ground hard, and he looked at me, still confused. He truly didn't understand why I was doing this. I glared back at him, warning him to back off. For moments, I was sure he'd stop. But I guess I thought too much of him. Graham came at me, lunging at me and sinking his fangs into my shoulder. I writhed beneath his weight, struggling to get him off of me, tearing at his hide and staining it red with blood. I slammed him against a tree, hard enough to splinter it before he relented. When he came for me again... I was ready for him. I caught him as he charged and forced him to the side, sending him off balance. Graham fell and rolled through the dirt before getting up and burying his fangs at me. I stared back at him, silently pleading with him to stop, but he had made up his mind already. If I wasn't going to hunt with him, I was just more prey. He rushed at me one last time, and this time I fought back. My claws raked across his face as our bodies collided, spraying blood across the dirt. I shoved him hard, knowing he would keep trying to attack. He was vicious, but I was smart. As he leapt for me, I caught him by the throat and forced him onto the ground. He kicked and squirmed beneath my grip before I clamped my jaws down on his throat until I tasted blood. I could hear Graham whimpering with pain before I shoved him aside and watched him roll in the dirt his rear legs kicking weakly as blood spilled from the gash in his throat. I could see his body shrinking, slowly starting to change back. I closed my eyes and exhaled before letting the wolf leave me. Graham was a pitiful sight, lying amongst the fallen leaves and bleeding out. I stared at him for the last time, watching him twitch and gasp before turning away. I couldn't watch someone else I cared about bleed out into the dirt even if they had truly been a monster. I returned to the tree where Vic had been tied up and locked eyes with him. He was dead silent, unable to do more than sputter and sob. That and the dark stain on his pants said enough. I raised one hand and let it change before ripping through the rope that had bound him. Vic collapsed to the ground and pressed himself against the tree, no doubt terrified of me. I couldn't blame him. Hell, I couldn't imagine what was going through his mind at that moment. Go home, was all I said to him before heading into Graham's cabin, where I'd left a change of clothes. Vic was gone when I stepped out again a few minutes later. Part of me wondered if he'd tell people what he saw, although even if he did, who would believe him? I buried Graham in a shallow grave, the kind of grave fit for an animal. Then I took the beer from his fridge and drove down to MJ's. I had a lot to tell her and a lot to confess. She took it a lot better than I'd expected, and when at last I couldn't hold it in anymore, she let me rest my head in her lap as I cried over all I'd lost. It didn't get rid of any of the pain, but it felt a lot better than burying it. <laughs>